Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I'm your host, Nick Ricada of Ricada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. I was not prepared to go live this morning because I was supposed to be teaching, but uh, that has changed. That has changed today. We have, uh, we have a sick kiddo, so we are home. But that does mean live stream is on. The, the court has already started, so we're going to get over there right away. Hold on, let me get this. Well, I'm going to show you what we're going to mark as Here Exhibit go. D5. Here we go. The state is, or the defense is back examining this guy. If you remember, this is where we left off in the middle of the cross examination of his testimony. Um, unfortunately, I have not seen everything that has uh, happened now, so detective- far today. Are you familiar with that area on Brady I haven't even Street sent invites Oakland? to the other panelists yeah. yet. Okay. Can you tell <clears> us <throat> if this is an accurate map of Google showing that location? Yes. Okay. So could you point to us where Holden Street is on this map? This is Holden Street. Okay. Could you mark that with a pen with, let's say, with an X at the intersection of Brady and Holton. Okay. And then could you point out to us where Humboldt Street is? Morning, sir. The intersection of Brady. Nick, hey, could you send me a link to that stream so I can record so it? right here would be the intersection? Yep. Of Humboldt and Brady. I couldn't find it. You guys got to make a better record uh, right here. Nothing's wrong with the record for my court reporter or for the court of appeal. So make a he, record. I'm going to have him mark. He marked <clears throat> Holton and Brady with an X. And I'm going to uh, have the officer. Sending it to you on Twitter right now. Humboldt and Brady with, let's say, a square. Now, this is the intersection of Humboldt and Brady. It's on the far right near the bottom corner of this map. And detective, just to be very deliberate in your marking, can you apply a little bit more pressure there? To both or just Yes. Both? And could you tell us from what you're seeing here on the map, how many blocks are in between those two locations? So there's three intersections in between Holton Street and Humboldt. Okay, as far as blocks go, if you had to walk from, let's say, Holton going down Brady. Four blocks. So four blocks between Holton and Humboldt on Brady. Yes. Thank you. Can I have a seat? Uh, oh, I can turn. I can turn off this locals thing. Where'd that? Where is that? <laughs> there we go. Be a little bit more clear. Why don't we mark that with this red pen? That the same place is just to delineate that. So between those two locations, as we were talking about, you have some restaurants, you have other establishments. And are you familiar with that, those four blocks specifically, Detective? Yes, I've, I've been there before. You've been there? So are you familiar with Zena's Pizza? Yes. Familiar with Casablanca, the Middle Eastern restaurant and lounge? Yes. Familiar with uh, Glorioso's, the Italian market? Ooh. Uh, I am, but I don't believe... Unless I'm mistaken, maybe maybe Gloriosos is within here. Okay. But I am familiar with Gloriosos, yeah. All right, Tynamite's another restaurant there. I, I'm familiar with Tynamite. <laughs> Tynamite! It's like Binger. Corner. Did you know this restaurant or that restaurant or this other restaurant? Gloriosos, right? <laughs> yeah. Did he eat Italian food? Did he eat Middle There's Eastern a lot food? Of houses as well. Should ask him if they Are like the blocks. wings or whatever. Is that right? Yes. There's maybe another pizza establishment. Before you get to Humboldt, maybe. Okay. It's just fair to say there are many buildings in that area, and that's a busy street, right? Yeah. It's a popular street for nightlife as well. Yes. Okay. 
Billy Witch Doctor says, morning, Nick and Bronca. Thanks for the great now, coverage. Hey, thank you, Billy. In this case, you're Very one much of the lead detectives along with Detective Kirk Bold, right? Yes. So you're familiar with the evidence that was gathered by some of the officers in this case, such as uh, the physical evidence, correct? Yes. And you had some part in some of the physical evidence as well, right? At the scene, yes. And then there was also evidence such as surveillance footage, video that was acquired from different locations throughout the area, generally, right? There was. Okay. So, from what you know about this case, the Clearmans were coming from a location called Scafidi's that night, right? I believe so. Okay, and to your knowledge, that's is that along Humboldt Street? I'm not certain. I've never been to Scafidi's or seen Scafidi's. Uh, my understanding was that they were coming somewhere from uh, the east on Brady Street. Okay. Now, is it possible they were coming down Humboldt and then they were taking a right onto Brady Street? I'm not. I'm not certain. You're not certain. Okay. Or well, you're not. You're just not aware of that fact where they were exactly coming from. Correct. I'm just not certain of their exact route. So in this case, you did receive a lot of the surveillance from the officers and you inventoried some of that, right? I inventoried some surveillance video, I believe. Okay. And you were involved in obtaining surveillance video personally yourself from a couple of locations too, right? That's correct. And when I say that, I'm saying specifically, for example, Bel Air Cantina, yes. is that right? And Finks? Yes. And those locations, are they on the map there? They would be outside of the map to the north along Water Street to the northeast. Okay, so they were, would it be fair to say those were at the intersection of Water Street and Humboldt Street? Yes. Okay, both of those are restaurants or establishments, correct? One's a restaurant, one's a tavern. Finks is a tavern and Bel Air Cantina is a restaurant. That's correct. Okay. Now, as far as any other surveillance video, I'll, I'll do some transformative content when this guy asks a good question. How's that, guys? The pole cam footage of the punch, right? Yes. And we've also seen the pole cam footage of the shooting. Was there any surveillance video acquired in between Holton and Humble? Uh, my understanding is that there is surveillance video recovered from Zena's Pizza and and the Casablanca restaurant. Okay, what about further down? Not that I'm aware of. Because we know that the punch occurred around in between Zena or around Zena's and Casablanca in that general area, right? Yes, very close to the intersection of Holton and uh, Brady. And when we were talking about that yesterday, we were looking at the video of the punch, and I believe you pointed out that there's Zena's pizza. I may have pointed it out. I think we pointed it out uh, during watching the video, yes. And in that video, which we're going to see again, we saw Mr. Edgecombe come down Brady from the east side going westbound, right? Yes. Okay. So what about the rest of the video? From any of those other locations all the way up to <laughs> This guy has no credibility Why and no hair. Why wasn't anything else recovered? <laughs> Wait, which one? The prosecutor or the detective? You weren't involved in acquiring any or trying to follow up on any video down Brady Street in those four blocks we're yeah, talking just wanna... about, right? I was involved with, I was present for the recovery of the video at Zena's. Okay. Zena's if the video's not lit, that, you must have quit. Beller, Canteen, and Finks. <laughs> so the, yes. what this line of questioning now, is, guys, let me be they're trying to raise videos, doubt about this Finks video that preceded the punch Beller, that they those allege exists, but no one's actually about heard of existing. Well, the footage you they just said there must be a video. Showing a time that was after the shooting, correct? I'm sorry, we just went kind of in a in a little <laughs> bit of an odd route. <laughs> so the the judge is like, from what the hell are you talking about? Talking about those. Okay. That footage. Get your that shit together, counselor. Is for events that occurred after the shooting. 
Correct. Is that correct? From those two locations, yes. And you're aware that there was footage that was acquired before the punch and before the shooting from Swing Park, right? Yes. So, so Swing Park, there's some footage maybe 10 or 15 minutes before the altercation that was captured on the pole cams, correct? Yes. All right. And so you can see from that footage, Mr. Edward, which we're going to see later, but you can see that maybe around 7.30 or so, 10 or 15 minutes before this altercation with Mr. I'm Fury, feeling this video. That video, you can see would Mr. Not help them. As no. much as raising the specter of this video would help them. Location. I mean, they're like, oh, thank God they don't have the video. <laughs> now we've got something to talk about. Uh, Cameron, the Dumpster Bros trial has not started yet. Uh, I, I fully plan on watching that when it actually occurs. Um, but it's been pushed to at least April and May. It's, it's two trials. It's been pushed to at least April and May and maybe After even as far back as September. That occurred before the punch, right? I captured the event. I'm saying the police as a whole, they were able to obtain footage that captured an event. Mr. Edgecombe going through Swing Park specifically 15 minutes before the punch. Man, this yes. guy would drive me crazy. Right? I mean, the lack what of about, clarity in his we're speech able to is just. Acquire anything yeah. for those 15 minutes between, those, between that and the punch. Um, um, there was video recovered on Brady Street during that time period at Zena's and Casablanca. Okay, but nothing further down. There wasn't any video to, to the chat. The initial I was supposed to be teaching threat. this morning. We had a sick kid. You're in referring the age of COVID, if you have a sick kid, the punch that everybody's home. Video previously. Yeah, so so that's why we're here, or why I'm here this morning. No other video that I am aware of has been recovered capturing a separate altercation. Like, didn't you have pretrial motions and about you discovery abuse? were involved in uh, downloading the poll cam footage in this case, right? I was not. Now, that was Detective Michael Fidel's responsibility. He received it from the Intelligence Fusion Center. Okay, so let's back up and talk about that a little bit. So the Fusion Intelligence Center, can you tell us briefly what that is? It's a, a section of the Milwaukee Police Department. Um, it's responsible for... Uh, monitoring poll camps throughout the city. It's responsible for um, intelligence gathering. Um, it provides uh, crime analysis information to the rest of the department. Okay, so that is that basically like a wing of the Milwaukee police? Yes. So it's a government entity, right? It's part of the Milwaukee Police Department. Okay, and Detective Fidel had downloaded it from the Fusion Center. Oh, the, a member of the Fusion Center downloaded it and provided a copy of video to him. Okay. And Detective Fidel, so he's the initial officer that received the video, right? Yes. And he's currently on vacation this week, right? That's information I've received while sitting on this stand. <laughs> okay, so he's not available for this trial. That's my understanding. And you'd agree that the poll cam video in this case is two key pieces of evidence, right? <laughs> yes. I love this comment. And this is obviously a very serious case, right? Yes. This is a homicide case. Yes. This is the most serious charge we have in this state, right? Yes. And so the officer that acquired this key piece of evidence is just not available for this trial? It counsel, it, it's being vague, it's unclear, it's repetitive. <laughs> Let's get to the point. It's getting belabored. Well, you're testifying about something that you personally didn't receive regarding the poll camera, right? He received yes. it. Okay. So you can't really explain why the video cuts off at a cuts off at a certain point. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Is that a question? Yeah. I, <laughs> that's the other thing. turning into statements. Make them questions. Can Please. you explain why the video cuts off in the shooting video at one minute and 34 seconds? No, I didn't download it. I wasn't present when it was downloaded. Wasn't me. 
All right, well, let's go through some of the video. Council, can you cue up the first one? Again, he, so he's asking a couple different questions that have problems here. Why does the video cut off here? Well, that's the only relevant video that captures the, you know, the victims and the defendant in this case. And we know that because he's asking, well, what about further down where this event is alleged to have occurred? It's not a question of why the video cuts off there. The poll cam video being prior to this event at this location isn't going to help them because no one's there. The Kia Soul is not on screen at the time. The they would have to have a separate video somewhere else. And have it queued up on the screen. What's up, Kurt? Fine. Okay, so before we start that, uh, Detective, let's just recap. What is the length of this video in terms of minutes? Two minutes and 59 seconds. I'd, I'd have to stand up and look at it. This is the defense attorney. This must be Anik Ahmad, right? Yeah. Yeah, two this minutes is and 59 seconds. Okay. So it's almost three minutes long, right? Correct. Okay. Can you tell us what this? Okay. I'm back. In the upper left Welcome corners? back. 7.47 p.m. on September 22nd, 2020. Okay. And you're familiar with these videos that are maintained by Fusion, right? I'm familiar with this video. And is that accurate as to time? Yes, it is. All right, well, I want to go through some of this video right now. Carson asked, have you thought about getting on Blaze TV? You'd be a great addition to the Beck world. Let's. Well, I'd love it. I don't know if they'd love me so much. Seconds. I get a little spicy and heated. I think but you'd be good on Blaze. I'd be 100% open to it because uh, I've, I've always uh, liked the Blaze, um, followed them since they started. I think it's a, I think it's a very cool organization. Well, the Blaze is based in Dallas. How about a different one that's based in Austin? <laughs> well, I don't want to move anywhere. That's the other problem. Wow. I, correction. I would love to move somewhere. I don't think that's possible. You see, it's the frogs. It's the chemicals, dirt, the frogs. Oh, the info wars. <laughs> that's Austin. That's the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm. It's too early. I, I missed okay, it. Never mind. I'm sorry. No worries. Video at... Make sure you stop the video just before the One punch and then don't ask any more questions seconds. about it. All right, detective, right there, we can see Mr. Edgecombe on his bicycle, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to play it now from 1 minute 21 seconds. You'd be a better guess for the view. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love that to see if your soul gets destroyed. I, I, I think they I think they might win. Right there, detective. That's Mr. Edgecombe, and he's pulled up alongside. When mythology harpies did tend to win over their targets, right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to play it at 125. That is a good punch. Stopped at 128. So we just saw Mr. Edgecombe punch Mr. Clearman through that window, right? Yes. He never gets off of his bicycle, correct? Correct. And in those three seconds, he's already on his bicycle to take off. Is that right? Yes. So he's already riding away from the Clearman vehicle. Fair to say? Yes. Well, so far, so good. I mean, simple battering. But it didn't Down. stop here. That's the problem. Again, starting at 128. Pants Maestro says, found you in Broncos on Deer Rittenhouse, and I was sold when I watched through conversations. Join locals, and I'm sending the super chat to stick it to law and crime. Enjoy the rage, <laughs> nose man. Thanks. Now you Thanks. see Mr. Edgecombe out of view of that camera, right? Yes. So literally in two seconds, two or three seconds, he's gone from the camera view. Right from the view. All right. Now let's go back to 128. Lancelot says, why does this video matter if he's claiming self-defense? Shouldn't the time of the shooting matter, not before? 
Well, there's questions about provocation that the defense wants to head off. Specifically on the That's why they want this other video to show that their their guy didn't start it, but that video Let's hasn't start been again submitted. at 125, actually, counsel. So right now it kind of looks like their guy started it, even though it's probably okay, not super relevant to the actual shooting in the long run. It, it puts in the mind of the jury that this guy's the instigator. And so they want the video from before this event to show that he had a reason to punch a guy in the face on the bike. The door to his vehicle after he was punched, right? Yes. Okay. And let's back it up once more and then play through until we get to 132, please. Net flutter, the charges are first degree murder. Plain. Okay, so were you able to pay attention to Mr. Clearman's position? Yeah. Yes. So there we saw Mr. Clearman open the door and then kick open the door and then get and then close the door right yes yeah the guy in the car would go on to be killed in in a in about the next 45 seconds to a minute oh wow sorry a minute and a half to two and a half minutes something like that all right, we stopped at 136. We stopped at 137. So by now, the Clearman vehicle is out of view of this camera, right? Yes. Okay. And this video clip continues for about a minute and 24 seconds, right? I, I believe that's. A good estimate, yes. Don't make me do math in the morning. Minutes, this video <laughs> continues. Until about three minutes total, correct? Correct. Okay. And is there anything of any evidentiary interest that occurs in this video from this point on till the end? Not that I've observed. There's really nothing of any value to this case for that one minute and 30, well, one minute and 23 seconds, right? Uh, documenting traffic is what the rest of that video does, okay. uh, driving on Brady Street. Stuff and Stuff says, please keep doing now, what you're doing. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, Tom Grawl says, it would have been better if they offered you a position instead of attempting now to I'm destroy themselves. Go back to... <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a business opportunity there for them. There was. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Not everybody makes good decisions, guys. Yep, it's very that's, unfortunate. That's kind of what our channels are directed to, as I say, the misfortune of others. I don't like everybody in this case. Bad decisions were made all around. You know, I'm not sold on this being justified yet. Uh, I could be, I suppose, sold on it being justified. It's going to take something at this point. But, you know, the the reality is, had had these people just, you know, had he taken his beating like Krauss suggested, and they and they drove off, you know, and reported this guy to the police... Uh, two things would have happened. One, the police would have probably never followed up on it because <laughs> it's a not. random punch in the face in the middle of uh, an urban area. Like, and yeah, we'll two, get right on that. Uh, but two, they'd all, you know, he'd be alive. And and frankly, you know, that's that would be the preferable option it, for me. I would prefer to be alive rather than dead. Um, but uh, yeah. But, and it, and if this guy, you know, if they if they swerved and and like swiped this guy because the wife was was driving erratically or something like that, you know, and this guy had just ridden his bike on instead of having to roll up and punch someone, he wouldn't have been followed and, and he wouldn't have had to shoot the guy either. So uh, another instance where the Miyagi-Do 
uh, mantra of best way to fin- win a fight is no be there is a better option than what happened to anybody in this case. Okay. I'm going to start the video right at the beginning. Running away is exhibit number 34. A good option. And this is the pole cam footage facing Holton, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and the wife very well could be responsible for, quote, you know, for egging it on. Uh, we don't know what's happening inside the car, but she is the driver. Six seconds into the video. So who knows? There we can see Mr. Edgecombe on his bicycle. Women. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he's riding away from the Clearmans. Uh, yes, he would be riding away from their vehicle. Radio Ruin says, just watched. It will be the most explosive day in the Canabro trial when Chandler's mom rolls into court with okay. no legs, complaining right there, of an insane couple that murdered her husband and took all their Eshkel silver booyah. The right turn onto Holton, correct? Yes. And is he standing up on his bicycle? Uh, it looked like he began to, yes. Okay. And he's pedaling, obviously, right? Yes. Now, have you ever ridden a bicycle as part of your duties as a police officer. <laughs> yep. And have you read, ridden a bicycle just based on personal experience? Yes. So is it common that You're when you stand up bicycle, it might be easier for you to accelerate? Um, yes, uh, yes. Okay, so we saw him standing up and he's pedaling after he makes the turn, right? Everybody's a bicycle expert. Now, it's at nine seconds. We haven't seen the only if you've ridden in one at least at once, because then you never forget. Okay. By the way, you're going to see some pixels very graphically fall to the floor by the end of this video. Okay, we stopped it at 13 seconds. There we go. Can we replay that? Okay, we played it at nine seconds, just for the record, we stopped it at 13 seconds. So right there in that video, we didn't see Ms. Clearman use a turn signal, right? Uh-oh, <laughs> they got her. <laughs> Not certain if she was turning right, it would have been on the opposite side. From what I just watched, I couldn't see one. Okay, do you want me to rewind? I can, so I can, I can double check to make sure that I, that I would be able to see one at all. Uh, While watching that, I'm not noticing a right turn signal. Okay. And we saw that if she had a left turn signal, they would have right pulled her out of the car and shot her right. like Dante Wright. Yes. And then at 13 seconds, we see the bright the brake lights on the vehicle coming to an abrupt stop. Yes. Okay. And then. Can you see it from where you're at, Detective? Is it in the bike lane? Um, I mean, it looks like the passenger side of it is starting to make contact with the the white line of the bike lane. Okay, let's back up a little bit. We're gonna replay from nine again, all the way to sixteen seconds. Stopped it at 17 seconds. Good artifacting there. A phantom right. car existing. Now, Detective, did you get a chance to view that over a few times just now? Yes. Okay, so just to confirm, we didn't see the right turn signal as she made it turn on to Holton, right? Yes. And then we did see the vehicle, as you said. We stopped it at 13 seconds. Some of that vehicle was already entering the bike lane. Now, stopping it at 17 seconds is the vehicle in the bike lane. Can I look at this closer? This angle is a little odd for me. 
Thank God they're not driving. They're Article 4 free inhabitants who are merely traveling on the road and bike lanes are communism that don't exist. So, so at, at this point, from that angle, it looks like a, a portion of the vehicle is now in, in the bike lane that is that is started there. Um, there's like a, a dotted line and then a solid line for the bike lane once uh, you get further north on Holton. Okay. Now, as a law enforcement officer, you're familiar with traffic laws, right? Yes. Okay. And a vehicle going into the bike lane is normally prohibited unless it's yeah, for sustain. Is, is this law. case about traffic violations? Okay. Now, this judge is, this he does vehicle, not want any of this bullshit. He wants to trial over. That Miss Clearman made. She also comes in very close proximity to Mr. Edgecombe there, right? During the turn? No, after the turn. Yes, Mr. Edge comes on the sidewalk when she stops. This vehicle seems like, like they've stopped close to him. And we saw Mr. Edgecombe uh, get onto the, the sidewalk or the, and go up the curb, right? Yes, that's what I was saying. And he, before that, he clearly was in the bike lane, right? Yes. Okay. And You're going to have your own guy testify to why he got into out of the bike lane, onto the okay. sidewalk. You don't need this cop to do this. It's a waste of your time. Now, a vehicle, from your knowledge of the law, a vehicle can be considered a weapon, right? Yes. An officer testifying as to the law? Right. That requires a... Good job. Sustain... That answer stricken that requires a legal conclusion. That's a legal definition, and it doesn't necessarily apply in this situation. Move on. Well, officer, you do make move the on due to your understanding of the law, right? I guess Clint Eastwood yes. gets this role. Honestly, he's not going to offer a legal conclusion, so don't <laughs> go there. You're not getting there, buddy. Get off my witness stand. Okay. Well. Just to be clear, Ms. Clearman wasn't given any citations for any of the driving behavior that we see here, right? Direction your honor, relevance. Sustained. <laughs> Traffic court. All right. In that video. <laughs> this guy's like trying to climb the tree. And there's a bully the up at the top. It keeps kicking him in the face as he gets up to the as he gets up to the branch. This is this is my lawyer talking about why I wasn't actually going all that fast on the motorcycle. <laughs> uh, I, I believe that would be the case based on what we have watched, yes. And as far as that vehicle, if you look closely, and I can replay it for you, doesn't Mr. Clearman open the door to his vehicle before that vehicle actually stops? Maybe. From Objection what I relevance that, again. That I believe that's accurate. So before the vehicle came to a stop, the door was already open. And it stops in the bike lane. Fair to say? Yes. Holy shit. The Chandler Halderson defense rested with no witnesses. That guy's going to prison forever. <laughs> forever. I'm going to play it at 17 seconds. That's hilarious. I, I, I just want to watch that moment, though. I just want to watch the moment of uh, defense, uh, your witness, and be like, yeah, yeah we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Munching on a big turkey leg. <laughs> What a disaster of a defense that, I mean, I, I'm going with my theory. He told him that, that he did it and they just were looking for procedural defects that they could maybe capitalize on and found none. Chandler didn't want to testify. I mean, it can't get any worse. And he, he does, he does fancy himself a, a spinner of lies. So, you know, I guess because he told his uh, counsel that he did, they can't, they can't let him get up and say he didn't do it. So, oh, well, Clearman in that, Snapshot that we have. I, I'd have to approach it again. Sure, let's do that. Yes, he's uh he's on the sidewalk. Uh, it appears to be facing northbound. Okay. Council, if you could go back to eighteen seconds, please. Oh boy.
No. Okay. So I've stopped it at 18 seconds there, and that's a. I'm going to write Chandler a letter. Video at that. Can you describe the taste? Was it good? From here. Is it all worth it? Uh, Detective, I want you to come really close. Can you really say you love your parents if you haven't had even one bite? If you want to stand. What if he came back and said yes? It was worth it. You could play it at 18 seconds and stop it at 20. Uh, yes, uh, congratulations on Mission Succeeded, I suppose. Okay, we stopped it at 20. Now, are you able to see Mr. Clearman's left hand at that time? <laughs> yes. Are you able to see his right hand? It's blocked by the front of his body. Okay. Is he reaching into his pocket to grab a knife that will definitely be able to see as one seconds. pixel? <laughs> Just like basic cut and paste, like a big Rambo knife. <laughs> This is the part where his shoulders the AR. This is the enhanced version. So, <laughs> just a giant Rambo knife point, taking up a third of the screen. Six, seven seconds. We saw Mr. Clearman charging towards Mr. Edgecombe, right? It looked like he started to jog. I can't hear you, sir. You want to have a seat? Yeah, I don't know if I can describe I that as a charge. Like Mr. Clearman started to jog towards Mr. Edgecombe. It's a tough one, like legitimately a tough one. That's what it appeared to be to me. Not as tough as. What about chasing? He's jogging after him, jogging towards him. Okay, now Mr. Clearman, just to be clear, was 250 pounds, right? I can't remember. Okay, Not well, anymore. you didn't conduct the autopsy, but I'm asking just from your knowledge of the case. I, I didn't get a weight from him, and I can't remember what the autopsy was. He's a pretty big guy, though. He's tall. Okay. It's a relevant point. He's 60 pounds heavier than Edgecombe. That's, that counts. I think he wants to also establish that a jog, you know, he's he's 50 years old and he's moving forward. Like, that's about as much of a charge as he can muster, maybe. He's a big guy. All patch guy. It could be. All patch I mean, guy he's... makes me feel good about my hairline. <laughs> there's, not, there's not a lot of hair in this trial. I'm going to play it from its point right now at 27 seconds. This guy was just a fitness and enthusiast. He's just getting out of his car, trying to get a run in. At 32. <laughs> yeah, I mean, instead of all that traffic bullshit, this is what the defense should be focusing on, right? Making the, the narrative that, listen, Clearman presented as an aggressor here. He, he was pursuing him on foot, seconds closing distance. On landing area. Uh, from my position, maybe I lunging at the end. Describe what I saw was just that Mr. Clearman was. It, close it seems lately with, with a lot of these trials, Mr. lawyers have not heard about the power of narrative and story. Okay, now you've seen this video before, right? Yes. Probably several times, I'm guessing. Yes. Do people not take a public speaking right. class In or those what? Several seconds. Don't you also they, see Mr. Edgecombe step back? And then I don't know. They back? just can't tell a story. I mean, they 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 go boring, 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 boring. And then maybe I there's an interesting remember. point. And then to, boring, 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 boring. And no one's going to catch that point. Yep. Okay. Let's waste waste so much time on minutia. Can I change my viewpoint? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> like you, No. <laughs> I guess you show the punch. You briefly show the car moving towards him as he's going up the sidewalk. And then you, you show the shot. And you don't don't belabor it over and over, rewinding, rewinding, going back and forth. So what I just watched appeared to be Mr. Edgecombe extending his right hand towards Mr. Clearman, Mr. Clearman falling to the ground, and Mr. Edgecombe stepping back away from him as he fell towards him. Okay, so this was a matter of seconds, right? Yes. Like literally four or five seconds. Uh, what? What so was that a question or was that a statement? Because if it was a statement, I'm going to strike it. If it was a question, ask him the question. That was about five seconds in length. Is that correct? What was about I was five trying to seconds. understand what the starting point is for your time frame? You're speaking. Yeah, there you go. I like this witness with his answers. They're very precise and I liked it. 32. Yes. I mean, that, that is five seconds. <laughs> was 27 32 now let's play from 32 to 38 well, actually that would be about six seconds see see because 38 minus 32 is six you see God. was the five was the literal five seconds time stamped 
uh, footage five seconds. Yeah. How many milliseconds was it? Well, you see, as you move the, closer to the speed of light. Okay. And at that point, Mr. Edgecombe is fully out of view from that camera, right? Yes. Okay. Let's play 38. Stop at 45. Uh, Tone Vector, I appreciate the support, but no one needs to go over to Law and Crime and, and do any <laughs> shilling or comments. I'm okay, right here, not encouraging that behavior. Vector, They've accused the me of that, but I've not done that. Vehicle, so. We don't need okay. that. Okay, and that's at 45 seconds. Yes. It doesn't not help us, and it's not... Miss Clearman in this case. Yeah. Right? Yes. But I do appreciate the support. Thanks for being here. Do you want me to play it at 45? We're going to stop it at 50. I still don't really know what I'm supposed to be looking at. So from to 45 be quite to 52, would you agree that we saw Ms. Clearman run to the body? Or sorry, Mr. Clearman's location? Yes. <laughs> well, that's the body. Playing at 52. If he's already dead, is it correct to call him by his name? It wasn't Mr. Clearman anymore. The jogger previously he was known as Mr. Clearman. Uh, Ms. Clearman uh, standing back up and moving back towards her vehicle. Okay. Now playing from 57 and stopping at 112. Okay, what did we see during that time period from 57 to 112? Ms. Clearman re-entering the uh, driver's side of her vehicle. Okay, and right at that still frame at 112, we see a red SUV, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Kurt, you've been called out. Only in death do you have a name, and his name was Robert Paulson. Now playing from 112 to 125. Is the wife charged with anything? No, not at all. Not even a traffic violation. Not even that possession of a white claw as a woman. Ain't no law when you got the claw. And there... If they charge the women with, with having white claws, the there'd SUV be no women pull, left. Over, pull to the side of the Clearman vehicle, right? Yes. And we know that that red SUV was one of the 911 callers in this case, right? That's my belief, yes. Your understanding? Yes, I didn't speak to them. I, I'm not 100% certain. His answers are much better than um, the questions. Citizens did call Questions in this have been, and I believe have that been that was punishingly one. bad the entire right. time. That was Stephanie Trotter, right? Well, from this guy. I, I don't know for certain. Okay. Now, detective, let's play from 125 till the end. Okay, so the video just ended. Fair to say it ended about nine seconds after we had played it at 125. That seems accurate. Okay. You can't explain why the video cuts off right there, right? I can explain it. Uh, Danielle, yeah, but just to be clear, the wife case, is going to first respond to this the case. Team, I'm guessing which was the Milwaukee Fire Department, right? Yes. And some police officers. Yes. They arrived maybe within what four or five minutes of this shooting occurring. I would imagine they arrived relatively quickly, but I don't know the exact time. So we don't have any other footage after one minute and 34 seconds into that video, correct? Yes. But that's something that was maintained by the Fusion Center. Correct? Yes. 
So we don't even have video of what occurs from that point in time to when the officers arrive on the scene, right? Yes. So okay. can you explain to us why in that punch video, we have a minute and a half uh, almost of video again. after the punch. Again with this. And after the Clearman vehicle leaves. But in this case, with this pole camera, we don't have anything that transpires once the red SUV arrives on the scene. Can you explain that? If I was the person that downloaded it, I could. And that person isn't available today, right? I don't know. <laughs> no. Uh, there you go. That's the right answer. I don't Detective know. Fidel didn't download it. He received it. Detective Fidel was the officer who received the video, correct? Yes. He wrote a report about that, to your knowledge, right? He wrote a report about receiving it and reviewing it. Okay. Now, Detective, did you make any efforts to try to obtain any more raw footage after the one minute and 34 seconds? Regarding this poll cam? Yes. I did within the past two months upon your request. Okay. So upon the defense's request, you looked into To be that. fair to the defense yes. here, I would you be hammering the same thing. That, uh, not, not that it's super helpful, but I would... I'd be doing it Yesterday, too. Yesterday, I believe you testified. Hopefully, that better these though. Videos are maintained usually for sixty to ninety days. Correct. That's my understanding. Can you explain that a little bit better? <laughs> um, they're maintained on a digital server or or um, DVR unit. I'm not sure which. And the explanation to me you know, is it kind of reminds me of the Michael period, Dunn trial uh, down on Florida or the storage. Michael Dunn uh, killed new three teenagers in the old SUV. Video. Well, he killed one of the teenagers. There were four teenagers in an SUV playing rap you music really down in Florida. That's just what you've been told. And he got into a gunfight and killed one of them. And uh, then he fled. I don't I, I don't work for the and intelligence they had to go find them. Center, and they and did. I don't operate the police. And then he claimed, well, I shot those kids uh, because they had a shotgun. Works. But no shotgun so, was ever recovered. But you had said that you had looked into this a couple Because the police months. didn't know to look for a shotgun because he didn't stay around the scene to tell them. Yes, that's what I said. <laughs> so there wasn't... So the only reason there was no shotgun, the one piece of evidence that could have saved him was because he fled. To, I'm sorry, let me, let me clarify. Was there ever any other effort made to try, before our request, to try to obtain this yeah. raw footage? Not by myself. Now, you're the lead detective. Did you ever follow up with Detective Fidel or the Fusion Center? So maybe they would have saved all this video, video if Edgecombe had not fled for six no. months, right? Yep. <clears throat> Highly and, and possible. The supposed video that would have saved him in this trial disappeared only because he didn't stay around. That's on him. Yeah, I mean, we have a sidebar Uh, Judge doesn't want to do these sidebars. No. Said yesterday, let's not make a habit of this. Oh, Chambers. Ooh. Or did the judge just walk into the restroom and blow them off? Oh, no, there they go. <laughs> no, that's They've been doing their sidebars in Chambers. Yeah, okay. It's not a super far walk, I guess, so. <laughs> I'm staring up at the ceiling. That's funny to me. <laughs> that's too bad. The sidebars would be entertaining just to watch. Just yeah, to watch Maybe, it'd be funny if like the, the the guy on the stand just starts riffing with the jury. So since they're gone, let me tell you a joke I heard. <laughs> Man, I just flew into town and my arms are tired. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Start this uh... knock knock joke. So since we have a break, <laughs> I'd like yeah. to, I'd like to knock, uh, knock. I'd like to bitch. I, I got my I, my first proper community guideline strike, which means I can't stream on my own channel. Oh, you did? What'd you do? Well, this is for an old video. It's for number 19 in my Capital Riot series. I assume, because I haven't looked into it in detail, it's again for my encouraging and citing, citing violence, because that was where I got, I got a community guideline warning for number 29 for that reason. Apparently, when I'm capping, covering the Capitol riots and the people getting charged with the various crimes and going through the FBI's litany of evidence and being like, here are the pictures, let me go laugh at them. Apparently, that is in some way me encouraging rioting or insurrection or something. 
I only ever heard you encourage the bludgeoning of someone with a fire extinguisher until they were dead. Yes, yes, yes. There was that. (laughs) There was there was that. Yes, but uh, yeah. So uh, I I was going to stream this Friday about the uh, the Christian flag trying to fly at the Boston City Council or Boston City Town Hall, but I guess I'll be going. Can I stream on locals? Um, it depends on your level of localsness. Uh, I think so, but you might only like the, they start you out at like an hour or something. Cause I, it might that's still right. technically be in beta. That's not, I'm, that's I'm not, not sure. enough time. That's not enough time for me. So yeah. I guess I will not be street. I would guess I will not Have be streaming appealed? about the Christian flag flying at the Boston city town hall this Friday, because YouTube somehow thinks that m- by me covering the Capitol riders and being like, here's one of the Capitol riders. Here's the photo of them at the Capitol. Here's the photo of them in the, in the Senate chamber. Here is the photo of them with the plans and the coordination, and all the rest. And here are the things they're being charged with. Somehow this is me encouraging that, encouraging that this is a good plan. Yeah. Um, have you appealed what? that yet? Not, not yet. Cause I'm, I, I just learned about this morning and I'm letting my, uh, Letting rage my subside. rage rage subside a little bit before I, you know, call YouTube names. Yeah, what I would what I would do just a, a suggestion. I don't know if it would work, but YouTube used to be really strict on uh, stuff like that when you're when you're covering like you know criminal acts and and police violence and stuff like that. They used to like strike everything and age restrict everything, and then they lightened up on that recently. I'd maybe hammer on that and be like. Uh, YouTube recently, you know, ch- adopt, uh, adjusted its policies on these things. And uh, in light of that, you know, I, I think maybe this merits a second look because I wasn't actually encouraging this stuff. I'm covering the legal angles of it and I'm reading the FBI's evidence against people. That is not encouraging. It's specifically discouraging because it shows how, yeah. uh, you know, this stuff plays out uh, negatively legally for the, you know, for the assailants you, you would think if anything youtube would be thrilled about me exposing and pointing and making fun of these people but no apparently mm-hmm. not and my my own chat from time to time has you know said basically called me all kinds of names for covering this shit because i'm right because i consider myself right wing conservatives so like why are you covering these people because they're assholes and deserve to be covered but apparently they were wrong all this time apparently i was secretly giving messages yes through the coffee or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I and Andrew, I might need your help as a law self defense uh, consultant if I, you know, <laughs> go and beat YouTube to death. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll send you a copy of the book. <laughs> is that a chapter for that? <laughs> I'll well, have to add it. A new edition. What he, what he means is he's going to send you a novelty oversized copy that weighs <laughs> several pounds that could be used as a very blunt instrument. <laughs> 50 pound version. <laughs> That would be pretty funny. So yeah, also bulletproof. True. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna appeal it, and I guess if this appeal is denied, I have no choice but to delete my entire series, which is Wait, very annoying. The Canabro prosecutor and defense moved for no closing arguments. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> They're just trying to get this one out. <laughs> this guy. This is gonna be a fast jury, I would think. I, I would hope. I'd hope at this point. Walk into the room, walk around the table, walk back out the room. Oh, and and by the way, don't don't underestimate the tagging of Team YouTube on Twitter, even if your appeal gets rejected. That, in all honesty, that seems to be the only way to actually get. Uh, things reverse these days the appeal process i bet when you appeal it you'll write a really wonderful appeal uh because you know i know you and i I think you'll write something very smart uh, and it'll be rejected in like 30 seconds and then um i would i would take it to team youtube on on twitter because it's it's uh it's atrocious their their process is so messed up right now well if my when when my appeal is denied i will come back to you and i will ask you to help me you know of course, you'll have things and stuff, and you can put have it on my screen. Support. You will have my support, of course. I appreciate it. Thank you. Even as I stab you in the back with a log crab, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, will I cover the verdict announcement for Canabro? Um, I, if it's going to happen around lunchtime, <laughs> sure. Otherwise, we'll go back and 
Uh, maybe over the lunch hour, we'll go back and, and check out the, the defense's <laughs> resting of the case. I hear the prosecutor's face is pretty good in it. Uh, and then if the, I assume that verdict's going to be back pretty quick. I cannot imagine. I, I love it. how people are. I love how people in the chat are mocking me for asking for my help, asking for <laughs> you for help. It's like, hey, bro, can you help me out? Hey, you know, ask for help more, you pansy beta. Like, fuck you. Yeah, I'm gonna ask for help from whoever I can. You asshole. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh. uh, they say the same thing about me. <laughs> I know. The chat well, hates I, you. The chat hates me. I think the chat might hate you more than me. So that's plus. But they 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 made fun of my kid for being sick today. So. <laughs> Chad is Chad is asshole. <laughs> All right, well, I just have one final question about that topic. Detective. Don't just say yeah. one final question. Yeah, the judge told them you get one more. No follow up. Well, My final question is in nineteen parts. Poll cams are maintained for sixty to ninety days. Right? It'll be an unanswerable um, compound question. Could it be possible it's actually one hundred and twenty days? That's, that's, that's a stupid that's question. I, as I right. How, do, how is he supposed to know the answer to that question? Your understanding is that there may came between 60 and 90. Could it be 120? What fucking question is this? Okay. Now, you had mentioned yesterday also that the reason Another question. That in this case, maybe that it wasn't Is it possible it's still maintained? Is it Mr. possible Edgecombe that it's on a tape backup happened. somewhere that they don't know is about? That what you said? Yes. Basically. Is it possible what someone downloaded it and it's sitting on someone's hard drive right now? It'd be on an eight track tape in your granddad's Oldsmobile. No, uh, we didn't have a suspect in custody. We didn't have any other follow up that had come up regarding that. There was nothing else at that time suggesting there was any other evidence of value in any additional video from that camera angle that had come to my knowledge. Okay. Now let's move on to <laughs> what we were talking a to little something bit about else yesterday. inane and irrelevant. We looked at some photos of the scene. You saw a lot of exhibits that the state presented. And then we also discussed the measurements that were taken. Now, just to recap, so typically when you have a crime scene or any scene that you're investigating, there are many measurements that are made um, in terms of distances from one location to another, just generally, right? You said there are? Yeah. That's what I heard. Um, typically measurements that I'm making are from a reference point uh, using like, similar to like a grid pattern um, from the reference point to the items of evidence that are collected. So if there are a hundred items of evidence, there are a lot of measurements. If there's one item of evidence, there's few measurements. Okay. Now, in these investigations, it's important to be objective, right? Yes. It's important to be thorough, right? Yes. It's important to keep an open mind so you collect all relevant evidence in a case, right? Yes. And you're going to take extra care in cases that involve a shooting or a homicide, right? Yes. So... You made reference point measurements, correct, in yes. this case, but you didn't take a measurement of the landing area, right? Correct. And no other officer did, right? Correct. Okay, as far as items and evidence, I'm going to show you what's marked as Exhibit D7. Oh, no, it was he had one more question on that subject, yeah. guys. Now he's moving on to another subject that doesn't matter. Did you measure the length of the entire street? And yes, the defense is using the defense is using the corner of the prosecutor's desk because for whatever reason, they don't have a podium. Okay, they had one for opening. That's weird. Take a look at this document. And tell us is this Milwaukee? Happened. Yeah. And it's a lecture, like not a podium, Nick. Yeah, might have gotten this is stolen. A, uh, inventory of the <laughs> items of evidence collected during the scene. It's of currently day. duct taped to Theodore Edgecombe's <laughs> right. bike out the front of the courthouse. <laughs> is that a fair and accurate representation of the documents that are involved in inventorying evidence? Yes. Okay, how many pages is that? So there are three total pages here. Each page, double checking, appears to be a different inventory. 
Yes, each page is a different inventory. So each inventory is one page, three total pages. One, oh. <laughs> two. Does, <laughs> does that exhibit it's all three uh, pages uh, capture the sorry. evidence that you while. had uh, retrieved from the scene that night? Uh, two of them uh, do, and one of them is a um, an inventory of DNA samples uh, taken by Don Weitzman. Okay, so let's just break that down. So there was a nine millimeter casing that was inventoried, correct? Yes. There was a Jabra wireless earbuds that was taken into evidence as well, right? Yes. There was a juiced bottle from the scene that was also inventory, correct? Juiced? Yes. There were black gray glasses that were taken from Mr. Clearman's vehicle, correct? Yes. And then there was also the knife that we saw in exhibit 33 specifically. Is that right? Yes. Wait, he's not going to actually hold up the what knife? What was the point of holding up a paper bag? This is a knife. That's a bag, a sir. of the open intoxicants that we saw in the Clearman vehicle, correct? I did not inventory the picture. And just to be clear, to clear up anything from yesterday, that was in the rear driver's side of the vehicle. Are, are we referring to the can? The I can did. of white cloth. Okay. The, the can was not recovered. It was photographed in the vehicle. So it wasn't taken from the scene, correct? That's correct. And I asked this because if it wasn't collected, it obviously wasn't tested, right? That's correct. But you had tested the juice bottle. Correct. Right? This and has already been asked and answered. You had tested even the eyeglasses in this case. Correct. State probably Those doesn't even remember. for DNA testing. Yes. Right? Now the knife was collected, right? Yes. But... That was never tested for DNA, correct? Correct. That was never tested for fingerprints either. That's correct. So you're telling me that a weapon that was found on Mr. Clearman, on his person, was never tested in this case? That's correct. Because it was never submitted for testing. Correct. It's not that there were no results. It was never, ever sent <laughs> to the crime lab, right? Yes. Let me That's ask you one answer. more time. I could test it right now if you like. Nothing further. Thank you. Why didn't they request a DNA test of the knife? State. Thank you. I'm not going to be that long on this. The knife was found completely concealed in his pocket. Is that correct? That's correct. So presumably his DNA and fingerprints would be on something he put in his pocket. Most likely. Did you do the earbuds? I mean, those were right next to the knife. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> that's a nice question. I like it. Obviously, oh, put the earbuds in his pocket, DNA fingerprints, if they could be recovered, would be <clears throat> yes. Okay. Additionally, I want to talk about this knife that I have now just dropped on the ground. <laughs> um, was it completely like this? Yes. Was there any blood on it? No. Was it inside the pocket? Yes. And just to be very clear, this is. When you're saying inside the pocket, was it like kind of hanging out or was it, you said, completely concealed? It was completely concealed. It was completely within the pocket. I observed the medical examiner's investigator have to reach her hand all the way into the pocket and pull it out of it. Okay. And just to be clear, when you and the medical examiner um, arrive on scene, he has already been, the, the victim has already been moved onto his back, right? Yes. Okay. So... Previously, if there, if officers found him and firefighters found him laying on his stomach down the stairs, that's not the way you saw. Him. Correct. Okay. Um, additionally, defense counsel was asking about. I'm going to come back to that just one moment. <clears throat> we still have state's exhibit number thirty-four in the big screen. So what I want to do is we have it zoomed in on the corner. And if the court will just bear with me. 
oh have God. to fast forward to seven seconds into the recording. I'm going to play from there. Defense counsel had asked you whether or not you saw any turn signal on the Clearman vehicle at that moment. Correct. Um, and it appeared to be turning from the, the one lane that we have, not from the side lane. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I want to take a look at the vehicle right after. Playing from 11 seconds. That guy have a turn signal? Not that I could see on this video. And the car after him, the truck. Turn signal? That one, it, it appeared there was one. Okay. The car there, turn signal? I can't tell for certain. Okay, so out of four, we saw one possible turn signal. Yes, In reality, for certain. Of all the turn signals, everything we're talking about, we're actually talking about what happens when Mr. Clearman gets out of the vehicle and then is shot. Is that correct? Correct. Now, Detective, I just want to be very clear. <clears throat> you talked about Detective Fidel going and getting the video from Fusion. Is that correct? Yes. That was downloaded the night of the homicide? Yes. It was downloaded by a Fusion tech that had told Homicide, hey, I've got this on video. Yes. When Fusion gives homicide incidents that are caught on video. Do you guys always get five hours? No. Do you get five hours of cops walking around? No. Do you concentrate on the incident? Yes. And in fact, both Objection of leading. videos continue after the incident for a period of video. Is that correct? That's correct. Objection so leading. For example, um, the after the punch, it goes on for about a minute and so. Is that correct? Yes. The These are all leading shooting, questions. That continues on for a while, right? Yes. After Defense, what are you doing? The shooter ends up fleeing the scene. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, why are they just sitting there? <clears throat> why? No, it's not recross. It's redirect. And they're mm -hmm. under the same rules as direct. You cannot lead the witness. And he just led him well, through that entire. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can as long as Hopefully they don't object. The Detective, as we're looking at this, we can see the flash that lit up the bottom of the stairs. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And we can see that the stair area where we can kind of see a little bit, a bit of the blood, that appears to be dark, right? Yes. What about the landing area? Uh, it appears that there's some lighting uh, against the, uh, the fence uh, on the east side of the landing. Okay. And that was state's exhibit number seven, Your Honor. And detective. When you are attempting to determine what items should be processed in inventory. This juice bottle, why'd you grab it? Uh, the juice bottle was, I've mentioned before, it was in close proximity to where the body was. There were, there, there were only the other items that I recovered there, the casing, the cell phone, and the juice bottle on the sidewalk or concrete anywhere near uh, him. And I had marked that and observed that before being briefed about anything else that had happened there or, or, or any knowledge of any video existing there. And the fact that that juice bottle there, I believe that it was a possibility, a suspect or even a potential witness that it, that had seen this could have dropped it there and it could have led to an identification of either of those people. So when you're doing your scene investigation, you don't know who the shooter is at this moment. Correct. You're attempting to find things that will help you identify who just shot the victim in the face. Yes. The juice bottle may be involved. Correct. Okay. The juice the bottle may be involved. White claw can that's it's always the juice in the back. Any reason to believe that a shooter may have drank that? By the time I had observed that white claw can, I had been that the video had been observed that Mrs. Clearman was the only other person in that vehicle, and that that white claw can wouldn't have been of any assistance in identifying a suspect. So that's the difference between the juice bottle and the white claw can. Yes, that's correct. Nothing else. Thank you. That's good. Fence. And that fence. Oh, come on, dude. 
Your questioning just... was already inane. What are you going to recross on? But what about the juice bottle? I think every time the prosecutor walks by the defense attorney, he calls him a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> when are you going to grow up? <laughs> Do you need a booster seat at council's table? <laughs> it ain't my that's fault they got rid of the that I'm out here getting <laughs> loose. Gotta blame it on the goose. Blame it on the juice, baby. He didn't Matthew want to have Self to stand on a box to be seen over the podium. <laughs> Matthew Self says, "Yeah, that's why the podium's gone. It was discriminatory." Matthew Self says, "Defense in Canabro trial didn't even give testimony; they just rest." Oh, another uh, sidebar. Oh God. <laughs> We're gonna hear like three gunshots, and the judge is gonna come out by himself <laughs> with <a> sm <laughs> smoking pistol in hand. <laughs> Remaining counsel proceed. <laughs> case dismissed oh man this uh the i thought the redirect was good there i mean the defense should not have let him just ask leading questions the entire time but as far as the content of the redirect uh, he addresses whatever weird weird little things the defense is harping on this juiced bottle versus the white claw and he's planting in the mind of the jury uh maybe if your homeboy wouldn't have run for six months we would have some answers to these questions that you wanted, but he ran, man. What do you, what do you want him to do? Hey, hey he was on a, uh, what did they call it? A mission to Walk obtain about. legal counsel. Yeah. He's searching in every punch. state he could find other than Wisconsin for legal counsel. I think they called it a quest. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer <laughs> quest. <laughs> it involved lots of peyote and DMT. That's the only way you can hire a lawyer these days. So this is interesting. They only have one. All right. The defense can proceed. Seems like one state prosecutor. Uh, the other guy seems to be a more questions. assistant or something. Maybe. I mean, maybe not. Now, you, know. you said that to your, to your knowledge, the knife was found concealed within Mr. Clearman's pocket, front right pocket. Is that right? I, I watched it being recovered from that pocket. So when and you're it was completely scene. concealed within that pocket. Okay. Now, those pants or jeans, actually, to be more specific, those were retrieved later by, I believe you mentioned the persons who had performed the autopsy. So uh, Mr. Clearman's body was transported to the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office. An autopsy was performed. Uh, at some point, his clothing was removed by employees of the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office. And another member of the Milwaukee Police Department would have recovered them from the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office and placed them on inventory. OK. Now, that inventory later arrived or that item of clothing, the jeans specifically, that later would have been within your custody at Milwaukee Police Department's property unit, right? It would have been in, in, at property. Okay. And do you recall maybe last month in December that the <clears throat> defense specifically me and an investigator had inspected those jeans. Yes. Okay. And photographs were taken of the inside of those jeans and you were present at that time, right? Yes. So I'm going to show you marked as exhibit 11, D11. I'm going to show you three photographs. Inspector Cage confirmed that these are photographs taken when the jeans were inspected. The 
your presence. They are. They are. Okay, permission to publish, Judge? Any objection? No. Fine. They do indeed look like a pair of jeans. Okay, so let's zoom out a little bit. So I'm showing you what's marked as exhibit D11. I guess he did ask about this on redirect, the knife. Okay, so detective, is this a photograph of the jeans that were observed in your presence that belonged to Mr. Clearman. Detective, yeah. how could the knife okay. be buried in the pockets if the Second pockets are turned that. out on the jeans? I swear. And that is the inside of that front right pocket from your recollection, correct? Yes. Was this area ever tested? What we see as a mark? Ooh, fingernails. Not that I'm aware of. So not tested for DNA or, or of any kind? Not that I'm aware of. I bet you you'd find uh, the, okay, the, the owner of the pants' is DNA in there. photograph of the same pair of jeans with a ruler as well, right? Yes. Okay. I mean, the only point I can see here is that knife is about four inches long folded and it looks like the pockets about four inches long so it's not yeah, we were you know, in an eight inch deep pocket yeah but he's i think the he's trying to raise the specter the of like there would have been blood on the knife or something right onto holton and then we saw know. some other vehicles that also turned right and turn signals weren't really observed by several of those vehicles right yes but we also didn't see those vehicles go abruptly into the bike lane correct <laughs> We're back to the traffic uh, the violation. The vast majority of them didn't. I think one stopped behind the Clearman's vehicle momentarily. Okay. Now, you had said that your focus was on identifying the shooter in this case, and so certain things weren't tested, such as the white claw can, correct? Yes. But you did test the juice bottle can because it was found on the scene. Yes. But then the glasses, which are in the vehicle, along with the white claw can, uh, were also still tested, right? They were tested because I had been briefed that uh, Mr. Clearman's glasses were knocked off his face when he was punched. My belief was that it would be possible to uh, collect DNA of the suspect from those glasses. Wouldn't it also be relevant in the case if individuals are in? He just checked his watch. <laughs> the, the detective just checked his watch. Like based geez. on my knowledge of this, I. I don't know what the relevance would be. Wouldn't it be relevant well, if they were intoxicated? You said it's important to be objective, right? Yes. And to be <laughs> thorough in an investigation? Yes. Okay, so wouldn't it be important to test something such as a weapon? The weapon that was found was inside of Mr. Clearman's pocket and there was no doubt in my mind as to who it belonged to and no other person that was there was using it based on witness testimony and what I was briefed about the video as well as it being still concealed within Mr. Clearman's pocket prior to his what removal. What does he think testing this scene. knife would show? So you're just focused on identifying the shooter at that point, but the rest of the facts and the circumstances, that's not something that you were immediately, your attention was drawn to, right? I don't know if I completely understand <laughs> that question. I, I mean, my focus is on identifying the shooter and documenting the evidence there. Okay. Well, at this time, Your Honor, I'd like to move in the exhibits that the defense has Yeah, I, I get the wife's fingerprints, but exhibit like D11. there's no no way on earth you're going to convince anybody that the wife planted it because there's a fingerprint on her well, husband's knife. Yeah. And, she could have handled that at any point. If you want to use a force event, 
Investigate about police as possible self defense. You have to stay around to make a claim of self defense so they know to do that. Otherwise, it just looks like a homicide. Inventory sheets. Fine. Admitted. Thank you. I have nothing further. Who's the state's next? Well, any last questions? No. Again. All right. You can step down, Detective. Thank I don't know where my knife is off the top of my head. Who's the state's next witness? Your Honor, the state. Is request, or will be I'm sure Rod my Trump wife Cameron. has held that There's knife, even though she's never used. No, right, she has. Right, she's right, used right, it to open boxes. 15 minutes. Uh, when we come back, uh, the next witness will be on the stand. The jury, leave your notepads where you are on your seats, please. Everybody else can remain seated until the jury leaves. You guys can all escort yourselves out with my bailiff. We'll be back in 15 minutes, approximately. Yeah, this is uh, it. I I get that he's he's trying to say the wife put the knife in the pocket, but uh, who? It's tough. It's 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 a tough it's a tough argument. And, and what's what's the? I mean, so the lawyer's saying it is just speculation. So what's the evidence? He says we're off the record. Yeah, they're going to say, well, the the only thing that they've got is they're going to say the red SUV, which, by the way, red SUVs appear to be a menace in uh, Wisconsin. But they're going to say that the red SUV uh, is uh, that she saw the well, she saw the wife, quote unquote, rummage in the pockets, which still doesn't actually say that the wife grabbed the knife and put it in the pocket uh, or or anything even like that. They have created a scenario where this knife, which is not at present witnessed in this guy's hand at any point, nor caught on video, was definitely in his hand and then planted back in the pocket uh, by the wife. Because that, which doesn't really make sense since her husband is dead. It's not like her husband was going to get charged with the knife thing. So we're supposed to believe that, that a, a lady who just watched her husband die was thinking, how do I get this uh, humble biker, um, you know, how do I get him convicted in the most effective way? I must put the knife away. That's how I'll do it. Like that's her, that's the state of mind that the defense is trying to sell, that that's what she is thinking. And I just, I think that's a hard sell on this. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. Am, am I missing something here? I mean, you know, listen, they're working with what they have, which is not much. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, even their own, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Is there, is there, or they say they're going to put their client on the stand. Is he going to testify that uh, Clearman had a knife in his hand? That's why I shot him. I, he's going to have to, you know, he's going to have to. They're the ones who uh, first, I think they're the ones who put the knife out there on Twitter. Um. So I think that is well, I think so that's otherwise it. there'd be nothing, right? Otherwise, what the, the 60 pound weight difference would be the only you know. Yeah, is there a 60 pound weight difference? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, I guess that would be the only thing. But I mean, this guy But then you also have the be, age disparity. Yeah, you know, which would which pretty much offset 20 years, something yeah. like that. I mean yeah, so the knife is really the only thing I see that would get you to a deadly force threat against which the gun would be a justified response. Um, and, and by the way, that might be a reasonable argument if if he'd stuck around. Yeah. And you know, and made it in the moment, made that claim in the moment, then it's the, you know, the credibility of the parties involved. And but he has no credibility because he fled right. for six months. He lied about who he was and where he was from and what he was doing when he was stopped by the police and you know, when the police have to go get you instead of you going to the police, that that rather profoundly undermines any claim of uh, legal justification for use of force. Yeah. If you're Theodore Edgecombe in this situation, what you what you do is you shot. You shot uh, this guy, then you get out a cell phone or you have someone if you don't have a cell phone, call 911. And when when you're getting arrested for shooting this guy you make the statement i was in fear for my life i had to shoot him he had a knife and there you go you've established now and then what they're going to do is they're going to check that pocket and they're going to find a knife and say how'd the knife get in the pocket be like i don't know but the guy dude had a knife 
And if you knew that he had a knife and it was in the pocket, like what you gambled, you rolled the dice and picked the knife. Uh, So uh, it's, it's going to look a lot more credible. And then the wife would look a lot less credible. And then the testimony, if you've got it corroborating the idea that the wife is rummaging in the pockets. Now you say, uh, my client told the police immediately he was defending himself from a man with a knife. And then the knife is found inside the pocket after we have this witness testifying that she saw the wife rummaging in the pockets of the husband. How did that knife get there? We don't know for sure, but it seems likely that that knife got there because the wife put it there because she was motivated against my client. And in that context, the only way that Edgecombe would have knowledge of the knife would be that it was out in the moment. Right. Right. Uh, Now there's alternative explanations for why he knows about the knife. It was in evidence. So it was disclosed to the defense. Yeah. And, and, and so it's, Oh, what a what a mess. <laughs> what a mess. Uh, Teach says, maybe I'm mistaken, but wasn't Edgecombe illegally carrying a firearm? He was. He was. No. However, as as we discussed in Rittenhouse, the mere act of carrying a firearm, even if illegal, is not that's not like sufficient provocation to eliminate a self-defense claim. Yeah. And um, generally it doesn't. So I mean, there are a couple of states that condition self-defense itself on not being engaged in unlawful activity. So you might be able to argue this was sufficiently unlawful activity that it would do that, but, uh, but not here. Uh, yeah, so and- you can generally speaking, you can be engaged in unlawful activity of, of various sorts and, uh, you know, you're on the hook for the unlawful activity, but it doesn't strip you of your privilege to act in self-defense. Now, had he drawn the gun, brandished the gun at, at, uh, at the deceased before, um, before the incident took place, that would be provocation. Provocation under Wisconsin law. By the way, there was uh, some Perkins Coy uh, attorney <laughs> talk, talking about how there was no commentary about this. I was like, I pretty much remember that Andrew Branca said this on stream specifically about the unlawful. Before uh, the trial nature. ever started. Yeah. But um, so in Wisconsin, the provocative activity has to also be unlawful activity. And the unlawful activity has to also be of a nature that would tend to provoke. So both of those conditions must be met to get your provocation instruction uh, or your provocation, I I guess, uh, removal of self-defense. So in this case, merely being in an unlawful possession does not rise to or does not eliminate self-defense because there's no provocation. But had he drawn it and brandished it, uh, you know, towards him, um, that would be a different story because then you've got provocation with the unlawful activity. Yeah. I mean, I literally wrote about that legal dynamic days after the event happened, <laughs> but it was, it's nice to see, uh, you know, high powered, uh, uh, who was it? Perkin Coy. So, some guy lawyer. from Perkins Coy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was nice to see them finally catch up a couple years later <laughs> after reading all my stuff. I presume. Uh, the, uh, and I see people say, so like punching somebody in the face. Yes. Although in the, in, to the defenses on the defenses side of the punch in the face is after he punches him in the face, he leaves for a significant amount of time. He's gone. He's not, uh, that fight's over. Yeah. The, that fight is, is clearly ended at that point. And then, um, that, that probably, although maybe not in the minds of a jury, but legally that should eliminate the sort of provocation argument you would typically have, uh, for self-defense, but you know, they may successfully still get it in there, uh, or, or get the provocation instruction in there. Um, that'll I mean, be an interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, frankly, I think it's helpful to the defense. Uh, I mean, uh, to the prosecution, if they argue, listen, he got out of the car to pursue him because he'd just been the victim of a battery. And yeah. He wanted to, you know, identify this guy, see where he was going. So he could tell the police, that's the guy who attacked me. As opposed right. to having, you know, um, malice to cause counter injury. I mean, he probably was looking to throw a punch back, but you know, that's the argument I would make as the state. Listen, there was a, there's an alternative reason for him getting out of the car other than he wanted to get into a fight. This, he was a victim of a crime and he wanted that criminal identified for the police so they could be held accountable. Yep. But of course, uh, the, the defense uh, has indicated that their guy is going to test testify that he screamed, I'm going to kill you N word. Right. Um, which by the way, that's not a smart thing to do folks. I'm not encouraging anyone to do that. If if you're in this position where you just got punched in the face, uh, 
yeah. pursuing that aggressor after your safety is essentially secured because they've left, uh, that's a high risk um, path. Right. Uh, absolutely. Um, remember the, see, the yeah. guy, the guy just didn't mind punching you in the face. He may not mind punching you again and kicking you or whatever after he punches you and knocks you down. Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, I talk about all the time, you know, once you get engaged physically with someone, you've just incurred a risk. You weren't incurring a moment before. It's a risk of dying in that fight. That's what right. happened to this guy. Clearman didn't know probably that he was getting in a deadly force fight that was going to cost his life that night. Uh, but he was. Yeah. Yeah. He, 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 he effed around and found out. I mean, frankly, the guy had a guy had a weapon concealed and, uh, he, he followed him and that weapon ended up being, being his demise. Um, uh, Banu A says, yeah, the N word isn't a good look. It isn't if it's true, but remember that the only person who's going to testify that this guy said, I'm going to kill you N word is the, the, the defendant who also fled for six months. He left the state and was engaged in illegally carrying a gun and out on bail from another criminal act. And all of this is going to be there. So and lied the, to police. I mean, this is all classic consciousness of guilt evidence. Yeah. So, so he's going to make that statement, but it's going to be very self-serving and not going to come across as genuine because it's coming out now rather than a year and a half ago or whenever this occurred. And that's a big problem for him. And that's again, why, why, as we've been saying, typically when you're in a self-defense shooting, as long as you are safe at that point, um, you're, you're contacting the police and remaining somewhere close to the scene rather than fleeing six States away or whatever. I don't know. I think I just picked six, but he went several States away, uh, to quote unquote, look for a lawyer, which doesn't make any sense at all. So, whew, whew, what a, what a mess. Now, of course, if they do have a bunch of other witnesses come out and testify that this guy was screaming, I'm going to kill you, you N word. I mean, that, that would change the game quite a bit, but it doesn't seem like they've got that because that probably would have been mentioned on opening arguments. Yeah. And then it would look a lot more like the Rosenbaum situation, right? right. Someone, someone had articulate, articulated an intent to kill you. They're larger than you. They're lunging at you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Much more defensible, much more defensible in the context of, let's face it, the state is obliged to disprove the claim of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So it would put you in a much more secure position as the defense. But um, you know, once your credibility goes in a self-defense case, it's it's really, really tough. Uh, since a lot of people keep asking, uh, I've, I've, I've mentioned it a couple times in the chat, but no, I'm not using long crimes feed on this. If they have a feed on this trial, I believe it is behind a paywall on their website, uh, which I'm, I'm not in any interest of doing that. Uh, law and crime may think for some reason that I was targeting their quote unquote work. And by the way, I'm 99% sure that, uh, they made material misrepresentations in their, um, about pooling in their letter, cease and desist letter, because I have found now three articles that all in, in for different cases that all indicate um, some sort of shared pooling of the cameras. And they're all cases that I covered yeah. and potentially use law and crimes uh, footage on. So for them to, to make that claim was probably a lie, um, but uh, or, or just a, a mistake, an inadvertent uh, oversight, perhaps if I'm being, you know, if I'm being nice to the attorney um but uh no they're they're doing what all attorneys do they 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 maximize good facts and they diminish bad facts that's what attorneys do you know that, that wasn't a diminishment of bad facts it, they said that they do not <laughs> pull any of their videos that i use did they say that in the letter they don't pull okay <laughs> yeah, i missed that part sorry my yeah. bad yeah they said none of it was part of any pooled uh footage or anything like that which um that's you know. interesting because it does seem that some of your footage does seem to be very, very, very similar to footage of other things. So how's that working out? Not only mm. that, but in the in the Kim Potter trial, it's specific the the order from Judge Chu specifically says none of the news stations will have any copyright claim over the pooled footage. Uh and, and it doesn't in, now. Interesting. Yeah. And the um let's see, one of the one of them, I think the Halderson trial. It doesn't say anything about copyright, but the judge specifically says what will be filmed and where it will be filmed from, where the cameras can be placed and on what. So it's like, what creative direction have you added to this? This is just yeah. a bare recitation of facts. Right. You're just um, capturing yeah. photons. Yeah. 
So uh, with yeah, you, so you're not making any creative decisions about what cameras to use or what lenses or what framing or you're certainly not controlling any of the dialogue or yeah. So where where is the creative aspect for copyright? This 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 lawsuit could be fun if you yeah. get deposed. If you get deposed, I want to watch. I'm bringing popcorn. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> Well, like I said, my uh, my my attorney, Mr. Stephen Birch, is working on a proper legal response to them. The, the uh, proper re re le the proper legal response wasn't just "f you." No, well, you're going to go with something more formal than that. Oh, he's he's writing a letter because uh, we're going to inform them of what will happen if they decide to pursue this course of action, uh -huh. uh, and and what we will be needing from them in in return. But uh, my my response, of course, will be all by video, and it will involve lots of fu's because <laughs> okay. I don't have I don't have any qualms about uh, about free speech, none at all. Yeah, but, I did uh, I did appreciate that when they're like, "This calling us pushies is is me." I'm like, <laughs> well, you know, don't have to tell you about that one. It's so that's well protected. It's very un it's uh, very unprofessional. It's like actually not for me. That's that's actually how I get <laughs> for him. Paid. It is professional. He literally does it for his job. So yeah, <laughs> it is the definition of professional for him. So yeah, <sighs> uh, <laughs> you don't again. Uh, don't don't pick a fight with someone who has no problems taking the lowest road. I mean, I'll 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 take the high legal road, of course, but uh, but I I will not like just quietly sit there while a while a corporate media entity is is trying to come after me. Not at all. If you wind uh, up with your branding on their stream, let me know. That'd be good. <laughs> well, <it's, it's, laughs> uh, well, anyway, it's um not uh, again nobody. I, I think we can all attest nobody who's been in a lawsuit wants a lawsuit in any way um, against them. I don't want a lawsuit fight with law and crime. I just want to go ahead and make my content and use publicly available live streams of court feeds that are open to media uh, of, of basically all kind and then further transform those feeds in rather dramatic fashion. And uh, I, if, if you want me to crop out your branding rather than showing people where they can get access to this live feed, yeah. I mean, I guess I could do that. But, um, oh, did you, uh, someone told me that there was, they had law, uh, law and crime was on a podcast with Sword and Scale. And uh -huh. they said that they would license out their trial footage for $500 a minute. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. As long as we're making as long as we're making up fictional numbers. Is this is this Zimbabwe dollars? I don't I don't know. And again, this is this is hearsay. That's what someone informed me of. Uh but uh, I guess I could ask Sword and Scale. I could ask Mike Boudet if he remembers that. Mm. But instructor Mike says saying that I did anything because I had no choice may not always be received by the judge or the jury, but definitely implicates you in the matter and causes some of your defense options to be narrowed. Do you agree? Well, anytime you take any position of any variety, it always necessarily narrows your options from the range of all possible options. So yeah, I didn't do it or I did do it or I did do it and it was justified or it, I was somewhere else. It was not yeah, anytime you take any position it necessarily narrows the universe of possibilities. What are you even talking about? Did I miss the question? No, I mean I think I think you just answered the question and the answer is yes. It it does I mean, if you say I had to shoot someone, it necessarily eliminates the idea that you didn't shoot them, right? So yeah. the I didn't do it defense is gone. Um, right. But there. by the same token, if you go with "I didn't do it," then it's a little bit hard to argue justification at the same time. Yeah. So you know, it, it, you you necessarily have to pick pick a lane. Right. And sometimes the the court makes you. I mean, they won't let you argue self defense if you're simultaneously arguing. You know, it wasn't me. I have an alibi. Um, sometimes the courts will let you argue those inconsistent defenses, but it, it's not going to sell to a jury. Yeah. Some yeah. states do allow the mutually inconsistent pleading. I believe New York is technically one of them, as mem if memory serves correctly. So theoretically speaking, you can argue both, but good luck trying to sell that yeah. to a jury. I didn't do it, but if I did, it was justified. Uh-huh, and the jury logs and stopped paying attention, and you're done. 
Uh, and and Blada says instructor Mike would be a great person to talk about these situations with. I agree, and uh, I think I think instructor Mike uh, has reached out via email, and and um, I do I do intend to talk with him at at some point here. Um, but yeah, the, the it necessarily does foreclose some defenses, but uh, as as we're seeing here, and as Andrew has been uh, very nicely articulating, you know this. This guy's defense, his self-defense claim coming in after he's run away and been arrested, rather than what the typical answer is, is that calling the police, um, potentially administering some kind of first aid, uh, you know, those types of things look a whole lot more like self-defense than not doing those things. So yeah. even if he had to flee for you know purposes of safety, I mean, you're allowed to do that. If you think you're in a dangerous situation, don't stay there. But once but you've you stay secured in your safety, right? <laughs> once <laughs> yeah. you've done that, the normal rules apply. And and if you continue to flee, it doesn't look like flee for a legitimate purpose. It looks like flee to avoid accountability for the use of force, which is not self defense. Yeah, but it's a uh, that is a good question. Thank you, Instructor Mike. Very very much appreciated. Wick or Rick Rick Pel Pelisiati says uh, seriously. If the court provides a pool feed, why can't you just take that directly as opposed to taking it from someone else that is taking it from the court? I don't understand how the pool technology works. Um, because there's not there's not like a there's not like a source feed that's online to grab. If there was, if there is that, you know, I'm happy to grab that thing. Uh, happy to do that if it's available. But what what tends to happen is the so the there's a distinction in, in some of these cases. In this case, for example, there are courtroom cameras in Milwaukee court courtrooms. I believe they're actually disabled in whatever room this was in. The pre-trial stuff was in room 12, branch 12. Uh, they That was a different courtroom, and this is not in branch 12. So um, I believe they disabled those cameras uh, on, on this room because the jurors were doxxed by the court uh, in the, at the, while they were trying to seat the jury. So in this one, uh, there, there's the feed from the court and then there's also the separate media feed and the media feed is going to have better cameras and typically better audio. And that's going to feed into some media room or media era area where any of the present media are available and they will be then grabbing that and then they'll be broadcasting it out with whatever means they use. If they have the, you know, the van with the big antenna outside, if they're broadcasting it via radio frequency that way, you know, they'll, they'll do that. If they're using an internet upload like law and crime does, they'll be doing it that way. You know, you're going to get different broadcast mediums for different types of broadcasters. If you've got a local news affiliate, it's probably going to be over the air uh, as opposed to through a wire. Um, so that source feed isn't, to my knowledge, typically available out there. Someone has to upload the data. So that's why I'm grabbing it where it's available. And again, uh, if they would, they would have much more of an argument if I was just rebroadcasting the bare feed, although it's still not a great argument, they would have more of an argument if we were doing that, but that's not what we're doing. You know, we're, we're adding a ton of value and we're transforming the content dramatically by making it educational, by uh, giving people alternatives, by throwing in jokes and, and, yeah. and criticisms of the people involved and stuff like that. All of that changes the product that's coming. The humor out. channel. We're just a humor channel. That's all. Yeah, I thought, I thought in your sort of discussion last night, you did a little bit unnecessarily undercut the educational purpose of the this is my personal legal opinion. I yeah. think that you're better on the educational uh, protections under the fair use analysis than you suggested. So maybe that'll be a difference of opinion. But yeah, I, well, I, think, it's, I think there's a valid educational mission here and you're providing it for the purpose of education as well as commentary, critique, and the other purposes for which the statute specifically authorizes in addition to the generalized fair use for four factor analysis. Well, I would, not only I would... can you get educated, you can get hard <laughs> at right. lawselfdefense.com slash get hard. Well, I, I would also suggest that I, I'm not by any means an IP expert and I would defer to your argument on that actually. So thank you. I, I appreciate that. But no uh, uh, IP is not my, my forte. I don't practice in that area. I can basically just read. <laughs> The, the fair use factors yeah. and can I can read know? cases I sometimes and he I can read can cases read. 
that I can uh, apply some of these ideas to. But uh, my understanding is that there was uh, maybe more of a statutory definition of educational, but, uh, and, and I didn't think I fell into it, but I'm happy to be wrong on that. And I would certainly raise it as a defense anyway, if it actually, you know, went to, went to trial on anything, but I'm hoping they're not that stupid. So. I don't know. They feel like they might be that stupid, to be honest. They could be. It could be. Mo says, Nick, you posting on long crimes chat and seeing it, but no one else seeing it. That's the standard way of how YouTube works. Channel chat bans are silent slash shadow. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why I was uh, trying to articulate that when I posted it, other people were telling me that it didn't show up. Now, I know uh, one of my mods, C. Goody, has said over and over, he sent me a whole bunch of things about how I can check, but I'm not actually interested in going to Law and, Chan uh, Law and Crimes channel and like posting a bunch of test messages during their stream. I went and sent one message that said, thank you for the streams. That said, thank you for, for providing this good content. Because what they do provide is a good service. I actually think that. And uh, same with Court TV and everybody else. It's amazing that we have access to some of this stuff and those guys are out there doing it. What I provide is something different. That's, that's, the, whole, that's the whole thing here. So uh, let's see. Mandy says, I'm guessing law and crime has never heard of the Streisand effect. You'll definitely get an increase of subs and views from their bullshit. I love your streams. Keep doing what you do, Nick. Hey, thank you, Mandy. And lackluster. Uh, sent a thing says I emailed you hit me up. I've sued NBC and I'm in settlement with another channel for copyright violations. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Thanks brother. Uh, I will definitely do that. I'll definitely do that. Uh, whew. So anyway, we're just waiting on the court here. Uh, we've got a wobbly Eagle cam still yeah. going on. Look at, look at that. Look at that majestic, majestic bird. <laughs> the judge does seem to go long on the brakes. I mean, 15 minutes is well up by now. He seems to be generally agitated at, at being in this courtroom. Um, I don't think he's a big fan of how this case is uh, not progressing at the speed he wants it to. I think yeah. There's some indications. I feel, I, I feel that frustration, but it's a little bit on him for not managing his courtroom better. Uh, he, he can be a little bit more insistent about how about not so much with the recross and the redirect and the re recross and, the and, the and how about yes, you're not answering more questions. Five. Yeah. Appearances well, remain the same. Uh, I also think he's annoyed with how the defense the has been proceeding in some of these things. The jury brought in, in a minute. Your honor, the next witness is Rod Trail Cameron. Um, uh, the court will remember uh, Mr. Cameron was secured by way of a material witness warrant. <laughs> um, he is being held on that. We have obtained him counsel. He has Tom Reed from the state public defender's office. And I normally, honestly, I was going to call him much later in the case, but I, I want to get him out. So I'm taking him out of order. We're calling him earlier than normal. And we're going to try and get him done today. Fine. Um, um, I'll have the jury on. Um, Mr. Reed, anything before we bring the jury in? Defense, anything? No, Your Honor. Nope. All right. Fine. Let we'll the jury brought in. You can all remain seated. So this is a witness that's in custody for some some criminal act. No, well, no, the material no, witness or material witness, witness itself yeah. can put you in custody. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you're refusing to testify, they can oh, put you okay. in custody, waiting your testimony. So that yeah, if he's, okay. he, he's being held on the material witness warrant. So I'm oh, sure they oh, asked him that. to testify, and he said, "Screw off." And they said, "All right, well." We'll get a warrant. Oh, this could be interesting because this could be hostile, hostile, hostile yeah. testimony. Yeah, yeah, which would this that would allow the uh, prosecution to go into cross exam mode. They'd get to lead. They'd get oh, to lead. I, I have no problem that they're going to be allowed to uh, to open that shit right up. If he's on a material witness warrant, he's definitely hostile. Yeah, that's no going to be cool. Every answer is going to be f you, f you. Yeah, just, just, I know I'm at the risk of repeating myself, which I know the chat hates. Yeah, you, you actually do have to testify, and if you don't testify, um, they can get, you, they can force you to testify through subpoenas. And if you still say, "Well, I'm not going to show up," they can get a material witness warrant. Now they have to prove you. that you're not going to testify. They have to prove that you're defying it. But if they do that, they can put your ass in jail, awaiting testimony for just refusing to testify. So that seems to be what's happened here. Hilarious. 
Instructor Mike follows up and says, I always tell my students to state the following. One, I was a victim of a crime. Two, I need medical attention. Three, I invoke my Fifth Amendment rights. Four, I want my lawyer. Keeps your defense options open to new evidence while activating your protections. Yep. That's all good stuff. Yep. We'll watch him say no, I refuse, and then be held in contempt. That'll be good. Oh, he said yes. Aww. Retro Cameron. That's R O D T R E L L. Cameron. C A M E R O N. Is he not going to be on camera? Mr. Cameron, hmm. um, I want to talk to you about an incident that you witnessed back in September of 2020. Yeah, they're not going to show around him Brady and Holt. Because he's there against his will, I guess. Yes. Okay. Uh, specifically, sir, kind of want to just, I'm going to show you some photos. And there he is. Know, oh, there he is. Unfortunately, in your... your well, he's arrested, <laughs> arrested. <laughs> good look at everything. I'm going to show you what's in Mark State's exhibit number 84. If we're looking at 84, you see Brady. There might be more serious Brady, charges. Kind of where Bridge and Casablanca, Zanya. A little extra material on this one. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> and he's cuffed to a belt. Yeah. Right? Here. Yeah. No, he's, there's more Thank going on here. Gonna... Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> he might have a, some other a issues. giant pop standing behind him. Yeah, <laughs> now, in case he runs for it. Starts hopping in his manacles across the courtroom. Where this incident occurs. Um, were you walking or were you driving? What were you doing? I was driving. No, I'm going to try to get you a little closer to that microphone. Look, there's like 80 <laughs> magazines in my no cop's dog. belt. No. <laughs> Holy shit, Two dude. tasers, a bazooka. Look at those biceps. <laughs> That's a big dude. <laughs> I believe I was in my Jeep. It's like, please run for it. Please, please run. Green. Green. That dude's forearms are and, bigger than my um, thighs. Were you driving on Brady Street? Yes. Which way were you heading? Away from the lake or towards the lake? <laughs> Sergeant <heading> Huge. <laughs> okay, so away from the lake. Yes. That's always the easiest way for me to remember. So if we're looking at the state's exhibit, um, Brady, you're heading towards Holton. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, where were you going? Home. I, I was trying to get away from this guy behind me. <laughs> and when you are uh, heading home, kind of in the area, Officer uh, do you observe anything that happens um, outside Zena's Pizza? Yes. As soon as I, well, when I pulled off, I was at a red light behind a vehicle. I'd ask why he's wearing gloves, but That's I'm not sure I want to know. Right there for a good 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, there was a guy on a bike rode up to the car in front of me. They exchanged some words or whatnot on the passenger side, and then the guy went to punching him. The guy on the bike punched the person in the passenger seat of the car in front of me. Okay. So you're in your vehicle. You see this vehicle in front of you. Can you tell how many people were in that vehicle in front of you? Two. Two. I believe, yeah. Okay. And, um, the person on the bicycle, uh, did you see where that person came from? From behind me, that's all I know. And when they come up, uh, when this person on the bicycle comes up alongside the uh, vehicle in front of you, did it appear the vehicle in front of you, the passenger side window was up or down? It didn't, I couldn't see that it was down from my position, but he punched. I, I, he punched through the window. I, don't, I, I didn't know if the window was down or not. You saw him punch into the vehicle. Whether yeah. or not the window was up or down, you couldn't tell. Yeah. Okay. Could you hear what the words were? No. Okay. Um, what it's was not that hostile. You saw this guy in the bike just punch into the vehicle. Um. True words. Yeah. Oh shit. Uh. And then, yeah, <laughs> no, lie to me. I didn't know why he did it. It was just a surprise. 
Can you say and it the way you said it in the car? Oh, shit! What does the guy on the bicycle do then? He proceeded on his bike, turned on Holton, and went up Holton. Okay. So if we're looking at the exhibit, we're going kind of around this area of Zanus Pizza and goes up Holton. Is that yes, correct? He, make, he makes a right on, on to Holton. Okay, the vehicle that contained the person who got punched, uh, what does that vehicle do? Follows right behind them. And what do you do? Follow right behind that car. Why'd you follow right behind him? Just wondering where will the situation went. <laughs> World this star. Looks good. So the bike goes north on Holton. The car with the dude who got punched goes. I north like this on guy. Holton. He's innocent and of whatever he's charged with. Well. Yep, right behind the car. And what happens when you all get onto Holton? Um, the guy was pretty much forced off the street by the car because he fell off his bike trying to get up the curb. Okay. Uh, he proceeded to run towards the stairs of the, of the bridge right there. And then that's when the guy in the passenger seat gets out the car and proceeded to run after the guy. Uh, he forced him into a corner as if he wanted to engage in some, in, into something with them. And when you're saying engage, um, did you see the person who got out of the car? Did you see him do anything? Yep, he put his fist up. He got like his he fist was, up? Yep, he was ready to engage. Ready to engage. He gets yep. his fist up in a, in a fight. Yep. Okay. Did you hear any yelling or anything going on back No. Um, I at this time, I didn't hear any, any words. How close are you to the two gentlemen when this happens? Um, I would say I'm on a curb in my car. So that's about 15, 20 feet. And you didn't hear any yelling or screaming or anything like that? No. Okay. And the guy who gets into the boxing stance, as you Whoops. described, uh, with his fists up, were both fists up? Yes. Did he have anything in his fists? I could not see that. Okay. So he has his fists up um, in a boxing stance. What's the biker do? He then pulls the gun. I believe, I don't know if it came from behind or out of a bag. He pulls the gun and then shoots the guy in the head. So a guy gets in a boxing stance and the biker does what? Pulls the gun and shoots the guy in the head. I couldn't hear you. Could you pulls say it up. again? Yeah. Pulls up, pulls up and shoots. Did you say he shot him in the, in the head? Then the guy hesitated. Uh, he didn't, didn't know necessarily what to do. And that's when he proceeded down the stairs. And... The person who gets shot in the head, this what actually looks to him? really good Ball for the state. Down. Just right down on the ground. Right down on the ground. And <clears throat> defense better ask if the state's made any deals with this guy in exchange for testimony. If they don't, if they don't get something like that out of them, this looks good for the state, in my opinion. This guy's there, kind of against his will. Clearly, giant cop there. He hasn't testified to the uh, Can you tell what yelling kind of firearm the individual had, the shooter? No, just knew it was a black gun. Okay. Do you remember saying it may have been a semi automatic? No. Okay. Um, now, he goes down the stairs. Does he, does he like take his bike and go down the stairs? Yep. He carries his bike right down the stairs with him. What do you do? I call the police. I was on the phone and I got off the phone to call the police and I sat there for a minute. I, I um, continued north on to Holton and made a U-turn. So I was heading, I continued north on Holton and made a U-turn. I believe that's Brown, right past the bridge. Well, I probably was still on the bridge when I made the U-turn. So now I'm facing south on Holton. I'm on the south side of the street facing Holton. So he, this guy called 911. And, uh, right? yep. Edgecombe didn't call 911. Finally got through with the 911 call because it, it took a couple calls. Finally got through, let them know. Um, went through that ordeal. Then still sitting there. Uh, I was waiting for the ambulance or whoever to show up. I decided to walk up to the body. Okay. Um, and when you walk up to the body, then what did you see? Because uh, I was wondering, why did the guy get out the car? So I observed he had blood in his hand. 
And during that time as well, um, the driver, I don't know who, whom she is, but she was on the phone and she asked me that I call the police. Uh, and I told her, yes, but oh, whomever there you she go. was on the phone with, she proceeded with her conversation. Uh, I believe it was some of relation to the guy who died because she said, your brother is dead. Um, and then she went to state as well that a guy was riding the wrong way in the bike lane and she nearly hit him. And the guy who is dead told so they're just, the guy- They're just letting him recount away. the words of the wife? That's And then that's when he hearsay. came yeah. up to the car. She Somebody's said, got to object that. asked, were you talking to me? And she said- um, the Why the defense objecting to this? Said, yes. And that's when the, he punched him in his face. So, and that's that's just pure narrative. And you yep. see this woman. What's her defense? Is like? sleeping. Calm. Okay. I, very calm. I was surprised, honestly, because I was I was hysterical. I, I'm like, <laughs> wow! I just saw this guy get his head blown off. She was calm. <laughs> and when you go and you see also the speculation, his head was, shot. His was not literally blown off the body, Your Honor. No, it's. I think his face was to the side because I was able to see his whole face. Okay. So was he, his, I should say, was he laying on his chest? Yep, yeah, he was on his chest, but his head was up. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. guy is great. You he looked dead, him. man. Yes. Did he have anything in him? No, I only saw one hand, and that one hand had blood in it. Other than that, I didn't see his, his other hand. And you stated you called nine one one. Is that correct? Yes. Which hand? Okay. You have to have him say which hand. One moment, Judge. Foreign native says, oh, my God, this trial is so much better. See? See? This is it. I was, I was, I felt it in my bones. That this trial would be more interesting to watch than, like I said, the, the Halderson trial has got a great overarching story, but the details get really bogged down and boring with how the state is having to proceed with this case. This one has had all the potential for for being entertaining to watch this this witness is great i love this guy and again unless unless the state's made some sort of deal that the defense is going to be able to elicit out of him i mean this is a guy who shows up clearly doesn't seem to be favoring the state as he's in an orange jumpsuit with a 900 pound cop behind him 39 currently in the tv how do i object to hearsay again and on the speaker so I'm going to play the phone call at this moment. Brady and Holton, Brady and Holton. Okay. Brady and Holton, he got shot in the head. He got shot in the head. Pausing in 16 seconds. Do you recognize that voice? Yes. Who is that? Myself. Okay, so this is your 911 call? Yes. Okay. Playing from that portion at 16 seconds. The fire department, okay? No, this is very serious. I'm on the phone with him now. Brady and Austin, a guy just got shot in the head. Brady and Holston. Brady and Holston, a guy got shot in the head. Okay. Brady and Holston. Uh, police, police 17, Holston and Brady for a male that was shot in the head. Call and have everyone get to a safe place and fight the fire department now. We're on the way. Go ahead and bench the police. Okay. Sir? Yes. You know who did this or no? I, I just saw a guy. I was riding behind the car. Mm -hmm. A guy, whoa, he was on a bike. He rode up to the car in front of me and punched the guy in the face. Mm -hmm. The guy rode behind him and tried to approach him on a bike. He jumped out the car and dude squatted up with him and he turned around and just shot him. That's a, awkward. The passenger got punched in the face and saying he squatted Consistent. up, right? Yeah. S Q U A D E D, right? 
Yeah. Squat right. up. Squat it up means getting ready to fight someone. Yeah. <laughs> getting in that boxing stance we were talking about. Yeah. Okay. To squat up. Yeah. Right. I learned that one from my kids. So, but that's what that <laughs> referring to, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, playing from one minute and 26 seconds into the recording. Okay. Hey, who the person the guy that was on the bike? He was a black guy, black uh, white shirt, black vest, um, black bike. Um, I can't even see slim guy, mm-hmm. short hair. Okay. I can't give you a direct facial, but okay. And when you say bike, you mean a bicycle or a motor? A bicycle. A bicycle. Uh, All right, the officer, the medical attention is responding. Can I have your name? I'm Rob Cameron. Okay. All right. You all need to get in that area. The guy can't be too far. He right. went down the stairs right here on Holton. He okay. can't be too you far. You can get him if you try. You can get him. <laughs> yeah, he's on his bike. He went Close in. Right. right here on the bridge. Okay. He can't be too far. Okay. I'll let the officers know, okay? He shot him right in the head. Okay. I can't believe that. The help is responding, okay? Okay. Thank you. You know what? His testimony is consistent with his 911 call in which he's yeah. clearly in an excited state. Well, I'm Again, sure they told him. I mean, I'm sure the prosecution told him, listen, we got your 911 call. You start changing your story. We're going to hit you with perjury Any all objection? day long. Yeah. No objection. Received. Now, did you stay on scene when the police arrived? Yes. Okay. And did they talk to you there or did they call you later? They came speak spoke with me later. Um, detectives came to your house, right? I believe so. Yes. Jailhouse. Do you also remember um, an officer calling you from the scene because you were one of the nine one one calls? Yes, I believe. Um, <laughs> the USB. <laughs> I hate that sound so much. <laughs> They're on yeah, Windows 3.1. Exhibit number 83 currently in the screen. Judge, we're objecting to that. Okay. Yes. We got to take up an issue one minute. What's exhibit 83? It's going to be the body cam of the officer speaking to the witness. What's, What's the objection? objection? Two grounds, Judge. Number one, hearsay. Uh, this is not an excited mm. utterance or present sense impression. Number two, mm. Mm. there's an opinion rendered, and that is not admissible. Yeah, speaking of this witness? Mm-hmm. Correct. Overruled. Overruled, yeah. Well, they the to clarify this witness. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, now, the witness is on the stand here. The officer calls you and talks to you. They could call the, they could call the officer if they want to. Uh, did you also refer to kind of a description of what you just saw. Like, did you describe kind of the manner in which you just saw what individuals, what happened at that scene? If I recall, no, I really don't recall. I don't don't remember describing it. No. Okay. Do you remember telling the officer over the phone that it just seemed cold blooded. Objection. Leading. I I possibly said. Hang, hang, hang on. But over not leading is the question. Did he say that? You can answer, sir. Well, I don't think I said. A little bit leading. <laughs> a little bit. Said, a little bit leading on that I one. I do recall <laughs> saying that I would have just fought. I would have just fought. You would have just fought if you were that individual. Yes, okay. I would have just fought. Again, you can't speak to what other people are doing one way or the no. other, right? You don't know what was going on in anyone's minds. So no. You honestly can't state whether or not what somebody was thinking was the right or wrong thing, right? No. That's... <laughs> Let's go anyway. That is. Um, one moment.
I will tell you, man, that in my in my work, I run into a lot of middle-aged white gun owners who want to be able to do exactly what Edgecombe did here. If a dude squares up with them with his fist raised, they want to have the legal privilege to shoot that guy in the face. But that's not the yep. law. Into the recording. <clears throat> this is going to be State's Exhibit Number Eighty Three, Your Honor. This is the second body cam of Officer Raymond Nebraska. Cameron, no. It's it's typically not going to be justifiable deadly force if a guy's just fist up with you. Pausing at 36 seconds into the recording. Do you recognize whose voice that is? Yes. Whose is that? Myself. Okay. And people are saying maybe it should be. Maybe it should be, but it isn't. So. Right. Describing that night, you're saying I was about to go down the stairs, and the, the deceased victim gets up and squads up again, right? Yes. Gets into that fighting stance. Yes. What it appears to be to you. Yes. Okay. Playing from that portion at 59 seconds. Okay. Did you get to look at the guy? On the bike? Is this like over a speakerphone? Yeah. <laughs> Man, this 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 dude's given a good good description for a witness. Can you tell how old he was? He wasn't a kid, though, like a teenager. So at least when you, you told us, you just thought it was black. But when you spoke to the officer, you thought it was potentially a nine. Is that correct? Yeah. But you don't really know guns. No. Okay. And you told us today that the, the person that got out of the car ran towards the individual. When you're talking to the officers, you said he, he approached the guy, right? Yes. You're kind of meaning the same thing, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Did you hear anything spoken between these two individuals no <laughs> besides the firearm that you saw the shooter use do you see any weapons in anyone else's hands 
No. The, 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 the victim who dies, did he take a swing at him? Nope. Not at the, no. He gets into that, that boxing stance. Does he do anything other than appear to get into that boxing stance? He's walking a guy down and backed him up into a corner. Other than that, no. You didn't say that on the, the video, but that's the way you remember, right? Yes. And that corner would be getting down to the stairs. Yes. The, the guy was already by those stairs, though, right? Yes. So he was already in that corner. Pretty much. Yeah. So he's at the corner. Was he or was he not already in the corner? <clears throat> He was heading to the stairs. Okay. <laughs> Did you see oh, the defense attorney look at the judge like, where's my ruling? Ended up being into the corner now. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and I just want to be very clear. When you came back and you go and see the victim's body, um, in the one hand that you did see, you didn't see any weapon. No. Which hand did you see, if you remember? It would be his left hand. He was laid, his arm was out straight. Yeah, I believe that was his left. You think it was his left? Yes. Okay, and to be clear, we've just played both of your statements, both to the officer on the phone as well as to the 911 caller. You never mentioned that to either one of them. Traumatized. Okay. You also never mentioned that to the detectives who come and talk to you later, right? Traumatized. It's all happened within two hours of each other. Understood. But just to be very clear, when we're, we've now played those two portions that were recorded, mm -hmm. you didn't say that you went up to the body. I believe I did recall, not on those, but I think when the detective came, I believe, I'm sure I've mentioned something about walking up to the body. Okay. If there was a course to next upon that, I mentioned it. It was a lot that you saw that day. Yes. Okay. And I also want to be just very clear about this. Um, did you know either side of this? No. Did you know who the shooter was? No. Did you know who the victim was? No. Were you ever able to even identify the shooter? No. They, they asked you to do that, didn't they? Yes. They asked you to participate in an identification procedure and you couldn't pick anyone out? No. Sir, you are currently in custody right now, correct? Yes. And that's solely based on getting oh, you Oh, please here. don't be a pedophile. Please don't be a pedophile. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All his testimony would go right out the window. When you're testifying. Someone said his rap sheet is impressive. There was a, a belief or at least a reason why at least the state thought you may not come willing, correct? warrant issued for you, right? Can you repeat that? Strike. Let me rephrase that. It was a horrible question. <laughs> a warrant was, like a was question. issued in order to get you to come to court, right? It wasn't necessary, but yes. And you've been held He's, on that, right? Yes. And you got an attorney from the public defender's office, right? Yes. And you're not happy about being held on this, are you? No. You're not happy with the state right now, are you? Absolutely not. Leading questions, objection. Goes to bias. It potentially goes to bias. You, you can rephrase. I mean, fine. Are you happy with the state yes. right now? Right. Come on, Sorry. guys. Very not clear. your first time in court. Have there been any deals or any negotiations for your testimony here today? Absolutely not. Wow. No Just ambiguity there. Right? Yes. Just here to tell the truth, right? Why didn't they object to that? <laughs> the witness is testifying to his own truthfulness. <laughs> they didn't object. What are they doing? No further questions of this witness.
Marcus. Thank you. Whoever's yeah, that, phone that is had better turn it off. No and kidding. Both be escorted out of the courtroom. <laughs> Cross. Man, folks, I know judges who will routinely just Go seize a cell phone, phone that rings in their courtroom and you'll never see it again. For the record, as to the body cam on those two grounds. So, noting the objection there, admitted, received. Turn, turn off that phone. What are you doing? Can you? Oh, I cannot sure. imagine having my phone on in court. No, I would assume I'll lose the phone. Yeah. I mean, I, the, I check my phone like 10 times. I turn off the vibration just in case I set it on a de like, uh, cause attorneys can have their phones. I keep mine from my calendar. Uh, and, and like, if I set it on the desk by mistake, I don't want it to brrr or something stupid. I turn everything off. I check it like 10 times. Cause I don't want to piss off the judge. I don't want to lose the phone. You you don't you don't stop the questioning. So, excuse me, judge. You just got to Instagram this. Yeah, hey, judge. I am live <laughs> tweeting what you're saying right now. <laughs> can you speak clearly into the microphone, judge, so I can make sure and get this right? Good afternoon, Mr. Cameron. I'm attorney Biabi Lamar, represent Theodore Adscom. <clears throat> now, Mr. Cameron, I want to just start by stating you you talked briefly in your introduction of what took place on September 22nd. You mentioned that you saw that there was a vehicle that swerved, correct? No, I did not. Okay. What did you see? What was the first thing that you saw on Brady Street? That's a bad start. You gotta get punched in the face. Okay. And you you seen that when you Oof. exited out of Zana's Pizza. Okay. And you didn't see what led up to Mr. Edgecombe nope. coming to the vehicle, did you? No. And that's honestly the reason why I got out the car, just to see what actually took place to lead up to that. Did you hear Mr. Edgecombe say anything to Mr. Clearman or anyone in that vehicle? No. Did you hear anything from that vehicle? Any? Did you hear the Clearman say anything to Mr. Edgecombe? No. Did you see Mr. Edgecombe brandish a firearm at the time he went and approached Mr. Clearman? At the vehicle? No. Did you ever hear him threaten to bring out a, a firearm when he went to the vehicle? No. Now, Mr. Cameron, you is it true that the last two digits of your phone number ends in six five? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> communications with the defense firm who represents Mr. Edgecombe in this case? Yes. You, you remember having text messages involving uh, you talking about your testimony with yes. the defense firm? Yes. And do you recall having a conversation with the defense firm where you, this, where you talked about Mr. Edgecombe looking shot after the firearm, after the gunshot went off? Did you use those words? Yes. And you used the word shot, correct? I can't recall, but... Yeah, like I stated earlier, he was, yeah, he was shot. I was looked like Alec Baldwin. When you say shot, did it appear that he looked a bit surprised? Yes. Did you now, see an armor <clears throat> on the scene? You stated on direct that there was a time that you got out the vehicle, correct? Yes. And you went to the body of Mr. Clearman, correct? Yes. The state play uh, video number 35. Why the gloves? Probably just COVID precaution. Maybe he's a member of the Kyle Rittenhouse fan club. Yeah. Kyle used lots of gloves. Very dangerous gloves. Dangerous blue nitrile gloves. Would an accidental discharge to the face still be murder? Asked Jack Murphy. Did you see the bullet as it moved between the muzzle and the skull? What caliber of bullet was it? You didn't witness the caliber, did you? It could have been a shooter on a grassy knoll. Isn't that true? So, guys, uh, about this witness, 
we're not actually sure why he's uh, chained up the way he is. Don't know if it's merely because of the uh, warrant for his appearance, um, which he he says was unnecessary. But of course, he was <laughs> he's got a lawyer representing him on that matter, so that's what he kind of has to say. But uh, uh, or if he has some underlying criminal issue that he's been arrested for and he's in custody, we don't actually know. So uh, someone was asking, you know, even if he hasn't made a deal in his case, would this help him? I mean, if this guy, if all they needed him for was to come in and testify, he was allegedly unwilling. And that, so they just take a look at what has been marked as steady. So they brought him in. Once he testifies, he's probably going home. <coughs> and if the state can stop the video right now. Now, Mr. Cameron, is that your vehicle that's following the clearance at this point? I would say so. It really came hard. It's hard to describe, man. See the details of the vehicle. Okay. From my. All right, well, let's, let's go a couple more seconds. Do you recall pulling into the right lane following the clearance as the vehicle behind the clearance is doing at this point? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So can you confirm at this time that that is you behind the clearance at this point? Yes. Is a warrant for tax delinquency now, to the state. Do you get out the vehicle at this point, Mr. Mr. Cameron? No, I don't okay, think so. Okay, if the state could continue. Now you're driving off, is that correct? Yes. I want to finish this video out, and I want you to let me know if your vehicle ever comes back in frame in this video. Doesn't leave the frame. It's still up there on the top. Now, you can stop, please. If the state could go back to about 40 seconds of the video, please. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here. I want you to focus on the clearing the vehicle. Right? If you go ahead and place. Now, do you notice, you can stop, please. Do you notice Ms. Clearman getting out the vehicle at this point? Yes. Okay. Is that the person that you recognize that was at the body at the time that you came up? Yeah. If the state could continue playing the video, please. And the way that she needs you to raise the microphone, please. Yes. Okay, you notice Ms. Clearman running to the body at this point? As of the video, yes. Okay, now were you by her at the time she ran to the body this time? No. So this on this time, you were not present with her, correct? No. Nope. Okay, the state can continue playing the video. Now she gets something and now she's running back to the vehicle. Is that what you see? I don't believe you can see her get something. Yeah. That's a mischaracterization of what can be seen on the video. Let's ask the witness what he can see. The witness is not, I mean. He's not a witness to any of this. Towards me a bit better. Yes. This is just a guy watching a video. This is the we they, the they did this in, go back about three seconds, please. Did this in Rittenhouse too. Can you testify to what you're seeing on this video? What the hell is that? Yes. Yes, I do see her going back to her vehicle. Okay. Now you didn't observe her go to her vehicle at the time you were on the scene, did you? No. Nope. You weren't present, were you? No. You don't know what Ms. Clement did at this point, do you? No. If the state could continue playing the video, please. Can you stop the vehicle? Stop the video, please. Do you notice Ms. Clement getting in her vehicle? Can you? I'm sorry, Doc. We go back five seconds. Okay. If you go he ahead. just said he doesn't know yes. any of this. You just saw her go back in that vehicle, correct? Yes. Did you witness that on September 22nd? No. I don't think so. So that occurred without your knowledge, correct? Yes. All right. Now, if the state can go back and play the rest of the video, please. Now, I want you to tell the members of the jury if you ever come back in frame in this video. Is that you? Let's stop the vehicle. Let me stop the video, please. 
You with the bright? You didn't switch cars and come into a, a red SUV, did you? No. That's not you, is it? No. Just stay and continue playing the video, please. You've thoroughly established that it's not him after the killing. I believe that's the conclusion of the video. Mr. Cameron, did you ever see yourself appear back in that video? No. You never seen yourself go to the body as you saw Miss Clement did, did you? No. Now, you stated that he said you he were walked over about and 10 looked to 15 at the body. Feet from where the incident occurred, where you seen Mr. Clement get into a boxer stance, correct? Yes. All right, so let's describe that. Were you directly behind him? Let's let's understand where your vantage point was at that time. Behind, I would say on an angle. So, would you agree, this, is this about 10 feet? That's about 15. Yeah. <laughs> 15 feet. So you were behind where the incident happened at, correct? Yes. And Mr. Clarence's back is to you, correct? Yes. And he's in a boxer stance, correct? Yes. And going off of your distance now, I was a bit further. Can you that. see the knife in my hand? Yep, for Someone probably more stop. like 20 feet then. Good okay. demonstrative. Yeah, that's about right. Can you tell if I have an object in my hand or not? No. Is this the type of position that Mr. Clinton was in at the time? Yes. Does this courtroom appear bright to you? Bright? Yes. Would you consider this courtroom bright? Yes. Would you consider the night of September 22nd dark on Houghton Street? Yes. Could you tell that I have a pair of sunglasses in my hand, Mr. Cameron? Absolutely not. Got to do something. It's a good demonstrative for the court. Now, Mr. Cameron, you indicated the on jury's here, so they could see that when you got to the body, that Miss Clearman appeared to be calm. Is that correct? Yes. And you appear to be hysterical. Would you describe? Would you consider that a character characterization of your your conduct at that time? Yes. Okay. Now, when you mentioned that Miss Clearman appeared calm. Describe that. What, what, what made her feel calm? Was it her tone? Was it described to the members of the jury wife? What made her appear calm? She wasn't crying. She was calm. She wasn't shaking of any sort. She was on the phone. She was calmly explaining what just took place to the guy who, who was dead. I, as you saw, I'm, I was like, I, I like this attorney a lot better than the other one. Hey, did you know Mr. Clement? Have you ever seen Mr. Clement before? No. Did you feel emotional based off of what you saw? Yeah, because of of what took place, yeah. Now, you mentioned that she was on a phone call, correct? Yes. So her phone appeared to be operable, correct? Yes. Was she on the phone with 911? No. Was she on the phone with anybody giving her instructions on how to provide medical aid to Mr. Clearman? I don't think so. Did you see Ms. Clearman trying to provide medical aid to Mr. Clearman? No. Siri, how do you shoot a gunshot, uh, treat a gunshot wound to the head? To Mr. Clearman's wound? No. Did you see her ever try to administer CPR to Mr. Clearman? No. Did she ask you to assist her to Did assist she Mr. Clearman you? Oh in my saving goodness. his life? Very dangerous. No. She only asked if I called 911. Was Miss Clearman at the body before you got to the body? Yes. So you don't know what Miss Clearman could have done prior to you getting to the body, correct? No. Was there anybody else around at the time you went to the body along with Miss Clearman? Yes, uh, there was another couple. Okay. That was there. I'm assuming they're a couple. It was a man and a woman. Was she African American? Very bigoted. I would say she was African American. Okay. If the state could go back to state um, exhibit number 34, please. And go right about to one minute and 29 seconds. I'm going to stop right there. Is the young lady that you seen that was present at the time you were at the body get out this red SUV? I didn't see her get out, but. Uh, 
I believe the guy that was with her returned to that vehicle. Was that a black guy? I believe so, yes. Did it appear to be her husband? I would say, yeah, they were couples. They were a couple. And what did you see the African-American woman at the scene doing at the time? I believe we were almost standing next to each other and she was asking, I believe she asked the, um, you said Miss Clerk was the wife name. I think she was asking if she was okay or something of that sort. So you seen the African American lady asking Miss Clearman if she was okay? Yes. Did you ever see Miss Clearman ask the African American lady to assist in saving her husband's life? No. You never seen her ask to apply pressure to the wound where the blood was coming from, correct? No. You never seen Miss Clearman ask the African American lady to apply CPR or apply any medical assistance to her whatsoever, correct? No. Have we established that CPR is an effective treatment for a gunshot wound to the head? And it wouldn't matter if it was. I mean, the wife would have to know that. Now, Mr. Right? Eric, so. I noticed that you're in an orange jumpsuit today. Mm -hmm. How do you feel mm -hmm. about that? It's terrible. I shouldn't be in this suit at all. It's not my color. Now, you've been incarcerated because you were a material witness in this case, correct? Yes. And the state have been trying to get in contact with you to give testimony in this case, correct? Not trying, they have contacted me. I've been speaking to them throughout the duration of this case. But you really didn't want to be here, did you? No, that wasn't the case. I had wanted no $500 a minute to testify. Is there a reason why you weren't served a subpoena or it was a little bit troubling getting that? Because I own my own business and I have six children I'm raising. And I even told the guy, I don't have a problem receiving the subpoena, but I can't drop everything in my life just to come and pick up this piece of paper. I understood that when court was, and I told them I would be there. I never, never told them I wasn't gonna be there. When I came to pick up the subpoena, that's when I was arrested. What a raw He's deal. Cold-blooded, Mr. Cameron. Have, well, let me let me strike that. Mr. Cameron, have you ever seen anyone get shot before? Yes. <laughs> and yeah, what was that? Time. How was that experience for you? Um somewhat traumatizing. <laughs> that time or he was the shooter. Anytime you see someone, whether it's a shot or getting beat, when you see someone of that nature, it's, it's, it's traumatizing. And this situation was traumatizing for you as well, correct? Yes. And you still have the effects from what you saw back on September 22nd, correct? Yeah. Now, when you seen Mr. Edgecombe, from the moment there was a punch, right? Mm -hmm. And you seen that punch. Yes. And you seen Mr. Edgecombe get on his bike, correct? Yeah. Did Mr. Edgecombe appear to be a threat to Mr. Clearman after he got on the bike? No. Did it appear that Mr. Edgecombe withdrew from any confrontation that existed at that moment? Yes, he was trying to get away. And you also noticed Mr. Edgecombe turned a corner to try to get away, correct? Yes. yes. And did you notice Mr. Edgecombe standing up on his bike? Riding off? Yes. Now, there was a time that you see Mr. Edgecombe on the sidewalk, correct? Yes. And he was still trying to get away, right? Yes. Is there any time that you saw Mr. Edgecombe take any aggressive step toward Mr. Clemen or identify any aggressive behavior from Mr. Edgecombe from the time he got back on that bike? No. Did After he punched him in the face. <laughs> Mr. Cameron, that Mr. Edgecombe was trying to get down the stairs to escape Mr. Clemen? Yes. But he was stopped, wasn't he? Yes. Those are not Glock magazines. I have no more questions for you, Mr. Cameron. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Stay. Defense counsel asked you whether or not, apparently in a phone conversation you had with the lawyers, I guess? Yes. That you told them that the defendant appeared or the shooter, was just so we're clear, you never identified who the shooter was, right? No. All right. So the shooter appeared shot, right? Yes. But in your phone calls, 
to 911 and to the police, you refer to it as cold blooded, right? The shot was cold blooded. The shot was cold blooded, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You never said that the shooter appeared shot, did you? I did. Re I do recall mentioning that he hesitated. He he did not run right away. Understood. But you didn't say shocked in the phone call. You referred to what he had just done as cold blooded, right? Yes. And you told the police, you got to get, he's still in this area. You got to find him, right? Yes. You said, I believe guys got to go, right? Yes. Means you got to lock the guy up. Yes. You just saw him shoot someone cold bloodedly in the face. Yes. Now, <clears throat> Additionally, just one portion, since we already have state exhibit number 34 lined up here, a couple things that I do want to discuss here. And I have it paused at 16 or 18 seconds into the recording. Can you still see it? Yeah. I know. It's yes. Cool. All right. So. We've established that this one right here, that's going to be you pulling up behind this incident. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And the horrible Zoom we have, I'm going to try to use it here real quick. And playing from that portion at 18 seconds. We can now see that the shooter is already in that stair area, kind of in that corner, right? Yes. Okay. And the, the victim, the, the person who's going to get shot in the face, he kind of breaks into a little jog, a little run to kind of get over there, right? Yeah. This guy's already in that corner. According to the video, yes. Okay. Not necessarily the way you'd remembered it, right? Yes. Okay, but we can see he's already there, and he's not moving. And this guy's get breaks into a little jog, right? Yes. Okay. And just so we're clear, I'm circling what is the victim, Mr. Edgecombe. Now, playing from that portion... Pause it. Now, I want to draw your attention to something here, sir. This is your vehicle, right? Yes. You're looking at it at an angle. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. This is the victim, right? Yes. This is the shooter, right? Yes. Now, when defense counsel was doing his demonstration, he had himself and his back 100% to you, right? Yes. Couldn't see his arms, right? That's not the way you were situated, was it? No. Okay, so the whole thing the defense counsel did doesn't reflect what actually <laughs> you said. Right? I didn't see anything in his hand. Okay, no. understood you didn't see anything. You couldn't even see the hands when defense counsel's doing this this trickery, right? No, I couldn't see the trickery. defendant's hands neither. Okay. Couldn't I mean, not the defendant's, defense. but the, the victim's hand. Okay. You said he was in a boxing stance, right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, if we're looking on the video, we can see he's got one leg forward, and one arm up, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, and that's what you're looking at, right? Yes. You're seeing that kind of side portion of them, right? A little yes. bit behind. Can You can see an arm, right? Yes. Okay, so not completely like we had, but more of a side portion. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Ooh. Yes. Okay. Now, just to be clear, you couldn't see his hands. You couldn't see if he had anything in there or not. No. Okay, fair enough. But it looked to you. This prosecutor's like good, man. To yes. To me, I don't know. You're gonna fight. In this case. So yes. Yes. Okay. He puts the energy where it matters. <laughs> and just so we have this, because he just basically said, "Now it doesn't matter because you couldn't see either way." But everything that guy did that was bullshit. With the fight, <laughs> shooter, Trickery. Moves from the moment we see the victim get out of the car until this boxing stance happens, right? He's kind of still in that corner that entire time, right? Yes, according to the video. Okay. Now, there had been some question about 
when you come back and you know whether or not we can see you on the video return. Mm -hmm. I want to spend just a little bit of time following you on this on this video if we can, okay? Yes. All right. Playing from states exhibit number uh, the same one from uh, 28 seconds into the recording. I'm going to pause at 44 seconds into the recording. You're still in the camera, right? Yes. All right. So you've pulled forward, but now you're just kind of like on that little curve, like you were telling us. Yes. All right. Um, playing from that portion. Still see you in that same area, correct? Yes. Haven't pulled yes. off, have you? No. And that was, just so we're clear, we can still see your vehicle there? Yes. Still see your brake lights? Yes. And that was the end of the video, right? Yes. Okay. So... At least on the video, you don't leave the scene area, do you? Yes. Just like you said. Yes. Nothing else. Thank you. Any follow up? Yeah, it is lame that this guy had to be arrested to come in. Sounds, I mean, he's saying now that he he would have come in on his own, but he couldn't pick up the subpoena or whatever. Uh, I don't know why they didn't just serve the subpoena on him at his business now or he's residence. That you got out and you went to the um, to the area where the body was at, correct? Yes. Would you describe that as being a, a pretty confined place? Yes. It was tight, maybe, you know, four feet or so? Yes. It's a small box, correct? Yes. So Mr. Edgecombe at that place, he would be confined, correct? Yes. Now, behind him was a... He would have to jump over a banister, correct? And there's a drop down, right? Yes. And that drop down would probably be approximately about 30 feet or so, would you guess? I would say probably more. You say probably more than 30 feet? Yeah, it's a bridge. Okay. About 40 feet? About 40 to 50, 50 feet, yeah. Okay. So it's about a 50? 40 to 50 feet. So Mr. Edgecombe would have to, one option would be for him to jump over this bridge, which would be 50 feet, correct? Yes. Now, to Mr. Edgecombe's left, there was a steep staircase, correct? Yes. yes. And Mr. Edgecombe would have to then take his bike, correct? Yes. And then to go down these steep stairs, that would well, be he wouldn't have to be an approximate length, correct? Yes. Now, I mean, you can't shoot someone because you didn't want to take your bike you down the stairs. It's dark in that area, yep. correct? Yes. And you don't know what the words were. Of Mr. Clearman when he was face to face with Mr. Edgecombe, do you? No. You don't know if he said, I'm going to kill you now. You didn't you don't know if he sat there or not, do you? No. Now you mentioned that from the time that Mr. Edgecombe got on that bike, you mentioned he was trying to get away, correct? Yes. Did he appear to be afraid to you? Afraid, yeah. He's he's trying to get away. And when he turned that right corner, did he appear to be afraid? Yes. Really... And when, and when he, 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 he stands up on the bike and he's now aggressively pedaling, correct? Yes. And he gets into the bike lane, correct? Yes. And there's something that happens that causes Mr. Edgecombe to get, go from the bike lane to now jump a curb, correct? Yes. And I think your testimony was it appeared that Mr. Edgecombe fell off the bike when the Edgecombe's I'm sorry, where the clearmans were using their vehicle toward him. Is that yes. correct? Would you would you consider the vehicle coming at Mr. Edgecombe aggressively? 
Yeah. Would you consider the vehicle coming at Mr. Edgecombe violently? Yeah. Did it appear that Mr. Edgecombe was afraid at the time he jumped the car to get on the sidewalk? Yeah, because he fell. Did it appear that Mr. Edgecombe was afraid when he continued on onto the sidewalk? Yeah. Did it appear that Mr. Edgecombe was afraid when he turned right to try to escape the exact direction of Mr. and Mr. and Mrs. Clearman? Yeah. Maybe object to this is calling for testimony about the defendant's state, state of mind. Of mind. Yeah. Yes. No more questions. I don't think they're too worried they can about have it. a couple questions and we'll be better. Um, just to be very clear, though, when you talk to the police that night and when you call 911, you didn't say any of the stuff you're saying to defense counsel now, did you? No. You're having phone calls with them, but what you told the police was that he just pulled out a gun and shot him in the head, right? Yes. And that it was cold blooded, right? Yes. And you guys better get here to find him, right? Yes. None of what defense counsel's talking about. No. You didn't mention any of that in the 911 call. No. You didn't mention any of that when the police call you on the phone. No. You didn't mention any of that to the detective. No. That's it. No. No further and in questions. Fact, when you talked about the hesitation, do you remember telling the detective that the reason you thought the defendant hesitated was because the victim fell into his bike and he had to like pick the bike over and get it over the body? No, I don't recall saying that. Do you remember saying, and just want to make sure I have this, when you spoke to a Christopher Fritz, a detective Fritz. He's not impeaching the witness. He's just drawing out that, that the witness was led through all this by the defense. If the victim fell onto the suspect's bicycle, because the suspect hesitated for a moment and then carried his bicycle down the stairway. Do you remember saying that? I do not. Okay. Did the shooter seem afraid when he rode up and punched the guy, or punched the victim in the face in the car? No. Rides up and just punches him, right? Yeah. And then he, he goes on his way, right? Yeah. And when you're referring to it to the police, you refer to it as cold blood. Yes. Nothing else. Thank you. Offense, briefly. Man, they're letting him go back and forth <clears throat> on this one. Cameron. Really belaboring some now of this stuff. Now you talked to a police officer on September 22nd, the night that it occurred. Correct? Stop yes. stepping on that thing. Did that officer ever ask you to come in to the office, to the police station? No. He never asked you to make a formal statement, did he? No. He never asked you to sign anything, did he? No. Now, today, Mr. Cameron, you understand that your testimony is under oath, correct? Yeah. You raised your right hand. Yes. You swore to tell the truth. Yes. yes. And is the is the testimony that you gave today true? Yes. Is it accurate? As much as I can remember, yes. Is it the whole story of what you remember on September 22nd? Of what I remember, yes. Thank you. I don't know what you just did there. They did ask you to talk to detectives, didn't they? We just saw it on the body cam. Yeah, that night they came and came to my house to speak with me. Yeah, to, to take a formal statement, right? I don't know if it was formal or not. I didn't, I didn't sign anything. No, but, but detectives and an officer and 911 call all took from you what you told them, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Counsel, anything? All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, almost 10 to 12. We're going to break for lunch. Um, so for the jury, I'm going to ask you to be back at 1 o'clock. Um, since I want you to all make it back safely, please be careful what you choose in the cafeteria because as you've probably figured out by now, the food, you know, <laughs> maybe for the rest of the week or tomorrow, I'll bring a lunch. But either way, <laughs> I'll be back at one o'clock. Please leave your notepads where they are. Uh, you know, all the other rules about not deliberating. He wants this no done. Reason, no discussion of the case. Follow my bailiff out. Everybody else can remain seated until the jury's out, please. <laughs> this judge is killing me. Oh, Doc's juror's hair and back. I don't know if that was a juror. That was a joke, but. God. 
food in the, the cafeteria. Week, kinda... uh, bring in some pop tarts or energy bars or something. <laughs> We're not breaking for shit. Bring your own lunch because this stuff will kill you. <laughs> bring an empty Gatorade jar to you know relieve yourself in. Uh, guys, I will cover the Chandler Halderson closing arguments tonight. Uh, out. Um, we're in recess. We'll see everybody back around one or a few minutes after we try to start up at 115. Uh, Bail conditions and let go today. Yes. Thank you. There you go. He gets to go home. They were only holding him for custody to testify because it seems like there is some miscommunication that happens. But remember, we're only getting one side of that story. We're only getting one side of that story, and it was it was that he uh, he couldn't drop everything to go pick up the subpoena. When he went to pick up the subpoena, they, uh, you know, at that point, they, um, what you call it, they arrested him for not coming to pick up the subpoena. Who knows what the circumstances were? I have no idea. It does seem lame uh, to get arrested to be brought in to testify. But someone was asking in the chat why you do that, and the reason is because it. It's it's kind of funny. The state has to do that for the benefit of the defendant. Uh, the defendant has the right to confront their accusers. This guy called the cops and said this this guy shot someone cold blooded, right? Like he has the right to cross examine that guy uh, and and to confront him. So, um, you know that's that's part of why the system works the way it does. But it is it is lame that he had to get arrested for it personally. Uh, or that the state decided he had to get arrested for it. So how long are they breaking for? Did the judge say back at 12.15? Is it- no, it's no, lunchtime. It be, right? Yeah, I, th- I would assume till 1-ish, or 12.45. I, I thought he said qu- after the quarter after the hour, but it must have been one fifteen his time. Which oh, would man, be that's an hour and a half. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, one fifteen. they're saying. Whew. This is a long-ass break. <laughs> uh, and the rest of the week bring in a jimmy johns it's yeah, i could somebody I could, get me a number five but extra hots i could use a jimmy johns i had one last yesterday it was great it was delicious uh okay we got yeah i remember you talking about it. i've been thinking about it ever since sorry maybe i can get my wife to grab me one yeah get a get an uber uh, I'm glad we didn't have to leave the house today. I was supposed to teach this morning, but um, uh, I mentioned earlier one of my one of my kids was sick last night, and it's our homeschool co-op. And so the the rule is, if a kid gets sick, uh, no one can go in, right? Like that's yep. that's the way. So that's why I'm here. But at the same time, it was negative 18 degrees. <laughs> I was like, holy good lord! I don't want to take these kids out in this cold. <laughs> Uh, you want to poll on what? What do you want to poll on? To the chat. Uh, Sandwich I, I shops? Don't... Yeah. No kidding. Uh, what what poll? I guess like guilty or not guilty at this point? Do we want to say that? Okay, justified. We'll say justified shoot or unjustified shoot. Uh, that's what we got. Theodore. Edge. Home, attorney slayer, justified shoot, not justified shoot. It's always, you know, a chore trying to word these things appropriately. This man's ordering a sandwich right now. It's amazing. <laughs> Well, I mean, the narratives are pretty clear, I think. <laughs> Did you just order a sandwich? I'm trying. Hold on. <laughs> <coughs> we'll do a quick rundown. We'll do a quick rundown. So here's here's the skinny on the situation. What we know is that the defendant was on a bike. The deceased victim was the passenger in a Kia Soul, which is probably guilt. You know, he would be guilty in any other case, except he's deceased. He's the passenger in a Kia Soul. His wife is driving. The deceased is intoxicated, a 0.12 blood alcohol content. He and his wife are allegedly out drinking. No idea if the wife is intoxicated or what her level of intoxication may be. That has not come out at this point in time. 
There's an allegation, we don't know because it's not on video, that while driving, the wife swerved and uh, came into con the car came into contact with the defendant. After that, at some point, 30 seconds to a minute later, uh, the the wife, the driver, and, and the deceased are sitting at a stoplight and the bike rolls up alongside the passenger side and uh, there's some words are exchanged. We don't know what. And the guy punches into the car and punches the deceased person in the face. He then rides his bike off and makes a right-hand turn at the next intersection. About 30 seconds later, uh, they are able to pull through the intersection, maybe 15 seconds. I'm, I'm estimating on times. I don't remember, but they're able to pull through the intersection. They make a right-hand turn, apparently in pursuit, and they drive towards him and into the bike lane. He leaves the bike lane and goes up onto the curb. Uh, don't know if it's a result of the car or whatever, but he goes up onto the curb and he um, rides his bike ahead a little bit. And then he gets off of the bike at some point and goes towards some stairs, which go down away from the street and towards some other walkway, maybe like a park or something. There's a bridge over this area, but he's taking stairs down to a place or, or he goes towards the stairs. He doesn't actually get on them. Uh, the guy gets out of the car. The deceased victim gets out of the car and pursues him uh, to some point, uh, escalating to a jog, maybe even a slow run. Not quite clear from the video as he gets close and he's probably within six feet of this guy. Um, we see, we see hands go up from the deceased and then we see a hand come up from the, uh, from the defendant and he pulls the trigger and puts a bullet into the guy's dome. There is stippling on the wound. We're going to get some testimony apparently, uh, as to probably the estimated distance, but it's close enough that there's actual, you know, gunpowder and residue from the gun embedded in the skin of the head. Uh, so there, there is some of that that has gone on. The guy then flees the scene and flees the state and is missing in action for about six months. He's picked up in what, like Kentucky, I think something like that. He's yeah, from, Kentucky. Yeah. He's from this. This happens in Wisconsin. He is arrested in Kentucky when he's pulled over. He lies to a police officer about his identity. The police officer uh, checks his, finds his ID card, which he said he didn't have with him, sees who it is, runs it, finds out there's a warrant out for his arrest. He gets brought back. That's the story. Theodore Edgecombe, as best as I can retell it. Um, there's Theodore Edgecombe's defense has alleged that the uh, man chasing him said, I'm going to kill you N word. Uh, they also alleged that he had a knife. He did have a knife. The state's position is that the knife was in the pocket. The defense's position is that the knife may not have been in the pocket. I think they're going to have Edgecombe testify that the knife was in the guy's hand. So uh, trying to figure out if that, I, I, that's the story again, as best as I can recall the facts there, there could be some more that comes out at trial. We won't know until they actually elicit that testimony. Uh, Tom Grawl says, Jimmy Johns can't hold a candle to Jersey Mike's. Uh, there's no Jersey Mike's within, I think a hundred miles of where I am. So unfortunately I'm, I'm stuck with Jimmy Johns, which is a mere 15 miles away. But uh, you got to remember, I live in the middle of BFE, and what we get is what we get. So, so that. Uh, but yeah, so that's the, uh, so far the poll is split uh, 23% justified, 77% not justified. I think they're going to have a whole lot of trouble making this one a, a valid self-defense claim, frankly. I think, I think him fleeing is, is just, it's absolutely devastating to his case. Absolutely. And there being no no evidence except for whatever self-serving statement he's going to make about the knife ever being out of the pocket. Correct. Which might yeah. have had credibility, again, if he had not you know, flown the coop six states, six months, whatever it was, six months, right, until he was picked up. Looking for an attorney for six months, we're supposed to believe. That's the state, uh, the defense representation on opening, which is uh, stretches credulity. Yeah, not the not the strongest uh, argument. Not the argument I would go with. Um, someone says, "Could the wife testify to him using the N word?" She is of she of course has bias, but 
and maybe something. I mean, she would testify that he didn't right. say anything of the sort. Um, oh, the, the deceased is also an immigration attorney. So part of the trouble with the defense's narrative is that this guy is an immigration attorney, has been for a very long time, uh, is married to a wife of color. She's not black. She's, uh, but she's, she's similarly not white. You're muted if you're talking. Sorry, I was uh, we, making my sandwich order. Oh, okay. I thought I was making sure you weren't talking to me. Um, she is, uh, but, but the idea is that an attorney who uh, deals with presumably people of color on a regular basis is, uh, is, is using racial slurs, is tough on the narrative. It's very tough on the narrative. So, uh, you know. Nick is racist as F all non-whites are black now. Yes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm saying. One drop of dark is all drops of dark. Ah, I'm the grand dragon or whatever. My name is Robert Bird. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's bits and pieces you can try to sew together here to make a, a self-defense narrative out of. Uh, it's really complicated because of the guy's flight and lying when confronted by police and all that jazz. But certainly, um, is it Clearman? I'm blanking. Yeah, Clearman. Him. Clearman. Um, I mean, you know, they follow him around that corner pretty damn aggressively. That car is moving quick. Um, yep. You know, frankly, if he had shot at the car while the car was closing on him at the curb, that would look a lot like self-defense to me. Yeah. I would, um, I would say that's just basically scare him off his bike. So he falls on the sidewalk. He's retreating from them. They pursue him again, pretty aggressively goes into a fighting stance, pretty aggressive, uh, outweighs him by 60 pounds, uh, but substantially older. And of course, apparently shit faced. Um, so that's all pretty aggressive conduct. The question is, does it rise to the level of an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury? And absent the knife, I don't, I don't see it. Not at, not when the guy just squares up, hasn't even thrown a punch yet, and you shoot him in the face. That's, I think that's, that's a stretch that does not look like proportional defensive force to me. Yeah, Stern at Law says Nick. I hate to say it, but it seems like your viewers seems biased. If this is Rittenhouse doing the same thing, the poll would favor justified. But Rittenhouse had so many different factors in his, uh, in his favor. One, he was threatened by the initial assailant earlier in the night we had that testified to two he and overheard by other witnesses not just written houses right testimony. uh two the guy was reaching for his gun at the time he pulled the trigger which was testified to by a very close eyewitness and in the complaint three uh at the end of the day this is really important rittenhouse goes to turn himself in to the police they don't they don't take him into custody there at the scene, which he may have actually preferred them take him into custody because he probably felt he was still in danger. But instead, uh, they tell him to to go home. Basically, he eventually, uh, you know, gets back to the people that he's with and then they go back to his home and he does turn himself into the police, maintained his story the entire time uh, about self-defense from from day one. Also, the people that he shot in that, let's let's go through the the steps here. The all the people that he discharged a weapon at. The first one is, of course, uh Rosenbaum, who is chasing him, uh, screaming at him, um, screaming F you at him at the top of his lungs after throwing something, and then again reaching for the gun, getting within just a few feet, uh, actually having his hand on the barrel, I think is the testimony there. So that's when he makes the decision to fire. The next time he discharges his weapon is at jump kick man. Now, Kyle has just been knocked to the ground or well, he's been hit in the back of the head. He's been hit with a skateboard and then he stumbles and falls to the ground, I should say. And jump kick man jumps in and kicks him in the face, a full on kick to the face while he's laying on the ground. He discharges a weapon twice, does not happen to hit jump kick man who then leaves the scene. Uh, Anthony Huber skateboard bro comes back in, hits him with the skateboard again while he's on the ground, has his hand clearly grabs the barrel of the gun and is pulling it away from him at the time that he is shot. And then finally Gage Groskowitz comes up, uh, does the hands up thing, but then grabs 
or takes his firearm and points it at Kyle Rittenhouse, points it in his direction, if not directly at his uh, face and before he is shot in the arm. And these are the, the defense has tried to draw parallels to Kyle Rittenhouse. The defense here is trying to also make this into a case about race. And if they lose this, they're going to make the narrative that Rittenhouse got off self-defense because he's white. This guy got off of self-defense because he's black. Uh, that's been their public representation. I'm not putting that on them. That's, that's how they have been conducting this case. But uh, the issue is that Rittenhouse had a much more compelling case of self-defense than this guy has. Now, the, there could be something they could have someone there who can testify that that the guy chasing him is yelling, I'm going to kill you. And word they could have someone who sees the knife in the hand or who actually sees the wife, like remove the knife and put it into the pocket or something like that. If they've got some testimony like that, it could change the story so far. It doesn't seem likely. So, and I see a lot of people in the comments saying, what you mean? Uh, the guy's not edge comb is not allowed to defend himself. No, you're allowed to defend yourself. But proportionally, if you're only facing a non-deadly force threat and a barehanded punch is normally, absent aggravating factors, is going to be a non-deadly force attack, you can use non-deadly force to defend yourself. But you don't have license to shoot somebody in the face. Yeah, and someone was asking earlier, and maybe you could uh, talk about this. I mean, I, I can give you my opinion too, but um, when does it, when does it, they, they asked, well, when does it become justifiable use of deadly force. And I said, well, when you become reasonably in fear of imminent death or serious bodily injury, right? Uh, serious bodily injury, imminent death is pretty obvious, but serious bodily injury is some sort of permanent type of injury or, uh, typically some sort of bone fracture that you're going to suffer. So, um, a head, a traumatic head injury could be serious bodily injury, typically not going to be associated with a punch. Uh, it, although that could happen, brass knuckles make that a different, you know, sort of thing. Um, but a, a bone break or permanent scarring, you know, someone's going to slice you with a knife. It's going to leave a permanent mark on your body, that, that type of stuff. So then once you Sorry. convert, usually yeah, they yeah. phrase it as either a short term, very serious injury, like something you would recover from, uh, but a, like a broken bone, a deep cut, something along those lines. Or it could be a, a, a minor injury that lasts a long time or is permanent, like a, a scar to the face, for example. Yeah. It might qualify a serious bodily injury if it's permanent. Yep. And, and so once that becomes a factor, then deadly force can become justified. Uh, and, and if you look to the Trayvon Martin case, for example, when um, Zimmerman becomes justified in shooting Trayvon Martin is when Trayvon Martin is in the MMA mount position, bouncing his head off the pavement, because when your head is getting cracked against pavement, you are at risk of serious bodily injury, if not imminent death at that point in time. So that's and, and Zimmerman waits until then to shoot him. He doesn't shoot Trayvon Martin because Trayvon Martin is squared up or because even if he gets hit one time while standing up. That's right. that's not how that works. And also, Zimmerman testified that when he was on his back mounted by uh, Martin, that Martin saw uh, Zimmerman's gun. The jacket fell open. The gun was exposed and and uh, Martin went to go for the gun. And right. Now, you may not believe that because that you may deem that to be self-serving testimony that uh, Zimmerman made up. But the certainly the injuries to the, the face and the head are, you know, incontestable. Right. So uh, the. So in, in this case, you've got, you've got some issues. The guy puts his hands up. He hasn't taken a swing. Uh, he hasn't actually made a deadly force threat at the point would be the argument. I mean, you can, if you're, if you disagree with that, that's fine. The jury can actually disagree with that too. Remember, this is, we're trying to convince a jury. The defense is trying to convince a jury that this guy was a deadly force threat, that he was, he put uh, this man in fear for his life. Now, again, a big problem with that is usually you have to have some statement that you were in fear for your life and having that statement come six to 18 months later isn't as convincing to people as having it right away. Uh, and and that's the that's a big problem. Again, with the case of Michael Drejka uh, is one I like to go back to because that's one where you probably could have had a justified shoot if not for the statements of Michael Drejka where he said that he was not in fear 
He carried a firearm, so he wasn't afraid of anybody or anything. Wasn't afraid when he got knocked down. He neutralized the situation. Those statements sunk his case, whatever case he had. And this is a, this is a guy who had just been blindsided and knocked to the ground uh, by by a bigger guy. Um, that guy was, you know, it turned out in that case he was stepping backwards versus advancing. However, uh, you could easily argue that it looked to me like he was advancing. I was afraid he was going to start kicking me in the face yep. uh, and that I was going to die. Um, you know, but he, he didn't ever get there. He, he would not. And the cops, the cops questioning a Michael Dreshko, it's amazing because they're like almost trying to get him there and he just wouldn't say it. It's it's I did a video on the entire uh, the police interview with it um, and uh, year, probably over a year ago now. But uh, but it was it was a phenomenal uh, case to watch and, and to see that. But it it shows you just how important it is that you're saying the right things when you've actually defended yourself. Yeah. And you so. should never, never. Uh, be talking in that circumstance uh, without a lawyer present. I mean, there may be yep. things you want to say in 911. There may be things you want to say on the scene. But once you're off the scene and talking to detectives, you're not saying a damn word uh, without a lawyer present. There's no upside uh, to talking to the detectives unrepresented. Yep. Terrible. They're not your friend. <laughs> they're, remember, they're trying to solve dead guy. They're trying to solve the dead guy problem. They're not trying to, to you know, see if you're okay. And they're just, and they're trying to clear the case, right? And clear the case doesn't necessarily mean having the right answer. It means having a legally acceptable answer. Yep. Uh, I, everybody I knows they, they're, 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 their mission is not to arrive at the absolute truth. This is not TV or the movies. There, there is no absolute truth that anybody can arrive at. All they can do is try to get some vague approximation of the truth. And if their view of the evidence and your statements is their vague approximation of the truth is that you did it, well, then that's how they're going to see the case. I, I phrase it this way. Uh, people ask, you know, why I say don't talk to cops. And I say, I don't talk. I, I recommend not talking to cops because I respect them to do their job. But the important thing is remembering what the police officer's job in that instance is. It is to find sufficient evidence that somebody is guilty of some crime. They don't care if it's you or whoever, but they're that's their job is to find out that someone is guilty of some crime. So when you talk to them, you're giving them potential leads that you may be guilty of some crime. They're just trying to find probable cause. The DA can suss out the rest. And so uh, I respect them to do that job. They're very good at that job. Does that mean they're very good at finding the truth all the time? No, it doesn't. Because that's not their job. That's not what they're, they're after. Enough evidence to bring a charge for some crime against somebody. And they really don't care if it's you or someone else. It's, it's not like they're out to get you. But that's why you don't make yourself a target. So Lillian <laughs> short timer says, don't what? talk to the cops, even on a 911 call. Folks, if you're on a 911 call, guess who you're talking to? <laughs> <laughs> you're talking to the cops, my friend. When someone brought up earlier uh, in the context of this guy being arrested and forced to testify, why would they report a crime? You know what? The majority of crimes, I'll, I'll say it. I wouldn't report the majority of crimes personally. I, you know, now, am I going to report a murder? I mean, maybe that that's a little bit different uh, than than seeing some. But if I see someone punch someone else in the street, like, am I going to get involved in that? I don't know if I'm going to. I don't I don't necessarily have any reason to do that. Uh, so people have to make that decision for themselves. But the state can't compel you to report a criminal act that you've witnessed. Uh, you, you They can't. They can't do that. You have to volunteer that information before any compulsion can take place. And there's no penalty for not reporting something. Now, if you don't report like a murder, for example, they could ask, they could start to ask why you didn't report a murder if you're involved in it, if there's evidence of that. But I mean, you just, you walk by and see some guy like looting a store. You don't have to report that. So uh, do you want the hassle? Do you want to be involved in that? That's a decision you make. Wow, that's awful, Nick. Well, it's it may be awful, <laughs> but the question is, what? Uh, how much interaction do you want with uh, with the authorities? <laughs> like I said, if if it's a murder or something, you've got a little bit of a different question going on. 
but uh, but as far as like you know the the vast majority of crimes that you're likely to witness are are lower level offenses. So, uh, are you sure you don't have to report a crime? Because I'm pretty sure you have a duty to call nine one one. No, you do not. Nope. No, nope. they can't. They cannot do that. Not if you mean a legal duty. I mean, if you think you have a moral duty, uh, that's up to you. You know, but there's yeah, a- yeah. They they can't impose a legal duty to compel you to speak. They can't do that. So, uh, so that's that's good. Brian Miller says, "Wouldn't him punching the deceased take away self defense?" <clears throat> Not necessarily. And in this case, it seems like that punch is far enough away from the actual shooting that uh, that there would be ample ability to rehabilitate and reestablish a self-defense claim if there is a self-defense claim. Yeah, he was cl- he clearly was separating himself from that first confrontation. That was that was one fight and he would still legally be on even if the shooting was lawful. Uh, he'd still be on the hook for the simple battery for the punch right. he threw the first time. That, that's a separate event. Um, but once he separated himself from that, once he withdrew and effectively, constructively communicated his withdrawal uh, to Clearman, then Clearman pursues him. That's the second fight in which Clearman is the aggressor, the physical aggressor in the second fight. But by appearances, he's a non-deadly force aggressor. And uh, Edgecombe has reacquired the right of self-defense against that non-deadly force aggression by Clearman once he's followed. But then Edgecombe escalates what was a non-deadly force fight into a deadly force fight, and he becomes the deadly force aggressor in yet a third fight that occurs in the course of just a few seconds, really. Yep, it's uh, it's a mess. But but yeah, you can you in Wisconsin, you merely lose presumptions. Isn't that right? Like, is that the the way to frame it? If you're the aggressor, you you, you lose presumptions. No, uh, that would be true in the defense of home scenario where they have okay. special provisions, legal presumptions of a reasonable fear of an intruder's coming into your home. There's a- always a bunch of conditions that have to be met and a bunch of exclusions that have to be avoided to qualify for that legal presumption in defending your home. And if you don't check all the boxes, you lose the legal presumption. You don't lose self-defense. Uh, you still have the same self-defense privilege you would have if you were out in the street. Uh, but you don't get the special benefit of the presumptions that come with your home normally if you check all the boxes. Now, if you're the initial aggressor in a fight, you, you've you lost the privilege of self-defense. You've lost what we call the element of innocence, five elements of self-defense, folks, innocence, eminence, eminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Uh, innocence meaning essentially you're not the initial aggressor. You're not a mutual combatant. Uh, if you're the initial aggressor, you lose that required element of innocence. And it's never waived, by the way. Some of the other elements can be waived, but innocence is never waived. Uh, but the 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 on the plus side, if you lose innocence, you can regain innocence moving forward. And you can regain innocence primarily by either withdrawing from the fight, communicating your withdrawal from the fight. You regain that element of innocence. Or if you were the initial aggressor, but only a non-deadly force aggressor, and the other party escalates to deadly force, then they become the initial deadly force aggressor in what's effectively a second fight. Um, and you've regained the privilege of self-defense against their deadly force aggression. Um, a couple a couple chats here. Secor says, there must be a legal duty to inform emergency response and you're aware of any injury or threat to human life. There is not, not in the United States. They can't, do, you have a first amendment. You cannot be compelled to speak to the state. You can't, yeah. they, I mean, you they may have that, that legal duty if you were the cause of the injury or whatever the harm is. So you cause a traffic accident, you may have a legal obligation, uh, probably not criminal, probably just civil, uh, to make an attempt, a reasonable attempt to provide care for the people you've wrongly injured. And I have seen a, one or two states that have uh, statutes that uh, nominally have a purport to create a legal requirement to uh, report, a say, a dead body. Uh, that kind of thing. I never really see those tested in court. I'm not aware of any actual case law on them. So it'd be I, a very interesting First Amendment case on on someone actually getting punished for that and not pleading out. Um, the other the other thing is you you can have duties created professionally. Um, uh, uh, for example, there there may be an, an instance where a doctor witness uh, with like like a a cardiologist witnesses someone that they should reasonably assume is suffering a heart attack 
and then they refuse to act, they may, may, but probably not be, be found liable professionally, uh, or civilly, but, but not criminally. Um, a psychiatrist who fails to inform someone that their uh, unhinged patient may be a risk to them. And then that person goes and injures the person. They, they know that it's imminent. Then like the person says, I'm going to leave your office and I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go stab so-and-so um, they may have some sort of civil duty. I don't believe they're going to have criminal obligations to do so. It's free speech matters. The first amendment matters. And the biggest component of free speech, the, the most protected speech is compelled speech. They can't, that is the government's ability to compel you to do something is it's of a different character than restriction. I've talked about this in other contexts, but um, it's very, very limited. Uh, v force wave says, but you can't sucker punch run, then shoot and claim self-defense. Uh, you, you kind of can they're they're sep If there are separate incidents that are occurring, you, you kind of can, because the guy's not, he has no obligation to chase him down. The altercation is over. Now that is someone going to chase down someone who sucker punches him? Probably <laughs> like that. That happens a lot that someone's going to chase him down, but it doesn't, it does not give you uh, some sort of ongoing conflict that, that will uh, eliminate your self-defense. But it's a, but it's a, it's a weird thing. The, and the jury may decide that that punch was sufficient provocation and then find the guy guilty. And we'll never actually know because uh, the jury is not going to tell you why they found the guy was not justified, but they can. We're, we're talking about the legal principle, which is different from how a jury reacts. Remember, juries are not lawyers or judges. They're applying the law in reference to their common sense and understanding. And I mean, common amongst those 12 people. So it's uh it's a little bit different than the actual legal standards um, fairly often. So again, cause a, a, a jury that was competently aware of the adequate legal standards would not have found Kim Potter guilty, but you know, that <laughs> if they were appropriately analyzing what mistake she made. So I hope that helps, but I know this, this stuff gets, it gets a little annoying and heady, uh, trying to figure out exactly how this stuff plays out. Cause it does, I mean, it seems like you should have to let let a police officer know if you think someone's about to murder someone else. I mean, it seems like a good idea. So I saw somebody put in the comments that there's uh, an example of a legal duty to provide assistance, and they link to a Minnesota law, the Good Samaritan law. And there's a the first paragraph there says, a person at the scene of an emergency who knows that another uh, has suffered grave physical harm shall, to the extent they can do so without danger or peril to themselves, give reasonable assistance to the exposed person. But folks, this is one of the dangers of reading statutory language and believing that 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 it means what it appears to mean. I just looked up that statute on Lexis. There's literally zero case law on that. For all we yeah. know, that's never been applied to anybody. And if it were applied to somebody, it would be found to be unlawful, unconstitutional. Uh, so until you can give me an example of someone who's actually processed, and by the way, even, even if you are found guilty, it's a petty misdemeanor. Uh, but if you can find me one actual example of someone prosecuted and convicted under that provision of law, I'll uh, send you without a plea without a plea to that. Yeah, right, right. Where they're they're actually prosecuted through uh, through the court cases um, or through a court case and and convicted, uh, and then don't appeal that because that is that is a that's a type of law that is passed and not enforceable in any and, way. And it's also not a requirement to report anything. It's actually a, a purported a nominal requirement to provide some kind of care, but, but lots of carve outs if you can do so without risk or danger to yourself and so forth. So, you know, you see someone drowning in a lake, you'd say, well, I, I could drown if I try to help that person. So that would carve me out even of that uh, statutory provision. But this happens all the time, folks, especially in use of force law. People send me uh, statutes frequently saying, Andrew, you said, uh, you said X, but this statute clearly says why, and it does say why. But when you look at how the courts actually apply that statute, when you read the actual jury instructions, which is what the jury is told in how to apply the law to real people in real cases, the answer is X. The courts interpret and apply that statute in a way that seems contrary to the plain English reading of the statute. But there's more than one authoritative source of law. There's the statutes, and then there's the case law. 
how the courts interpret and apply that statute. The statute doesn't mean what it appears to mean. It means what the courts say it means. Yeah, there's there's some cases on that statute, the all all pertaining to the second, second part of the argument. statute. Right. But uh, we've got here's the summary. The purpose of the Good Samaritan law is to encourage lay persons to help those in need, even when they are under no legal obligation to do so by providing immunity from liability claims arising out of an attempt to assist a person in peril. This uh, this is written in the civil uh, in the civil action section, and it's mostly focused on subdivision two, which is general immunity from liability. If you perform CPR on someone and break their ribs. Uh, because they have osteoporosis or just because you're performing CPR and that can sometimes happen. You, you, you're not you did be, it right, actually. I mean, yeah, real CPR is pretty forceful. You're not going to be held civilly liable for the damage, for the battery, right? With with serious bodily injury that you, right. just, occur, you just did to someone because you're attempting to help them in good faith. Uh, that's what that statute is actually there for. Subdivision one has no case law on it. And I'm, I'm just checking Westlaw since you check Nexus and I'm not seeing anything about it at all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's, it's, it's all, it's all about the immunity because I, I think if anybody was actually convicted of this, uh, that part would be stricken uh, almost immediately. Uh, there's no way that would be enforceable. But a petty misdemeanor is also kind of like a, a civil infraction too. And most people would just rather pay the fine than pay the, you know, pay the hundred bucks or whatever that you're going to have to pay for that rather than take it through an appeals court. Uh, we were held, I was just certified as an EMT. We are held to a duty to act similar to that law. Yet professionally you are. Right. Professionally you are. And maybe civilly. But the, the question is, if you're at a restaurant and someone four tables away is choking on a piece of beef, are you required to get up from your seat and go perform the Heimlich maneuver? And if you don't, would you be held liable for it? Says That's a stretch, man. That's a big stretch. So, um, okay. VPB says, imagine when you're, wait, no, I read that one. Oh, this was came in at the end of the show yesterday. Uh, it says, imagine when your father is a leading First Amendment attorney and you're bitching about someone exercising their First Amendment rights. Oh, don't talk about Dan Abrams that way. Very, very, <laughs> very uncouth to mention that the uh, the Abrams family legacy is built on on First Amendment legal representation. And then they're trying to shut down uh, clear exercises of the First Amendment. Don't don't do that. Distro 32 says, Ricada Law, take your swing. Law and crime swings. Uh, it says, I'll get you. I doubt it. Uh, Preston Barnhill says, Lamau, I was finishing up your stream from last night. Oh, that'll be one of the greatest lawsuits if they take any action. I, I, I doubt they're going to personally. I, I highly doubt they're going to, uh, Eric Chieftain says off topic, but are you compelled to give first aid? If you arrive first to a traffic accident in the U S you are here in Norway, just wondering, um, no, no. And again, any, any statutes that may exist compelling that are probably unconstitutional and likely simply haven't been challenged for whatever reason. That's, uh, that's just the way it goes. But again, should, morally, morally, should you do it? Should you provide care and first aid? I mean, if you're able to, maybe that's a good idea. And, uh, and you may, you may feel personally compelled to, and that is, that is fine. And morally, should you report criminal acts? I mean, maybe, <laughs> probably you got to decide that for yourself. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Um, Lord Vader says, I need legal advice. My neighbors took a huge Dan Abrams in my yard. Is that a lawn <laughs> crime? <laughs> yes, it is. That's lawn, a lawn and crime, crime channel. Uh, Jamie Moodley says, does Ray work at law and crime? Chess is my wealth. <laughs> Their new correspondent, Ray Gordon. Matt Hagen says, does leave the comment, God bless the nose, count as harassment, Nick? If so, I might need you to represent me. Again, I am not encouraging anybody to do anything in regards to law and crime. I very much appreciate the enthousi enthusiasm and uh, enthusiastic support people have for me in this obvious BS that they are trying to pull. But uh, I'm not asking anybody to go comment anything 
Uh, although I do have a hard time finding God bless the nose to be a harassing statement. I mean, you I know also, what's happening here, obviously. I mean, long crime is looking at their numbers and they're looking at oh, yeah. your numbers and they're saying, holy crap, we're getting our ass beat by a guy who lives in BFE, wherever you are, Minnesota or Wisconsin. Yeah. And uh, like, and we're a multi-million dollar enterprise and this guy's kicking our tail and they're, they're humiliated. So, yeah. And they shouldn't be humiliated. I'm doing something different than them. That's, that's the thing. If I was just out marketing them with their own product, that'd be, you know, that could be something they should be mad about, but I'm doing something that they're not doing. And they could be, they could hire, they could hire some lawyers to sit around and talk about stuff on the law and crime channel during the broadcast, but that's not the product they want to sell. It's like, they definitely it, don't. I, I might've mentioned, I've been interviewed on their channel a couple of times and you know, I, I, on use of force cases, of course. And when I talk about the law, they just, they fall asleep in the interview. They're yeah. completely disinterested. If there's some sexual or racial component to the case, that's, that's all they want to talk about. So it, it's not really law and crime network. It's more like, uh, it's a true crime Cinemax show. network, you know, legal Cinemax. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a true crime show, not a true law and crime show. And that's, that's fine. They can, they can do that, but that's like, they're selling a flour and they're mad that I'm using their flour to make bread. Uh, let's see. Matt Hagan's, uh, wait, Dennis Pettit says, will you please live stream the proceedings while providing commentary? Once law and crime versus Ricada law goes to court, that would be an ultimate trolling. Well, I, I did mention this. They, they did send the cease and desist to the wrong entity because <laughs> Ricada law is actually owned by Ricada media LLC. And so, um, you know, they sent it to me personally, but I'm just, I'm just a humble, humble, uh, you know, associate. Just FYI, uh, Nick, I'm, I'm looking yeah. at my laptop here and the feed I had from you, uh, yeah. looks like it's failed. So you may need, uh, to you got to refresh. Oh, okay. All you right. got to refresh. Cause when you refresh, you'll get this screen, right? We'll be right back. Uh, uh maybe so. let's see. Yeah. I had to refresh on mine. Okay. All right. Just wanted to give you a heads up. So. Yep. Thanks. I appreciate it. Diz five says I liked Kevin Samuels lawyer more. Uh, South Texas girl, South Texas gal says, love y'all. Hey, thank you. Justin P says, oh shit. Defense rests in Canabro without calling a witness. <laughs> Look, Canabro get an acquittal. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. That guy, that guy's going to prison forever. I I'm surprised the jury's still deliberating to be honest. Um, whew. maybe they tried to serve him pulled pork for lunch. <laughs> Julian McIntyre says, do we know if the wife is going to testify? Could the defense call her as a hostile witness? The wife is almost guaranteed going to testify on behalf of the state. Um, I mean, why the, wouldn't she? Yeah. I mean, she's, she's going to say, uh, yeah, my, my, they tried to, they, he, he killed my husband, right? Like he shot him in the face in cold blood. My husband wasn't a threat to him, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this guy rolled up on us, no warning screams into our car, punches my husband in the face. We follow to try and figure out who it is. And then, uh, my, my husband gets out of the car to try and identify him. Cause he was going to a place where we could no longer drive. And then, uh, as he got close, he shot my husband in the face and then defense will get to cross examiner. But, um, is and says, Oh no, I got the dreaded questionnaire in the mail for the first time. Can I ask you about jury nullification? You can. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mention it at all if you want to be on the jury. <laughs> Cameron Nelson says, turn signals and right turns are white supremacy. Radio Ruin says, who's the jogger now, white boy? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Court Eklund says, defense in Canterbury rest without calling a single witness. Uh, Q Revere says, I think this, self this is self-defense, and even I would vote to convict this guy out of spite due to the horrific defense cross-exam. P.S. Long crime asshole. Uh, Gideon's treasure says, since Chandler is looking cooked already, pun intended, could he be looking to claim ineffective counsel with them calling no witnesses? Probably not. No, I mean, they would document it very carefully with their client, of course. You know, I mean, uh, you'd you would think so, so, right? I yeah. mean, any claim of ineffective assistance is going to be made by the client. So if the client, yeah. you know, made an, an informed decision to uh, go with that strategy, that's, well, it's hard to appeal. Yeah, that would be a that would be a mess. 
Barry Dwarak says, please analyze defense closing arguments in Canabro when she's done. This will be interesting. I will be, I will be doing the closing arguments in the Chandler Halderson case tonight, tonight at 11 PM central. That'll be a great, uh, I can dedicate the whole show to it. Won't have any time constraints, uh, or anything like that. And it'll be, it'll be perfect. So tonight we'll do that. And if you, if you're not able to watch tonight, you can watch the, the VOD tomorrow and that'll be fine. Dragon's Treasure says, I humbly disavow Nick Ricada and fully support law and crime. Please give me that news network money now, Abrams. Uh, Warrior Biatch says, Nick, I found the audio statement from the judge on a short video from Canabro yesterday. It was an audio overlay between 10 and 20 minutes in law and crime is stupid. So is that a, where the judge is saying that, uh, that they don't want this broadcast on social media? And again, let's, let's be very clear on this for, for the people in the back. Um, when a judge is saying, I don't want you to put this on social media, he's talking to people who are under his jurisdiction. The media that are in the courtroom are prohibited from broadcasting to social media. Sure. Absolutely. If they want to be in the courtroom, they're going to comply. What the judge cannot do is order an injunction on the internet. He doesn't have that authority or ability. A Wisconsin judge who I'm not appearing before has no jurisdiction over me when I'm not in Wisconsin or reaching into Wisconsin to do some specific thing, targeting my actions in that into Wisconsin, which I am not. I am taking something that is from Wisconsin broadcast to the internet. I'm grabbing it from the internet. I, I honestly have no idea where the feed from, uh, you know, Fox six Milwaukee is actually coming from. I mean, they could be broadcasting that from anywhere on earth. They could centralize at Fox's headquarters for all I know. I have no idea, uh, but it, it doesn't really matter. I'm not putting anything into Wisconsin. I'm not targeting Wisconsin with my actions. So I'm not under this judge's jurisdiction. I'm not under the jurisdiction of his order. And, uh, and first of all, I don't think he's under any illusions that anyone else is. He's talking to the people there in the room. Um, that's, that's how court orders work. If there's a federal judge, they may, they may think they could do that. And, and it would be actually against the federal rules, uh, which is why I didn't attempt to in any way to broadcast Ghislaine Maxwell's trial is because it's, it's against the federal rules and I have a bar license. So, um, you know, that's a different story. Provolone Loaf says, Kurt is best lawyer. Is the defense attorney, a black Israelite. He's wearing a kippah. I don't think he's wearing a kippah. Is he? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, snake on a stake says, Hey Nick, how does one petition the court about media access? And when do we get Ricada media cameras in every court in the U S I volunteer as tribute to run the media coverage wing of your inner empire. Well, you get an attorney in the state to file a petition for media access and the same as any other media organization would do so. And then you, you hire a cameraman to be there and to, to record it. Um, you know, I, I don't know that my organization is sufficiently large for that yet. Uh, but maybe it should be, that'd be great. Jim says judge doesn't give AF. Charlie Eckert says Edgecomb was on a quest for lawyer. He was looking for one who looks like Ray Don Chong back in the day. Mr. Fission says detective can tell. Can you tell by the wear of the Jeep? If the owner tucked himself to the left or the right gross questionable says his wife could have been getting their only cell phone out to make the phone call to her police officer friend is my guess that's possible we'll have to see i mean they're they're gonna ask her why she went to that body like what she did well my husband was shot that's why i went there did you did you touch this body did you examine him what'd you do that's that'll be an out. interesting cross i mean they were pretty yeah. forceful about her and open you know oh she didn't even this man she purportedly loved for 25 years and didn't even try to help him save his life. They're going to do that on cross that, that might not come on, you know, come across. Very yeah. Well. They're, they're basically blaming the wife that her husband is dead. I mean, that, that is a very, very bold strategy or failure to provide care is a superseding cause as uh, yeah. <laughs> Earl Graham said. good luck. Good luck on that one. That's going to be a, that's going to be a hard sell to any jury. Um, let's see. What do we got? I, I had some buzzing. I'm making sure I don't have any imminent notifications. Uh, Fisk, the Lombax is my guess is Edgecomb never mentioned a knife when first talking with attorneys. They found out later he had one in his pocket and are now spinning it. 
Oh yeah. Well, the maybe the the caveat to that is he was missing for six months. It's very possible that very quickly upon apprehension and this guy getting attorneys, they're getting disclosures about what was found. I mean, this, this scene, a lot of times when you've, you've got someone being arrested right after an event, it takes the investigators a little bit of time to get everything together. A couple days, something like this, this stuff has been processed. Uh, after six months, I mean, this stuff was processed almost immediately. They've got it sitting in a, in a bag waiting for some sort of thing to happen. Um, and so once they get the guy, they've already got it. It's very possible that, uh, immediately upon talking to his attorneys that they've got discovery coming in and that they're aware of the knife right away. But yeah, I, I do think that you're, you're probably correct. Danny S says the lawyer chased Edgecombe and tried to attack him. The lawyer provoked the incident by hitting Edgecombe with his car. How the F is this not justified? There's no evidence in the record right now that the, uh, that the lawyer, that his wife hit Edgecombe with his car. The only thing we have right now is a statement on opening from the defense that this happened. It's not on camera. There's no witnesses that they've mentioned would testify to this. The defense has just created this this statement. They they said that this happened. This last witness didn't testify to it, right? They tried and to get him following to. them. Yeah, they said did did they hit did they you know did they come to contact? Uh, no. First time I saw him was when he rolled up next to him. That's it. So uh, that and the fact that somebody was engaged in threatening conduct, and I would certainly characterize that pursuit with the car to the curb as very aggressive, very threatening. It would it would it would frighten me. It would make me believe I was under eminent threat of harm by that car. But that doesn't mean you have license to use force forever after that point. Uh, when the shot was actually fired, the car was no longer a threat. Right. He he got away from the threat of the car. He, he went to a place where a car could not travel. And uh, had he continued down the stairs, you know, he, he may have avoided the altercation entirely. Maybe not. You know, who knows? It's we, we can only speculate as to what would have happened if something had gone any differently. Um, but, uh, but again, just, and just because someone is attacking you doesn't mean they're attacking you with deadly force. That's another really important point here because, and I, I know people may not understand why I'm hammering on this. If you are out there getting attacked and you think that any attack against you merits a deadly force uh, deadly force thing because, because you watched me and said, Oh, well, uh, you know, on Nick's channel, I found out that if, if you, if someone attacks you, you can use deadly force against them. You're going to go to prison. Um, don't do that. Like you have to be in reasonable fear of imminent death or serious bodily injury. It has to be objective. So anybody would be in fear of it based on the totality of circumstances. And it has to be subjective. You have to actually be in fear at that point. If you're not, because someone's just punching you in the stomach or the face or something like that, they're just slugging you, right? Are, are, by, the same, by the same argument, when he rolls up with the bike and he punches into the car, are we to determine that they could have pulled a gun and shot him? In the I mean, face. It's a, punch, right? it's a punch to the face. Probably not. So I don't want people to, to go out there thinking that that's going to be okay. You may think that that's how it should be, and that's a different discussion. It's not how it is. And, and that's the important part. Yeah. Uh, you I'm, don't want to be the guy setting that case law. Have a means of non-deadly force self-defense, folks. I mean, I, I carry a gun every day. I have my entire adult life. I also carry pepper spray. So if it's a non-deadly force threat, I have non-deadly means to defend myself within the bounds of the law. I don't feel compelled to go beyond the bounds of proportionality and go to my gun. Uh, let's see. Saj 1913 says he was on felony bail with a gun. Isn't that different than unlicensed possession? I mean, he's, he's someone who's unlawfully in possession of a firearm that whatever, whatever that means. Um, that does not foreclose your ability to defend yourself. If you, if you have a valid self-defense claim, I mean, uh, that that's what happened to the one guy, right? He, he had self-defense claim. Um, the cops busted in and, and shot, him and his girlfriend or whatever, or shot at him, killed his girlfriend. I believe he shot the cops. 
uh, or shot at the cops. He had a valid self-defense claim. However, he was unlawfully in possession of the firearm and uh, committed a felony or something like that. And so he still got life in prison. Right. Or so something. imagine we had clear video evidence in this case that Clearman tried to stab Edgecombe with the knife. The knife was in his hand. The blade was out. He was trying to stab Edgecombe with that knife. And at that moment, Edgecombe pulled his pistol, shot Clearman in the face. That would be a lawful act of self-defense by Edgecombe, but he might still be on the hook for the weapons violation. Two separate right. things. And a, a weapons violation that results in death can also carry a very severe sentence, even if you're not guilty of the murder. It's kind of weird. That, they <laughs> might try to make a felony argument out of it. I mean, they sometimes do that with weapon felonies. I mean, not any felony is good for a felony murder charge, but you know, they'll argue that, well, you know, guns are dangerous. You have guns to be dangerous, to be able to inflict deadly force. It's predictable that that could be the outcome of unlawfully carrying that gun. It's a murder that occurred in the course of a felony, assuming the gun possession would be a felony, and that might be enough for felony murder. Right. Uh, 200 Watt Studio says, can I just say, Kurt incited me to violence in video 19, 20, and 23. Thanks for the 72-hour hold, Kurt. <laughs> Skeleton says, hi, Nick. Just finished up your last stream to see you're streaming now. Law and crime, more like nickel and dime. Content of theirs is a dime a dozen. Synapse says, caw and wine. I love the puns. Doug Murray. Uh, oh, Andrew, I, I don't know if you saw this. They were very upset in their letter um, to me. They complained that some of some of my subscribers allegedly, I don't know how they know that they're my subscribers specifically, but they said some of them allegedly called them retarded and mentally handicapped. <laughs> well, it wasn't it wasn't me. I mean, I may have been thinking that, but I didn't say or write that. <laughs> So they put those words in the letter? Yeah, they put them in oh the letter. Oh my god. Never do that, guys. Never tell never tell somebody what offended you uh <laughs> in a legal document. That's, that's my legal advice to you. Uh, again, one of my favorite stories from the initial lawsuit that I covered, Maddox versus Dick Masterson. There's a time Maddox is asking a judge to prevent the entire internet, anyone on the internet from saying his name. And so he compiled a 60 page document of insults that were said to him. And, and, and by the way, that was a choice selection of insults. So he went and found the things that bothered him the most and put them in a legal document and then filed them into court. So he just told everybody who was making fun of him what got under his skin the most. Don't do that. Strong recommend against it. That's that was amazing. <laughs> um. Let's see. Doug Murray says, Nick, I think YouTube might be suppressing your numbers. It's currently showing only 703 watching. Just got a, just a heads up. Great show today. Keep it up. Well, I, I started the stream uh, without any announcement or pre-show or anything like that because it was supposed to start about an hour and a half later. Um, but my my morning obligations got changed. So uh, I, I put the show together really quickly uh, once that happened. And, and so it just took people a little bit to get in. I mean, Becky I would Hansen never use such a derogatory language about law and crime, but I do sometimes wonder when I'm watching their streams if the video is sped up a little bit or if it's retarded. <laughs> Becky Hansen says, hey, Nick, did you get my email about my mother-in-law and Albert Lee? Uh, yes, Becky, I believe I did see it. I haven't, I have not read it yet. Uh, humble apologies. I'll try and get to that today. Maybe says, why are defendants allowed to be doxxed? Do you agree with the mandate that all kids have to go to school? Um, no, I do not agree with the mandate that all kids have to go to school. Uh, I don't agree with principally. I, I basically don't agree with any mandates, even ones that are beneficial. I'm not saying school is beneficial, but I'm saying I don't agree with mandates in as a rule. Um, and, and as an example, people say, well, what about seatbelts and helmets? If you're in my car, I'm not driving until your seatbelt is buckled. That's just, that's how it's going to be. That's how I am. But I don't agree that the government should mandate that. I, I do not even though I think it's the most appropriate action uh, and, and I won't drive people around without a seatbelt on. Um, I, I don't think it's the government's place to do that. So, uh, but as far as um, why are the defendants allowed to be doxxed? Uh, we're looking at this in the wrong way. The idea of transparent courts is to protect the defendant from the state. 
It's the idea that the public has the ability to review what the state is doing to the citizenry and complain, change, riot, whatever, if you find injustice. And you've got to remember the context of where our system is is coming from. We're coming from England, which had a secret court. That was the king's secret court where you could be charged, accused, convicted without representation or even anyone's knowledge that you were charged, accused and convicted. That's why we have things like habeas corpus hearings where we say that the government is unjustly holding someone. They're entitled to a hearing to be let go, to at least be let go and offered freedom, uh, counsel, all of these things. This is supposed to all happen in public and it's for our protection. It's been perverted lately to say, oh, well, you know, an employer might look at a criminal charge and then and then do whatever to the person. And that is a shame that our society is going that way. That is that is us making bad decisions based on what's going on. But we're supposed to go. We're supposed to distrust the state. But so many people trust the state now that it's uh, that it's embarrassing. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Wooey Wooey says, talking copyrights, what if I translate voiceover a foreign language snippet of a podcast slash vlog? Does that qualify as transferring it enough? I don't think that a mere translation is going to be transformative um, because you're, you're not actually transforming the nature of the work. You're just changing the language. And that would be a derivative work probably that the copyright holder would have the right to you to do an exploit on their own. They could get someone to translate it and it'd still be their work. So I, I don't think a mere translation is going to happen or going to be sufficient. Someone asked the same thing about um, like sign language, doing a sign language thing. I think it might be a little bit closer, but I still don't think so. Unless the sign language was highly performative uh, in some way. I don't, I don't think you're getting there. So but that's a good question. But I, I am not an IP expert. I could be wrong on that. That's just my gut feeling on that one. Jonathan Bradley says, petition to collectively push the internet to rename the Streisand effect, the Murphy effect. <laughs> why, why, why would you say that? I don't, uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't know at all why you would suggest that that's a thing. <laughs> Tekadan says, I know it's an hour later, but I'm still confused on the video. Is this trial about a car shooting another car? That's all I could see on the video. <laughs> yes. Yes. The Wisconsin and their, their car crimes is very, very dangerous. No, uh, again, the, the video, it's just the best, the best and only video evidence that they have of the incident. It is very, very grainy It is very, very uh, far away from the video source and you cannot make out much of what happens. But that's most killings, right? Well, I mean, okay. most don't have any video. So right, that's the that's, cops go up. There's a body, and nobody knows nothing. And that's, yeah, that's the uh, that's the 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 nom de plume or whatever. Is that the word? Whatever. Uh, that's, that's that's how it normally goes. Now we're gonna see a shift in that. We're we're getting more video of more things because everybody's got a video on their pocket, a uh, camera in their pocket that's relatively high quality now. And their home and, and their business and on you know street poles like here. Yeah, and they're they're getting better and better with the uh, surveillance cameras as well. You know, they're these things are in 1080. They have night vision, uh, all of that stuff. So oh, that's crazy. gonna even some of the action cameras now. I see. Uh, you know, in the motorcycle community, we use them, but they, they take like 360 video continuously. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, that's going to become more and more common. And you, it's, it's funny because it's been, a lot of this stuff has been in other countries for a while because of insurance fraud, but like over in Russia, you get all these crazy dash cam videos because what they would do is they'd have someone walk up and, you know, bump your car on purpose and then fall over and act like you killed them. Um, and so people started installing dash cams to prove they were lying. Uh, and, and so because of that, you know, they caught a lot more stuff that happens on video like that, that con the big, uh, meteorite that, that came down, uh, several years ago, that was because there was a bunch of Russians dash cams that happened to see it. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, we're, we're going to see more and more videos of, of criminal acts coming through. 
And that's hey, can probably. I, can I address one question here real quick? I see someone's of asking course. if I'm going to have another one of my advanced classes like I, I just had. Uh, folks, normally we only do those every year or two. So uh, we did get a pretty good response to this one. Maybe we'll do one in the fall, but that would be the soonest we would do another one. There, there, there are a ton of work on our part, on my part. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna you you're gonna have to kick it up. You're gonna have to step up, Andrew. I'm gonna need you to do two of those a year, maybe three, maybe seven, mm. maybe one a week, maybe one a week. Uh, let's see, d -d 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 -d. Lee but, Nichols. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say. I mean, for folks who missed it, we we do have the course online streamed. I mean, not that exact course, but the content of the course as an online stream course that we provide, we have the written house bundle. We would, I guess we haven't taken it down yet, apparently, but um, to get the course at half the normal price. You can get that at law of self slash bundle. Uh, Lee Nicholas says, look at Jack's wife's boyfriend standing behind the witness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> that, uh, that cop was massive. Uh, that was a big dude. Uh, it's funny. You see the spectrum of police officers and you'll, you'll get like the Kim Potters and then you'll get the guys who are like, you know, kind of average size guys. And then you'll have like the towering monsters who are six, five, six, eight, uh, 260 pounds of muscle. They hit the gym every day. They bench press their squad car when they wake up and like, yeah, it made that guy seem a lot like. You're like, oh my God, what's this guy in custody for? Murder? Uh, rape? Rape then murder? Murder then rape? Like what, what was it? Like, why is he so dangerous? Oh, he just didn't want to testify? <laughs> Seems like overkill. Uh, Instructor Mike says, appealable issue, ineffective assistance of counsel. I, I think in this case, you're going to have a hard, hard time saying they're uh, ineffectively assisting this guy, even if that might practically be the case. But they are active. They're doing things. They've, no, they've right. made. There's nothing like ineffective yeah. assistance here. I mean, it's not how I would do it, especially the the, the shorter gentleman, Anik Ahmad, I guess his name is that that attorney. Well, I don't I don't think much of his performance, but it's certainly adequate for you know legal requirements. Yeah, I mean they they made pretrial motions. They made motions in limine. They argued. Uh, they briefed things. You know they're they're doing it. Tactical decisions. Ineffective assistance of counsel is really, really hard. It's really hard. They have to do basically nothing. Um, one of the interesting ones is uh, Adnan Saeed, right? The uh, uh, the case from the first season of Serial. Did you ever listen to the Serial podcast? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was uh, it was public access or uh, public radio. They or NPR. They did a series called Serial. Uh, it was the most popular podcast in the world when it came out. And it was, it was about this guy, Adnan Saeed, who was convicted of killing his girlfriend or his ex-girlfriend uh, or whatever. And they were looking at the case and they're basically making the case the entire show that he's not guilty, that he's wrongfully convicted. Um, and his attorney had a terminal brain injury that was not disclosed to him. Um, and uh, there was a witness with an alibi, allegedly, saw him at the school library at the time where he's supposed to be killing and dumping, killing the girl and dumping the body uh, alleges that they saw him uh, at the school library and the defense attorney never called that witness to the stand. Just, just didn't do it. And so his argument was ineffective assistance of counsel and the court said, death no penalty case. Uh, no, I think he's life in prison. Yeah. But they said ineffective assistance and or they said no ineffective assistance because that was a tactical choice by the attorney to not call the witness. Right. And it's like, but maybe the, the standard attorney is very, very low. And, and I'm always so skeptical, too, when I hear these arguments after the fact. You know, if you're working for one of these uh, advocacy groups that's whose mission is to get people out of prison who you believe to have been wrongly convicted. You, you make whatever arguments you think will accomplish that mission. And believe me, no one knows better than me that some innocent people are convicted and put in prison. There's no question about it. And they should right. not be there. And it's good that someone is working to get them out. But often in these cases, it's not really a, an adversarial argument anymore. It, it becomes more of a political argument. The evidence is not really put to the test the way it would be in an actual trial. Uh, maybe the appellate courts are are sympathetic to the case for some personal reason or their own political views or whatever the case may be. So 
it, it's, it gets all kind of loosey goosey uh, on those kinds of cases when they're being dealt with after the fact like that. Yeah. Uh, but, but it, I like just laying out in this one that you have this, this, what seems like for the purposes of radio, a bombshell allegation. Uh, and, and they say, no, I mean, she didn't have to call that witness and she didn't, she didn't have to call that witness. And it's very possible that she interviewed that witness and found her to be completely uncredible. Yeah. And it only or, or sounds would have also provided damaging testimony or, or who knows. Right. And it sounds, you know, now 15 years later, like that's a perfectly credible witness who is now like uh, got a job and maybe a family or something like that. But maybe at the time was some sort of, I, I don't know anything about this person. I'm not trying to disparage them, but at the time they could have been a delinquent of some sort. They could have uh, dropped out of school. They could have had, uh, you know, a child out of wedlock, something that they thought that the jury would not, um, think highly of this person. And so they didn't bring them. So those, you know, ineffective assistance is really, really tough. One interesting quirk of ineffective assistance claims on appeal is it's, it, it may be the only, the only appellate cases in the, at least in the criminal context that I'm aware of where the appellate courts actually would hear testimony uh, from someone. Normally the appellate courts, you know, they don't hear witnesses or uh, get direct testimony. They're dealing with transcripts and stuff from the trial. But sometimes in ineffective assistance claims, they'll actually bring the lawyer in to the appellate court to explain what his strategy was, if he had one, uh, right. to make that determination of whether it was simply a professional failure or whether it was a reasoned strategic decision on the part of the attorney. Uh, we've got Idaho Plumber says, Bronca, do you use a camera on your bike? I use a GoPro 9, but the battery only lasts four hours or so. So I've tried many times. I really enjoy the YouTube motorcycle travel things. I try to do it myself. I've never had any luck, mostly because I get home with a whole bunch of video and I have no time <laughs> to actually yeah. you know, carve through 60 hours worth of video. I have, I have external hard drives sitting on my desk for years uh, that I, I just don't have time to do the post-production on. I will say that uh, the batteries for motorcycle user, forget it. You only get about an hour out of them. You actually have to, with the GoPro 9, you have to get the media mod and plug it into an external, uh, you know, they sell these external battery packs like this kind of thing, stick it in the pocket of your jacket and have the camera wired in. It'll run all day like that if you have a big enough, uh, you know, um, card in it, memory card in it. Uh, but that's the only way to do it. Otherwise, you're stopping every 45 minutes or an hour to put another battery in. Uh, Koi540 says, think the unwilling witness had to get arrested as to avoid BLM threats. Possible. Maybe that's, maybe that's the case, but that's not what he testified to, but you know, who knows real motivations in any of this stuff. Uh, J dog 2.0 says sent law and crime a fiver fiver as both a thank you for some of their coverage and a need and to needle them a bit. The word Rakeda is banned in their super chats. Well, yeah, it's banned in their chat entirely. You, again, I'm, I'm still curious what materially false statement I have tweeted, uh, in my frequent tweets to law and crime, which of which I think there's like five now today being the fifth one where I made fun of them a little bit. Logan Orr says I've worked on nuclear reactors and fixed plenty of wind turbines, built more motorcycles than most men could ride. And I've got dug more gold than most could dream of. The only way I've understood the law is through your commentary. F law and crime. Those queers. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Prider Honesty says this five dollars should cover 0.6 seconds of the five hundred dollar per minute stream uh, per minute stream price. You all owe me. <laughs> Karen took the kid. Says when the judge was offered the red pill or the blue pill, he chose the sleeping pill. Based. Uh, Logan Cisco says Edgecomb only has one hope at this point: glass breaking. Jim Ross. But God, it's Mark Richards. <laughs> Your Honor, I'm here to represent Mr. Edgecomb. I have a feeling his counsel's not doing the right job, and I'm here to take over. Come on, names havoc. <laughs> We're here to wreak havoc on the prosecution. But at least he could say the N word, so that would be advantageous. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't need the N word pass. I was born with it. Uh, stuff and things says state has to prove he wasn't in fear of great harm. And I don't think they've done that being followed by a car and pursued. He may not have felt he could get away. We err on the side of the citizen PS immigration attorney, but that's uh, not what was happening when he fired the shot. That's the key that people need to remember. If the car was coming at him and he was standing at the curb, 
that might be a reasonable perception of the card presenting as a deadly force threat to him. But that was not happening when he fired the shot. The fact that there was a threat some period of time earlier does not mean you're still privileged to use deadly defensive force in the moment. And uh, the the jury may agree with you. That, that'll be the thing. You know, it's, uh, it's always interesting to see how people perceive things. So I, I appreciate the input because uh, it's... I know how I perceive the case to me right now. The guy looks like, uh, looks like he's guilty of murder because I don't, I don't really buy the knife story. Um, but, uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm willing to be convinced. And, uh, if you're convinced that's, um, that's very cool. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm really curious how the rest of the testimony is going to play out. Um, Chuck stake says, is the defense attorney's last name X? I don't think so. Karen took the kids says, is there a spelling test during the bar exam axing for a friend? Uh, Red Dragon 412 says, why in Sam hell did you apply CPR for a bullet wound to the head? Red versus blue a decade and a half ago. Trashman says, black attorney is the sheriffcy of this trial. Dude is really working for whatever he's being paid. I, I like his style certainly a lot more than the other guys. Well, the other guys' questions are just bad. They're just not well asked questions they're hard to determine what he wants the answer to and uh i i don't like them and that's uh, bad not just because it's difficult for us to follow what he's <laughs> what he's trying to do um but because if when you're an attorney asking questions in court you're you're trying to elicit very specific responses from that witness the responses that you're going to use to build into your closing argument narrative at the end of the trial and if you're asking uh, multi-part, ambiguous, confusing questions. Uh, not only are you confusing everybody, uh, but you don't know what you're going to get out of the witness's mouth or whether or not it might be useful to your ultimate mission of having that compelling closing argument. It's just it's just sloppy lawyering. And uh, we were talking a little bit earlier in the stream about narrative. And the uh, the the one guy, I, I can't remember either of their names, um, the, the Balder attorney, he, uh, he is not the guy who's bad at asking questions. He's partly right. bad at asking questions because he's bad at developing narrative. <clears throat> the other guy at least has a coherent narrative that he's trying to advance. Like he's, right. he's trying to tell the story of what happened that night and how, um, or, or at least get the jury to infer a story about how he's armed potentially with this knife that his client is threatened. He's trying to get there. The other guy just seems very incoherent and, and not, He's not following a narrative, and that's why his questions are all over the place. Yeah, so, so that guy is Anik Ahmad, is the smaller guy. And uh, the guy who did the opening, who's better at the narrative, is... I, I was going to say I'm not making this up, but B. Ivory Lamar. That's right, B. Ivory Lamar, Mr. Lamar. Uh, Paul Farrell says, behind on the stream, did the dead guy have bloody hands, yet the knife had no blood on it? Uh... He had one bloody hand. Oh, right. So I guess the idea is that the knife wouldn't have been in his hand because there would have been blood on the knife, blood in the pocket, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I believe the the idea is that when he got shot, maybe his, his hand went to his head before he actually died or something. Maybe. The, I mean, you know, it could go so many the, different ways. I mean, in yeah. theory, he could have had the knife in his hand, got shot in the face, dropped the knife, put his hand to his face, got blood on his hand, and you wouldn't have blood on the knife. Yeah. Uh, but there's no evidence that he had the knife in his hand and we'll, we'll get confrontation. We'll get more testimony about the condition of the body. When we get to like, uh, some more of the medical examiners and, and stuff like that as we go, I think Nick Eddington, welcome to paralegal status. Very happy to have you. Nick Lemke says, why are they allowed to call the deceased a victim, but they were not allowed to call them that in written house. Is that purely up to the judge? Yes. yes. In the overwhelming majority of courtrooms in the United States, you can call the deceased a victim. Um, this judge addressed it because they tried to get the same ruling. He said, I am not judge Schrader. I disagree with that. He said, this is not, this is not a case of like a, he said, she said sexual assault where victim would be prejudicial. He said here, uh, in this case, this guy is a victim of being shot in the head. That doesn't mean he's the victim of a crime, but he is the victim of of being shot in the head and he is deceased. So we will refer to, you know, you can refer to him as a victim in this courtroom. So he, he did that. And that's going to be the ruling in the overwhelming majority of courts. I happen to agree with Schrader. 
Yeah. But I think that is that is the minority perspective amongst most judges. It is. And, you know, lawyers learn the law mostly from case law, from appellate court decisions. And in the appellate court framework, they almost invariably refer to the the person against whom the force was used as the victim of the use of force. They don't mean it's the victim of a crime, but they mean as the victim of that use of force. And they're always speaking in kind of pronouns, right? They're, they tend not to use people's names because it gets confusing very quickly. So it's defendant, appellant, victim becomes the the standard pronoun for the person against whom the force was used. Of course, at, at, at that level, at the appellate level, everyone involved is really kind of a legal technician. So they're not misled by the term in any right. kind of emotional way. I think I agree with Nick. It's different at a trial level where you're speaking in front of jurors who are, are likely to be misled on an emotional level by an emotionally loaded term like victim. Uh, and I think it's inappropriate to use it in, in self-defense context and at the trial level. But again, that's the minority position. Most most courts would not agree with us. Yep. Uh, Reagan Virostek says, can the defense say that a large man with combative stance approached you at the top of the concrete stairway can provide fear of imminent bodily harm? Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's going to be their argument. Now they're, they're banking on the knife. I mean, they're, they're trying to raise the specter, I think is the best they can do, raise the specter of this knife and try and get the jury to believe that it's possible the guy had the knife out. They're not going to have anyone testify to it except maybe Edgecombe. Uh, but that's what they seem to be going for. But sure, they can. They certainly just want to make his presence, the boxing stance, the squatting up uh, that, that was mentioned before, they want that to be uh, invoking this idea that he's, a, he's a dangerous guy. And they're probably going to, when they get to Mr. Edgecombe, they're probably going to talk about how big this guy was. He's bigger than you, isn't he? I mean, yeah, I, I would, sure. yeah. I would run with that. He's, yep. he's bigger than you. And uh, if they were fighting at the top of the stairs and, and Clearman was trying to hurl him down the stairs, that would be a clear eminent threat of, of deadly force harm, death or serious bodily injury. But if he's just squared up and he's saying, let's punch it out. Well, he's not really trying to push it down the stairs. He's just, basically trying to you know provoke a mutual combat you punched him before now he wants to get his dibs in too yeah and and that that's a hard distinction for for some people i think but in in this case you got to think of it this way remember imminent death or serious bodily harm is hard to is hard to show objectively when the guy goes like this when the guy squares up to get into a fighting stance it's a little less imminent than if a guy is swinging a fist at you or swinging a sack of something at you, right? Like the, it's almost an invitation. I've actually seen plenty of people square up and get into a fighting stance and never a punch is thrown in that situation because people, you know, they, they square off and then they decide I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. They, they exchange things. They call each other bitches and then they walk away. And, and that happens with frequency. In fact, with the, uh, like the Kyle Carrath and Chad Reed situation where the nipple rubbing occurs when two guys will go chest to chest and they'll really get in and no punch will be thrown. I mean, that, that happens with frequency. So if every time someone makes a fighting stance, they're allowed to be shot in the face. Uh, we, that is not the current self-defense law. And that's a big problem for the defense here. And I, I don't know if the state's going to make that case, but how many times have you seen people, you know, square up and never throw a punch? Did he throw a punch? No. Or even throw, throw a punch. punch. Have a fist fight. Nobody dies. I right. mean, I saw somebody comment that you can easily die from a punch. No, you can't actually easily die from a punch. It does happen on extremely rare occasions. Uh, but the courts see a lot of fist fight cases come through. The criminal justice system does anyway. And in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, nobody dies or is maimed as a result of a, what you might call a traditional fist fight. Yep. So it's, uh, you know, that they're, they're going to make their arguments. I mean, both of them are going to do that. They'll do that mostly in close, but they're going to elicit testimony. And, and we saw that here. Did you see him throw a punch? You saw him square up, but did you see him throw a punch? Did he, did he lunge forward? Did he do any of that? No, I didn't see that. You know, he's, he's just got there and, and put his hands up. And then the guy pulled up the gun and shot him. Well, that's that the defense is going to run roughshod or the, the prosecution is going to run roughshod over the defense and close and say, this guy who's right there witnessing the whole thing says he didn't see him advance to throw a punch. He got into a fighting stance. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, but a fighting stance is not deadly force. A fighting, 
If every time someone got in a fighting stance, someone shot him, we'd have a lot of dead people in this world who don't deserve to be dead. They're going to make those kind of arguments. Um, just so everybody knows, the court camera is back, um, but it's it's been back for several minutes. It's just there in anticipation of the judge. And we probably have a, another three or four minutes before they come back. Um, let's folks, see. I see I see people put in the comments questions directed at me. You got to make them super chats, folks, because there's thousands of comments here. We couldn't possibly step through all of them. So we we try to uh, we try to get to what we can. Marcel DeFore says, if me and a random guy square off and agree to a fist fight, punch each other and walk away, we're good. Same scenario, but we both have knives and agree to what can happen. Is this more of a duel? Yes. I mean, if it's deadly force, it's a duel. It's no longer merely mutual combat. Yeah, you you typically, outside of that one weird instance in Chicago, well, <laughs> you cannot consent to uh, deadly force um, being used against you or or using it against another person. So, and that decision uh, was not based on actual law. That was no, that, that was a political in, decision. Right, it was entirely political. Uh, Instructor Mike says, "So is it the case that because we don't see a great percentage of them, that we rule out the possibility of it occurring?" Because then you're telling people that the punch is not going to kill them, but what if it does? Well, if it does, then the courts will reluctantly concede it was deadly force. Of course, that doesn't help the victim, right? Very yeah. much. Uh, the best strategy is be in a position where you don't have to get... I mean, I'm not telling anyone to get punched. I'm telling you to be prepared to defend yourself. And pepper spray might be a useful way to defend against the thrown punch. But if you shoot someone and your excuse is, I was afraid they were going to punch me... That's not going to be a justification for use of deadly defensive force. And if you're, if your justification is, I was afraid they were going to kill me with their bare hands. You have to be able to convince a jury that that's accurate for There's whatever something reason. something about that bare handed attack that a reasonable person would perceive as likely to result in death or serious bodily injury. Yep. So, uh, you know, maybe the guy, maybe the guy is, particularly big maybe he's a professional boxer maybe you're maybe you're you know you're in a fist like conor mcgregor is drunk and he's attacking well probably not conor uh alistair overeem is is or kane velasquez or something some big mma fighter who's 250 pounds and is known for knocking people unconscious with single hits you know that's who you who's attacking you uh they're in a drunken rage they're on some sort of drug uh some reason outside of a fluke like because you can you can die from just about anything from a fluke right and people get punched and they fall and they hit their head on the concrete and they die that way uh you know th that that is an accident that is outside of normal experience um and the person getting charged with that can certainly go to prison for uh, a you know a, a murder uh you know deadly they they used force that ended up with death uh they're not going to get first degree but but certainly that can happen but that that doesn't mean you can shoot someone who's squared up to punch with you. And if you think that you can shoot someone in that situation, you're you're very possibly going to end up in prison on that advice. So we're we're trying to be very clear on that one. What's up, Runkle? Oh, not much. I've been watching. I thought I'd pop in. Uh, yeah, no, I, the fist fight scenario of people getting killed is uh, is a tough one, just because it can happen. But you're you're absolutely right. If you jump to lethal force on that, you're running the risk. But uh, it also provides a good reason not to get into fist fights because sometimes people, the things people die over, you're just like, really? Like, she didn't yeah. even like either of you when you got into a fight over, you know, this girl who doesn't like you. And, you know, people die. It sucks. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, people that, uh, you know, I've, I've made very clear to the history of this channel that I am way too old to get into any sort of fights. Like I don't, I don't have anything to, to prove. Cause you, you, you get into even an argument with someone in, in certain areas these days and, uh, you get stabbed, you get stabbed. Maybe you don't die from it, but I don't want to get stabbed either. Uh, or maybe you do die from it too. I mean, hell with hell with that. Uh, I don't, my, my pride is not worth dying. I got too many people who rely on me. Um, to, to, to die in that way. And, and that's a perspective I certainly came to as I got older. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm not, it's going to take a lot to get me into a fist fight. You're going to have to force me into a fist fight by basically attacking me and me having no way, 
uh, to get a, away from that. I don't have time for that shit. But if you look through the comments, it's amazing how many people want the law to be, if someone goes to punch me, I can shoot them in the face. That's what they want the law to be. And I can imagine a society in which that would be the law. I'm not sure I'd necessarily have a problem with that, but <clears throat> on a moral level, but that is not the law. Not in the U.S. anyway. I don't know what they do in Canada. Certainly wow. not. Uh, here they're much more reluctant on deadly force, although it's not that much worse in in that sense. I think um, you have to, you have a mandated apology as you're killing them though, right? <laughs> for for the deadly force in Canada. I think you have 30 <laughs> days to make the apology. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, Neil W says, seems like this guy may be guilty of manslaughter, but why are they charging him with first degree murder? Um, because he pointed a gun at someone's head and pulled the trigger. That's, that's a conscious decision to cause death. That's then that's the standard for first degree intentional homicide. So the jury can disagree that they get there. And then you have a lesser included of second degree homicide, or, or I, I don't know if Wisconsin has a third degree, um, but you, you can go down the degrees, but he made a conscious decision to kill someone. Um, and that that's the premeditation requirement of first degree murder. That's what makes it the appropriate charge. Yeah. And you may slide as Nick says, slide down the scale. I mean, manslaughter or second degree, however the state uh, labels it uh, could be a lesser included of the first degree uh, murder or after conviction on first degree murder, the defense may be able to prior sentencing request a mitigation from murder to manslaughter based on, adequate provocation, uh, heat, heat of the moment, passion type killing stuff. Um, that's always possible. Uh, white Alakazam says law and crime more like mauled and wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wrestler town says when the law says that one must fear for their life to use deadly force, do they actually mean that one must experience the emotion of fear? What if you are an object objective danger, but not afraid? No, they really mean apprehension of harm. Yeah. It doesn't have to yeah. be the emotional state of being in fear. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a great way to put it. Uh, Kingslayer Damocles says, does it matter? It, the lawyer just hopped out of a multi-ton death machine that just hit him slash attempted to hit him. We don't know that it actually hit him or attempted to hit him. Um, technically speaking, it doesn't matter. Oh, oh, you're saying, uh, when he, when they kind of ran him off the, the road, um, I, I, I don't think that that matters ultimately. Uh, it certainly technically does not matter, but the jury may determine that it does. I, jury, mean, but, I think you could make an argument that it goes to like, I thought this guy was going to try to kill me because they first tried to hit me with a vehicle, but it is going to be looked at more likely as two separate transactions, even if, and I think this is kind of an interesting digression. Like you're, your monkey brain isn't going to be thinking that it's two separate transactions. If somebody pulls a shotgun on you and, you know, takes three shots at you and is a terrible shot, and then the shotgun explodes in their hand and they come after you with just their fists, uh, the court might say, hey, listen, now it's a fist fight. Now it's, but meanwhile, your brain is thinking, I just got shot at, or I just had a car swing at me. You know, so I, U.S. law would typically address that under a doctrine we call imperfect self-defense. So that's when you have a genuine subjective fear of the deadly force harm, you're defending yourself against that, but your subjective, genuine good faith fear is not objectively reasonable. Uh, it's because of your emotional state that you're perceiving that, but a, a hypothetical, reasonable and prudent person in those same circumstances would not have shared that fear. So it's subjectively real, but not objectively reasonable imperfect self-defense and the effect of imperfect self-defense is if you would have been convicted of murder for killing that person it's mitigated down to manslaughter and manslaughter sucks uh but you know i mean you might be out in seven years on manslaughter and murder could be life without possibility of early release so manslaughter sucks unless the alternative would have been a murder conviction instructor mike says but in those examples i mentioned Cain velasquez and uh alistair overeem uh, and i'll let me briefly preface the reason I picked those guys is because they're big. They're big, very muscular, imposing guys, not necessarily their level of skill. Uh, but I, but I, I want to address, he says, you're using known persons with known skills. I mostly meant they're big giant guys. Uh, what about an unknown person with an unknown skill versus a known defender knowing they are not that skilled again, the the question is, are, is an objective person, 
objectively reasonable person in the situation in reasonable fear of imminent death or serious bodily harm. And you can't speculate the death, uh, the deadly force threat. So it can't be, for all I know, they're a Kung Fu expert. For all I know, they have a knife. For all I know, they have a gun. You'd have to arrive at that conclusion by applying your powers of reason to actual evidence in front of you and make a reasonable inference of a weapon. Maybe they're reaching for their waistband. Maybe they're very large. They appear to be strong. Maybe they're adopting a fighting stance that implies some level of expertise. Maybe you know them and you know they're a skilled fighter. I mean, there's lots of ways you could get to that conclu conclusion, but you have to get there through reason. You can't just imagine or speculate that the threat exists. Right. And that's why, you know, if, if you've got like a, a six foot five guy who's 250 pounds and you've got a five foot tall woman, she may be in reasonable fear of serious bodily harm, uh, or, or imminent death because that, that level of size disparity, uh, or even let's say it's a six foot five, 250 pound guy and another six foot tall, 250 pound guy, right? Um, either of those guys are capable of doing a lot of damage with their hands. That, but if you're, if you're looking at an average guy who's like five, what, five, eight, 150, 160 pounds or something like that. And you're, you're going to determine that that guy is, is imminent death and serious bodily harm. I don't know. In this case, I mean, the, the, the deceased person was a big guy. He's tall, he's big, but he's also in his fifties. Uh, he's not moving super fast. Um, do you determine that this guy, and maybe you do, maybe you determine that he's a deadly force threat. Again. I mean, I would certainly make that argument for the defense. I, I mean, whatever right. they do, whatever the weight classes are in, in wrestling or, or um, um, uh, UFC fighting or MMA, I think it's eight pounds or 10 pound weight class differentials. And I'd say, listen, this is six classes different. 60 pounds is six full fighting classes difference. It matters. Right. If it didn't matter, yeah. these professional fighting sports wouldn't put those people in different rings, but they do because it matters. Yeah. And, and, and so that's, that's the key. In this case, the defense certainly wants to argue this position. I'm saying that for me at this point, I'm not fully convinced that this guy is in reasonable fear of imminent death or bodily harm, but we haven't seen the defense's case yet. And there's a whole lot of witnesses to go through. So, uh, and, and I'll say this very importantly at the end of the prosecutor's case in chief in basically any criminal prosecution, you should be thinking guilty. If the prosecution has done their job, you should be at the point of thinking, okay, this, this guy might be guilty. And then the defense's job is to counteract that. And so at the end of the defense's case, if they've done their job correctly, you should be thinking not guilty. And it's somewhere that that'll break down. Uh, maybe the prosecutor didn't do their job initially and you're thinking not guilty. That's what I felt in Rittenhouse. Um, but that's, that's where the apex uh, point of their, their position is. It's at the, the close of the prosecution's case in chief. And so if at the close of the prosecution's case in chief, you're thinking not guilty, well then it should be smooth sailing at that point. And, uh, and that's, that's how the jury has to determine things too. Another thing I like to warn people about when they're the kind of people who like to get into fights is that you don't necessarily know what the other guy is thinking in terms of his uh, reasonable fears, because you might be thinking that you're going up against somebody who's of similar size and weight, and he might know that he's got an aneurysm in his head, and if he takes a shot to the head, he's very well likely to die. Because sometimes you see this situation where one person thinks, oh yeah, we're just you know evenly matched. I'm going to lay a beating on this guy and, you know, per Binger and Krauss, he's got to take a beating. This guy is actually in a genuine fear for his life and just pulls out a knife and stabs the guy 17 times because he's thinking if I get one hit, I could die. Yeah. And, and that's definitely a factor under U.S. law, too. So if you have yeah. some exceptional vulnerability to harm such that it is likely that a single blow to your head, say you're on blood thinners or something like that, or, or an aneurysm, as you say, uh, that that single punch could constitute under those circumstances an imminent threat of reasonably foreseeable death or grave bodily harm for you. It puts you in different circumstances. Yeah. Well, yeah, for, for example, uh, some of you guys may know about the Andy Worski, Florida incident with, uh, with Alex, who is the stay back, 
stay back, aim, aim, aim. It is it was memed and mocked, but you know the Alex was justified in drawing that gun, and uh, it, it was memed on the internet because they drew a gun uh, in Florida. But the the scenario there is that they watch these guys, these like Canadian bodybuilder guys, rip their shirts apart, right? Like the, these big muscular guys who are tearing their shirts off uh, at this bar. They tried to leave. They were walking down. Uh, they were walking down the road. They got to a dead end of the road and noticed they were being followed by this guy, these guys. And if I'm not mistaken, Alex either has, or at the time had some medical condition that makes him particularly vulnerable to, uh, to violence. Like it, it, he, it, I don't know what it is, uh, or whatever, but he could be, he could be catastrophically injured from something that wouldn't be as dangerous to a similarly situated person. Well, he's now in subjective fear and a similarly situated person, uh, with that type of condition would also be in that same reasonable fear. So now he's, he's confronted with someone who's, uh, large, muscular, intimidating, appears to be intoxicated and hostile, and he's particularly vulnerable. Well, yeah, he's going to be justified in pulling that gun out. So, um, you know, these all get very fact specific uh, and, and you have, it's again, what can you convince a jury of? If you're a small guy and the, and the deceased is a big guy, you've got a big advantage going on. Uh, in that courtroom, because the jury looks at you and goes, this is a smaller person, or maybe they, maybe they're a smaller person too. And they go, that's a big person. Well, then it's easy for them to conceive. Uh, but again, look, same size guy rolls up to you and gets in a fighting stance and you shoot him in the head. You're going to be in a lot of trouble uh, on that one. And you need yeah. to be aware of that. <laughs> I'm just uh, thinking, I mean, we don't have it in this case, but if it did turn out that the, uh, that the accused here had that kind of condition, uh, you know, it could it be a change. situation where you're pursuing somebody thinking you're going to lay a beating on them or whatever, and then suddenly you're dead and it's justified. You don't know who you're going after. So it's always risky whenever you decide that, uh, whenever you decide it's it's worth it to go, you know, throw hands at somebody. You're always taking your life in, in your hands. Yep. Uh, and uh, the, the people think that think Alex was not justified in that. Uh, Alex won that court case, by the way, because he was found to be justified uh jason mcconnell said uh, won it pre-trial even if i remember right jason mcconnell says don't fighting stance on runkle he's an he's got an ss211 in his pants i don't know what that an ss211 is i did a um, video with a little uh little short shotgun that would probably be way more controlled in the u.s than it is here in canada uh Instructor Mike says, now bear in mind, I am all for not getting into lethal encounters that are not necessary, but we have to be careful to give absolutes uh, with contextual issues that closes defense, uh, that closes defense opportunities. He says, but when you are saying that is not the law, you are ruling out the fact that juries get it wrong and there are cases overturned on appeal because of those errors. You can do everything right and still be convicted. No, yes, <laughs> we're, we're that that's what we're trying to caution against. We're trying to caution against people thinking uh, that they will they will they're justified in shooting someone who's merely in a fighting stance or throwing a punch because they can get convicted. Uh, they can get convicted um, on that stuff. And then he follows up with, are we arguing speculations versus hypotheticals? Troubling that objectivity is expected under stress for all people. Are either of you combat veterans or former cops actually dealing with real humans doing real things in the field? Uh, no. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not speaking for Andrew. No, I'm not a cop or a combat veteran. I'm saying that in a self-defense situation in court, if you go in and argue that that guy punched me or was going to punch me, so I shot him in the face, you better be able to convince the jury that they would be in similarly thinking that they were going to die from that punch. And just because people do die from punches doesn't mean you will die from a punch or even that it's reasonable to assume that you will die from a punch. Most of the time people die from a hit from a punch to the face. It is a fluke. It is not the expected outcome. Most of the people throwing a punch are not intending to kill someone. Probably every male on that jury at some time in their life was punched and they're not dead. They're on the jury. 
Yeah. And then and, finally from instructor Mike, he says, and this is all hypothetical questions that I'm asking, not defending this guy. No, I, I get you. I get you hundred percent, man. And by I way, appreciate you could, it. You're right. I mean, again, I could imagine a society in which they said, listen, if someone tries to punch you, you're privileged to shoot them dead. Uh, that you have this uh, autonomy in your person. You shouldn't be subject to a punch. You'd be privileged to defend yourself with deadly defensive force. That could be the rule theoretically, but it's not the rule in actuality. And to those of you who believe that you see videos on the internet of people killed by a single punch, so it does happen. No one's contesting that it does happen, but it's so rare. First of all, even if it were actually co common, even if you were factually correct, it doesn't change the fact that the law doesn't say that. Uh, Razor 319 says, I work security at the corporate level. My experience and training, plus the panel's legal opinions, have confirmed what I already know. Drop the ego. Don't F around. Don't find out. De-escalate and defuse. Go home and enjoy life. This is a, that's the best advice there is, honestly. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's and, a reason why getting stabbed or shot or whatever is largely a young person's game. It's because when you get older, you start realizing that maybe you're being a little dumb. And... Uh, Afternoon, the jury's back. It's about 1.30. Uh, who's the state's next witness? And by the way, sometimes being alive in oh, prison is better than being murdered by someone, too. She's still on her way, so I'm going to I mean, call Leighton Prince Examiner Hurley just out of order. Fine. Uh, Instructor Mike says, thank you, Runkle of the Bailey. We're bringing the jury in, please. And then real quick, uh, there's one I missed from earlier that I wanted to grab here. C. McBlob says, they keep bringing up the wife being calm. To me, that sounds like she's in shock. Am I wrong? P.S. Law and crime are a bunch of Jack Murphys. I mean, I think that's going to be the argument for the wife is that she was in shock. Whether you're wrong or not, I have, you know, I have no idea. That's what I thought immediately is she's not she's not weeping uncontrollably. Well, she's in shock of what just happened. And that, that whole calm thing is weird. I mean, I've consulted on cases where a young woman was prosecuted for murder after stabbing a guy in a one night stand who she says attacked her. And uh, the reason she got prosecuted was because the responding officers described her in their reports as unusually calm. They yeah. thought it was weird. And that, in their mind, suggested some kind of premeditation or intentional killing as opposed to something that was compelled in self-defense. Yeah. Got her, uh, got her uh, charges dismissed, by the way. You can't really predict how people are going to respond in stress responses. No. I've seen... You know, you can see video of people who've just been stabbed and their response is just to stare into space. You know, they're not feeling okay that they just got stabbed. They're just reacting weird. It's always weird when you see the dudes in the hospital with like like a bar, like through their mouth or whatever, and they're remarkably calm. Drinking like, coffee yeah. and it's coming out the bottom of their chin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wild. Um, and I, I see some super chats that we'll get to eventually, but the general theme is, uh, what if he was being pushed over the railing of the area where he's on, he would fall different fact the, yeah. the yeah, the problem that we have here is as far as we can tell, he got into a fighting stance, not that he lent, you know, if he lunges forward to push this guy and his backs on the railing. I mean, maybe he's justified in drawing and shooting doesn't appear to be what happened here, but we may get that in testimony. And if we do. That that'll change the Welcome analysis. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I was a little nervous uh, there with the last three. Gentlemen, I'll be right back. Food I'm poisoning hit the downstairs. <laughs> don't don't scare me like that next time. Uh, looks like you all chose wisely and either brought your own lunch or uh, did well in the lunchroom roulette in terms of lunch. So <laughs> we continue. We have a next witness. Uh, who's the state's witness? State calls Layton Prince Examiner Hurley. Stand, sir, and be sworn in. Oh, this is interesting. Benjamin Hurley, B E N J A M I N H U R L E Y. Oh, another bald guy. Holy cow. I am a late print examiner with the Milwaukee Police Department. Is there something in the water that causes hair loss out there? Four years. And in your capacity as a latent print examiner, um, do you have to have any specialized training or experience? We receive training through, like it's a six-month training program with our chief latent print examiner. And then we continue like another year with him watching over our cases. And then within five years, we have to be... You can tell they didn't call him as a, like a hair stylist. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so it's kind of like an. You really should shave that little patch yes. off. I'm not doing him any favors. Uh, as an expert uh, in the field of latent print identification before. I have testified as a latent print examiner, but not as a certified expert. But as a latent print examiner. Correct. How many times? I'd say at least 15 times. Okay. Now, in terms of latent print examination, what's a latent print? Latent print is the impression when you touch something, your fingers leave behind a mark, and that's unique to each person. Your fingerprints are made up of arches, loops, and whorls. You, when you look at your fingers, you have little ridges and furrows, and that's made up of mostly water and, and oils. And when you touch something, it can be left behind, and sometimes it can't be left behind. It just depends on the dryness of your skin and the surface of the area. Um, because I touch something, does that mean my latent prints are going to be able to be identified on that item? Depending on the surface, it possibly could be or could not be. If it's dirty or like the type of surface can affect the impression when it's left behind. Okay. Additionally, even if latent, print, uh, latent prints are found on an item, can you tell from looking at them when they were placed there? You cannot. How long they were there? Nope. Under what circumstances they were there? No. Um, in terms of latent print examination, are you always able to come to a conclusion as to whose latent print somebody left on, a, a, on an item of evidence? Not every time, because the impression could be like impressions on top of impressions. It could be smeared. That would be considered unidentifiable. And sometimes a print is very, it's Forensics pretty guy? much as we call like Latent print. but it might not hit on anybody. Are you, when you're trying to identify a latent print, are you familiar with the term sufficient quantity and quality for identification purposes? Yes, I am. What does that mean? That means that when I'm in examining a latent print, that I'm looking for certain characteristics in that impression, which are called minutia, which each I'm having a hard time getting over the hair. Rid, you have your ridges <laughs> of them where they stop. That's called a ridge ending. Sometimes they bifurcate like a fork. That's called a bifurcation. The core of the fingerprint can be a three different types, a loop, whorl, or an arch. Those are things that I'm looking for. And to have at least enough to say like, yes, that is that person. Now, in terms of this case, sir, did you have an opportunity to look at some latent prints that were recovered from the passenger side of a vehicle by an officer beam? Yes, I did. Okay. How many total lifts of possible latent prints did you look at? There were two lifts and one lift was a relift. So there were three latent prints in that case. What do you mean a relift? Sometimes when someone takes, when a forensic investigator or a police officer, if they're processing that scene, they could. I see your chat, Mike. I'll grab it in just a second. Prints that they see and they could say, ah, I think I could do better. Thank you, by the way. Re apply tape over this same area again and then call it a relift. In this case, there were, was a relift of, of which one? One or two? Number one. Okay. So if we're looking just to, for example, at States Exhibit number 30, and that of course is oh. all right. So just pulling back for a little bit. Can't really see it that well. Our equipment sucks. What are we fingerprinting here? The one on this uh, this piece of I don't know, actually. Yes. yes. Possibly, I think they're going to get to the knife, but... So, pulling it out. Don't think they printed the In knife. In terms of latent hmm. print number one, was that the one that had the relift? Yes, it was. Okay. On either the original lift or the relift, it's the car. were you able to determine who's latent yeah. print? They're looking for edge cone prints on the car door, the passenger I car door. I deemed it insufficient for identification due to smears and there wasn't enough minutia that I could locate out of it. Okay, so... Not Despite a razor, best certainly. Efforts by Officer Beeman and by yourself can't tell us whose latent print was at position number one. Correct. Okay. 
What about the latent print at lift number two? Lift number two, I also came to the same conclusion that it was unidentifiable, that I could not determine who made that impression. Maybe you're bad no, at your I job. Do. You think about that, Correct. scumbag? <laughs> Thank you. No further questions. Cross. We have nothing. Thank you. Fine. Was, you can step down. Thank we brought you. fingerprint guy to say that we didn't get any useful fingerprints. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Well, otherwise uh, the defense would be screaming about how you didn't even fingerprint the door. Yeah. Instructor Mike with a big chat. Thank you so much. He says, you are acting just like a jury, singling out the punch instead of focusing on what follows from it. If I'm carrying a gun and I am punched, they could search me and take my gun and use it against me. Remember Michelle Jeter, Carthage, Texas PD. Sure, they could, but unless that's actually something that you have as a likelihood or you can't just like theorize imaginary situations. If they punch you, they could theoretically drown you in a puddle afterwards. If you're walking through a shopping mall, anybody could theoretically turn around and fire a shot at you. Can you just gun down the people in the shopping mall because they represent a theoretical threat of death to you? No. Otherwise, shopping would get a lot more interesting. Yeah. And again, you you li very likely and maybe very reasonably would make the determination that someone who's punching you should be shot and killed to preserve your Sir, life. You can remain standing. That may there, not right hand, be sworn in, sufficient justification in front of a court. Or maybe. I mean, a or, sustained beating could be the kind of barehanded attack that does give rise to a reasonable risk of death or serious bodily injury. Right. Or say a woman whose ex is anymore. psycho and has been, you know, there's a past history. Another unfortunate haircut. Holy cow. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you. That's the my mom cut my hair haircut. This is something. What's what's below super cuts? <laughs> now, I want to draw your attention to state's exhibit number 84. Kind of put this on the big screen here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Hang on, Mr. Bart, just zoom in a little. You can turn if you need to, but try to get the mic. Okay. Go ahead. There COVID go. cuts. And can you see where <laughs> we are from there? Yeah. All right, let me give you a little bit more light here. It's the quarantine cut. I feel like there's a need for okay. self defense against well, these haircuts. Can you identify the top of your head in this photo? <laughs> yes, I'm right there. You can see Halton. We can see Brady. It's Friar Tuck. Uh, you can take your mask off, sir, if you're okay with it, if that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, do you take recognize this area off. that we're looking at? Yes. And when you back <coughs> in September. Is that hairpiece of a season? or Did you witness an incident that occurred in that area? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. Um, specifically, September 22nd of 2020. Now, this guy knows every food joint in that neighborhood. Uh, bar, Mangles Cafe. You know Casablanca? Mangles yes. Mangles Cafe. You know the Italian place? Yes. Let me get that microphone off. I know you're a little soft spoken, so let's try to get that out for you. <laughs> Some guy said, I don't feel so good, and Mr. Stark, you, quoting this guy's as haircut. Far as where <laughs> was at the time. Um, was that on Brady or was that on Holt? Oh, Van Buren. Is on Van Buren. <laughs> What's he, and what he doing? Where were you cut? in relationship to what we're looking at here at Brady and Holt? Standing outside of Mangos. Standing outside of Mangos. Okay. <laughs> it's going to pull us up to the, the from under his uh, <laughs> North to the south, to the east, or to the west of this intersection? To the south. To the <laughs> Slice south. a pizza so out of his here, pocket. Where this Holton <laughs> becomes Van Buren? Yes. Okay. Now, let me just ask the jury here. Yes. Joy May said, my ex was abusive and has a brown belt in karate. I have a pacemaker. Outside, Family court didn't Swung see him as a danger until he right broke down? in and yes. attacked me. I and would have been convicted had yes. I shot him. Who were you with? Jose, former employee. Um, you both worked there? Yes. Were you friends? Yes. And while you're outside smoking a cigarette, talking to your friend Jose, <laughs> I can't um, believe this guy has unhealthy sure. habits. Me, no. Okay. Uh, does, are you anything brought to your attention yes. by Jose? Yes. What? Uh, look at that car. Okay. 
And which way is he pointing? Uh, north. Okay. So if you guys are south, he's pointing north to what? The intersection of Holton and Brady? Well, yes. Okay. And when you first see the car, where do you see it? Turning north. Okay. So it's turning north and kind of getting into Holton, right? Yes. Okay. And what's this vehicle doing? Driving. And is there anyone else around this vehicle? A bicyclist. A bicyclist. Where is the bicyclist in relationship to the vehicle when you see it? 20 yards in front. Okay. That's his nicotine uh, gum, folks. No smoking in court anymore. Jose says, look at that vehicle. The vehicle is turning, going northbound, and the bicyclist is already going northbound. Yes. Okay. So you, just so we're clear, pick up this incident. Once everything is kind of heading northbound. Yes. All right. Do you see anything that happens kind of in the area of Zanya's Pizza? No. Do you see anything that may have happened further eastbound on Brown no. Street? Okay. So you basically pick it up around the turn. Yes. All right. What's the car do? Swerve towards the bicyclist. Okay. And then what happens? The passenger gets out of the vehicle. What's the bicyclist doing? Stick get, well, gets off the bike. Okay. And what's he doing? Well, I, I feel mean, like this has mom mail to be his aunt. Question. Yeah, it's a horrible question. Let me ask you this. After <laughs> the bicyclist gets off the bike, what does the bicyclist do? Prosecutor's done he that a couple times. There. There. Yeah, I just asked a really and bad question. Where the bicyclist kind of stands there. The passenger from the vehicle, what does he do? Walks towards the bicyclist. Okay. He walks. Well, okay. he had a, yeah, a stride in his walk. It was not a jog or a run. It wasn't a jog. It wasn't a run. You thought it was a walk. Yes. But you said it had a stride in it? So it was like a purposeful walk. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And this passenger... Where is he walking with this purposeful walk? Towards the bicyclist. Okay. What's the bicyclist doing? Oh, I'm standing there. He really didn't move. Okay. And bicyclist doesn't move. Passenger gets out of the vehicle. He's walking with a purpose towards the bicyclist. What happens next? Oh, the bicyclist. Looks like what it appeared pulled out a gun and shot. Could you? I didn't hear the last part. Looks like appeared as a gun and shot. Okay. Did you see a gun in the bicyclist? No. Was, Why did you think that it was a sh gun and a shot? Because of the gesture of the bicycle's hand movement. You said because of the gesture? The gesture of the hand movement. Of the bicycle? Yes. Okay. What do you mean by that? Um, like, show, put show us up. Put his hand up? Yes. Ah. Did you hear a gunshot? I mean, I heard a gunshot, yeah. Okay. But you it was, it see couldn't really see if it was a gunshot. Or... I apologize. One at a time. And I still need the witness to speak up. Go ahead. Okay. So, bicyclist raises his hand in a manner that made you think he had a gun. And I heard a pop. And you hear a pop. Then what happens? Um, the man falls face forward. And when you're saying the man, is that the, the guy? Passenger. Okay. Just wait till I'm done. I know, I know you're nervous, right? Is that a yes? Yes. First time testifying? Yes. Okay. Wait till I'm done with the question, and then, you know, it'll go a lot easier. Okay. Um, so the passenger, you hear a gunshot, he falls face first. Yes. What happens next? Um, I go inside and the man goes. And call, go I go here. inside of Mangoes and call 911. Okay. And was Jose with you? Yes. All right. <laughs> this kind Chad of witness. is so savage on this guy. <laughs> Come on, this guy's a bro. Give him a break. <laughs> you see the comment where every yeah. every one of his responses is Hodor. <laughs> Did you see him raise his hands? 
Not that I remember. Did you see the thing anyone? is, this kind of witness is actually no. really deadly because nobody believes he's making street? anything up. No. no. Yeah. Did you hear or hear any screaming from the car after the passenger got out? No. The bicyclist. Could you see his face? No. So you couldn't tell us what his demeanor was like? No. Just saw him raise his hand at you? Yes. After he shoots and after the passenger falls down the ground, what does the bicyclist do? Um, there's a stairwell over there by the bridge, kind of took off down the stairwell. Do you know either of the people involved in this incident? No. Do you... Were you ever able to identify who the shooter was? No. Police ask, you just couldn't do it, right? Yes. <laughs> Didn't this guy shoot some dude over a mattress? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this guy's got a shirt on. That's true. That's true. <laughs> no, you're right. This guy, it's extremely devastating for the defense because could you believe that this guy's lying about anything? Aww. Like, he, yeah. he seems completely terrified to be there. Uh, he's answering right away. There's no pauses or contemplation. What he's saying. Yes. No, this is what I saw is what happened. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it, it, it'd be interesting to see what they do to him on cross. I mean, he doesn't seem clever enough to come up with a coherent lie. So unless you can just really crush a guy like this on cross, they're yeah. going to just, you know, the jury's just going to be like, yeah. Go. Eldridge blasted says, I missed the days when UFC would disregard weight classes. So you'd get the, the sticks fighting behemoth fatsos. Yeah, those are great, man. Also, Runkle, son of Thorandil, and Bronca the Grey are here to help Ra Regata destroy the one ring and defeat Law and Crime. <laughs> <laughs> the Logolus means kill me. <laughs> I feel like that's never going to die, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> yes. I'm good with Thank it. You. I may actually have to buy a bow just because of that. You need to. Uh, Crusader says, I appreciate the service to the public you offer. How does the panel feel about mutual combat and its use for conflict resolution? This is obviously vague, but I'm compelled by curiosity. I'm I'm for mutual combat, honestly. Like, I, again, I have don't want, I'm not number doing shit. Currently but. in the computer. I think if two guys uh, are slugging it out. First uh, 911 call, which is. What do you do? Labeled 153. Nine three nine five. Starting at one second into recording. Bye. Hell not. Hello, I'm Brian Bearden Brady on the corner. Okay. I'm Brian Bearden Brady on the corner. Pausing in 13 seconds. Do you recognize that person's voice? Yes. Who is that? Myself. Okay. Playing from that portion. Over the bridge towards Fulton. They're on the very first part of the bridge. On Van Buren? 
I'm going to go take a minute to hold down the bridge, so I'm going to be hearing the bridge, so I'll hold down the bridge, so I'll hold down the bridge. Okay, what's your phone number, sir? 414-499-3918. Thank you. Tell me exactly what happened. Um, I was just out back smoking a cigarette. I'm at work, and we seen like the car pull over by a bicycle, and the guy got out of the car, approached the bicycle. The bicycle guy kind of hopped over the railing to go on the other side, and I was going to hear a pop. And you can tell Faith Lord, and it looks like you can shot him in the face. Okay, are you there with him now? No, I'm not. I'm not going nowhere near it. Okay, you're not. Okay, the fire department is up. So you can't tell if he's moving or anything? Uh, I can't tell if he's moving. Okay, that's fine. Just stay at a safe distance. We're on the way. Finish with the police. Please, we'll see you then. 10 4 Can you tell me your name, please? Uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, and where do you work? Uh, my name is Jeffrey. Okay, and I have a callback number of 499-3918. Can you tell me the, the vehicle that the subject pulled up in? What color make and model is it? The vehicle's still there. The vehicle's still there. It is? Okay. My phone, my phone, my phone, I know I'm on my phone for right now. Okay, can you tell me what color it is? It's something like a silver vehicle. Okay, can you tell me if it's two-door or four-door? Okay. Uh, is it a four-door or two-door car? That's just about out of it's a four-door Kia, so I'm telling me. Four-door Kia? Okay, that's good. That's great. Okay, can you tell me what the guy looked like with the gun? Uh, I'm too far away. Okay, could you tell me, could you tell what race he was, or if he had a... Could you tell what race he had? Um, somebody telling me that's the man. Okay, did, so the guy on the bike, was that the victim? No, the guy on the bike was the, the guy that shot. And he was riding his bike and he hopped over the railing of the bridge. And I don't know where you want to go over there right now. Okay, so, so he hopped over the bridge. Did he have a gun? Uh, I didn't breathe over the gun. I mean, I heard a pop and the guy just kind of limped down. But nobody's over the screen or nothing. I don't know what, you know. Okay. Okay, we got the call in for service. Thank you, sir. No, the state would move that portion of state's exhibit number 39 in evidence at this time. Any objection? No objection. Man, Fine. there's we'll see you. the quality of those 911 calls is brutally bad. At one bad. point, you stated, Ugh. you know, you thought it was a real gun, right? Why did you say it that way? Um, because the pop noise wasn't really loud. It was not. So you what heard it. was it? You saw a guy fall down, so you were unsure, really, as to whether or not he had been shot. Is that correct? Yeah, that was just my assumption. Okay. Was that nervous for you? Um, a... Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and just to be very clear, you picked this up as the bicyclist and the, the vehicle are already rounded that corner from Brady, and they're heading north. Yes. Yeah. Didn't see what happened on Brady at any location. No. Theodore Spaghetti says, you mentioned the mutual combat shooting in Chicago, but this isn't the only time. Similar situation happened in my old neighborhood in Cook County. Kids agreed to fight, but one hit a knife and stabbing with each jab. The other kid died, but Kim Fox's office decided it was mutual combat, then self-defense. Only recently did the public pressure build and changes were brought. There's video of it, too. Kid's name was Manny Portis. <clears throat> Wherever you have a Soros prosecutor, you'll get politically motivated prosecutorial and, uh, decisions, not legally yeah, motivated. Each other when the shooting happened. Three, four, five feet, real close. And that would be from person to person, not necessarily an extended arm to yeah. the person, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Kim Fox is a disaster of a prosecutor. And if anybody no further questions, thank you. still unclear on that, Cross. I mean, she's terrible. Oh, wait. What's the lady doing standing up? Oh, I thought she was going to do cross. Oh my Is God, she... he's got to step on that damn thing. It's his, it's his, 
It's his way in life. It's to step on that thing. This is the way. What is victory? Uh, to drive your enemies before you and to step on the rubber strip that makes a squeaky noise to hear the lamentations of their women or whatever. <laughs> I why in the podium just I well I guess I don't always like a podium when mm -hmm. I speak. Uh, I just want to go over a few things that you testified to on direct. The first being you indicated on the nine one one call that you were far away, correct? Yes. You indicated you were two to three hundred feet away. I'm sorry. We moved the mic far. <laughs> Mr. Brown, you indicated that you were two to three hundred feet away. Yes. Correct. So you were, according to the map that the state demonstrated, uh, you would have been across the street, correct? Yes. All right. So you weren't on the corner of Houghton and Brady on the same side of the street where the, in the incident occurred. You were actually across the street, right? Yes. In vehicles would be going back and forth. I like the way he wants the camera to get right? his good side. Yes. Right? Traffic on traffic is going both ways, right? Yes. Vehicles are turning, turning I'll right. Flip there in a moment. This incident is going on, correct? Instagram angles. Mm, not that I remember. Okay. But if a vehicle did go past, it would tend to obstruct your view, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you indicated on direct examination that you did not see the face, like any other facial components of uh, the defendant in this case, correct? Yes. You didn't see his face, but you saw his arm though. Is that what your testimony is? Yes. Okay. Is, was there something obstructing your view of this face? No, it was just too far. So it was too far to see his face, but you could see his arm. Yeah. Isn't your entire defense predicated on a video that's like that a mile away where you can't see you anything about the guy is, except you for did the see pop? a vehicle go around the corner? Is that right? Yes. And that vehicle would have been driven by the clearments as you've come to learn? Um, I'm not, I don't understand the question. Okay. There, there was a vehicle that was behind the bicyclist, correct? Yes. All right. And you've seen that vehicle take a right turn, correct? Yes. Can you describe the manner in which that right, that vehicle took a right turn? It's driving me crazy. It saw. You saw the vehicle, not seen. I feel like it was a normal right turn. Okay. Let's go to um, State Exhibit 34, please. That one That one bothers me. You seen this. Like, stop. Well, on, you know, man. I mean, we, uh, I mean, it bothers me too, but of course, we're, we learn how to speak as kids, right? You don't have much choice about that, really. Yeah, I suppose. And some lawyers I've seen adopt uh, that kind of folksy expression to great effect so there's one lawyer i could think of who gets real folksy when he's in certain courtrooms and drops it when he's in others mm. okay we can go ahead and play like the axe versus ask decide, thing doesn't bother me that much it just makes for funny moments but the the scene one actually bothers right, me right here it's fine now, I have Mr. relatives Parr, who say, I've seen this. It all drives me nuts. I don't really can't see that vehicle there, but... Well, once you, you no, I mean, because it's half the car, so... Okay, stay in mind, it's going once... Okay, let's stop right there. Is this the vehicle that you recall seeing? I don't remember the vehicle being identified. You don't remember 100 the vehicle? 100%, I don't remember the vehicle. So you can't affirm or deny whether this is the vehicle that you saw take the right turn? Yeah, I don't recall. You, does this vehicle appear to be in the middle lane to you? Yes. Okay. And so it's not in the right lane, correct? Correct. You would agree that a normal right turn would not be taken from the middle lane, correct? Correct. Okay. Let's go ahead and play the video, please. Is your family still mad at Hans? All right. Can you please stop? They're so, so focused that vehicle made a right on turn that, from the middle lane, correct? On the traffic stuff. That would not stuff. be a normal right turn, correct? Correct. And it also did not, it's also going... Right now, it looked like it's going in the direction of the bike lane, correct? I mean, to the extent they're trying to argue the car was Stop. aggressive, I, I think that's fine. I mean, I'm not sure where it gets them in the end because the shooting didn't happen then. Yeah. So based off this vehicle, 
the, the, the vehicle is now going into the bike lane, heading directly at the defendant in this case, correct? Correct. Did you, did you report that to 911 when you make that call? I don't recall. Okay, well, we, we just listened to the 911 yeah. call. Did that, that didn't refresh any recollection at all? I mean, was it on there? You're on cross. Um, you said this. So you the said this. The state play. Oh, my God. And the defense is going to ask the state to play the recording for them? Isn't that kind of weird? Well, that's they what have... they've been doing with the video. Yeah. The state's been in control of the video. I mean, the defense says, can you play from this until huh. this? The state's uh -huh. been the one doing it. I guess because they have, maybe because it's the state's evidence laptop. I don't, I don't know. It is weird to me. Yes. Is to answer your question. Seems very strange. Um, yeah. I mean, cross is going to be tough on this guy. Because... 39 for the record. So we're going to listen to his 911 call again to see if he said something that's actually, did you tell the 911 operator this thing? What, what are we trying to get to with that? Like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not clear on what the purpose of this. Court. Oh, this thing. Going over the bridge towards Holton. I think somebody just got shot in the head. Why would the defense want this for everything? This is, so, this is not helpful to them. And they could have just told the guy, listen, if I represent to you that you just said that a few minutes ago, would you disagree with me? Yeah. Can yeah, deliver a pizza to the witness stand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to see someone deliver a pizza to me. I'm starving. I couldn't get Jimmy John's. Oh, that's a tragedy. I had to get Firehouse or whatever it's called. It wasn't as good. And lawyers, if you're going to invite the witness to take off the mask, invite them to take it all the way off. This is <laughs> They've really done this guy a disservice. Was the question okay? So, Mr. <laughs> Nobody remembers. 
The guy's not there to hit stop. <laughs> He's at the other table. Sorry. All right. So, Mr. Pro, I want to ask you again. Did you tell 911 that you seen the vehicle drop, make a regular right turn when you caught them? Yes. You said that on the 911 tape? Well, I, I told them I didn't really see what car it was. That's the car. I didn't see it. I didn't know what the maker model of the car was. Right. So you didn't indicate that they made a regular right turn either, did you? You also didn't inform the police department when interviewed about a vehicle making a regular right turn either, correct? It's not very I didn't really see the so colloquial stated, speech. You can't see the car until it's already in the turn. So I had no clue if the car was in the middle right left lane. So, so from your vantage point, the car halfway through the turn. Okay, so, so it looked appeared to me as a normal turn. They shouldn't. They just should not even okay. question so this guy. I you mean, have problems from your vantage point seeing the vehicle turn in front of you, correct? Yes, because I haven't seen it until it was halfway through the turn. Okay, and you would agree with me that the incident took place almost a block away from that corner, no. correct? No. Okay. No, what would you no, describe no. the distance be? Half you said a you block. Were far away, right? Yes. All right, so the you said it was two to 300 yards, correct? Yeah, the distance from the corner to the incident happened, about 100 feet. I wouldn't say a whole block. Okay. You also told- It's obviously not a block, it's on the video. It looked like Mr. Clearman had, was walking in a, it was a purposeful walk as you described it, correct? Yes. Okay. And did you ever tell the police department that you seen Mr. Clearman, you know, go from a walk to a jog or chasing or anything like that? Not that I recall. Okay. So you don't never recall ever saying that Mr. Clearman chased Mr. Edgecombe? No, not that I recall. Okay. At this time, I want to now bring into evidence uh, state 83. 83, please. Ask him where he gets his haircut so you can avoid that place. <laughs> what is it? Yes. What I get that the car driving aggressively is a point, but everybody sees the car moving aggressively and this turning from the middle of the lane. There's not actually a delineated turn lane on the video that I can see. I mean, it might be one of those kind of implied two lanes, but not really. And I think the state brought it up pretty well. Uh, everybody was turning like this um, at that intersection. So it's, it seems a waste. You don't need it. They aggressively drove towards the bike lane, entered the bike lane, and the guy was forced on the curb. Everybody can see that. Just focus on that instead of stupid turns here. It's a waste um, of time. Do you recall ever uh, informing a police officer that when Mr. Edgecombe entered into, when he, after he gets off, you know, he's, he's going down the sidewalk, correct? And then he turns right into the little small little area, correct? You recall telling the police officer that he was going down he was trying to go down, going down the stairs at that time. He went down the stairs after. No, <clears throat> but did you recall telling the police department that he was trying to go down the stairs before this incident came to be? I don't recall. Okay. He's learned. Just say I don't recall to anything. The guy they've played his nine one one call twice. He doesn't need to testify to what he said. <laughs> Do you remember saying this to the police? No, I don't know. I can barely even hear what you're playing. It's too loud. They got the volume up too high on the 911 call. It's hard to hear. It's too echoey. Yeah. It feels so weird to have the defense and prosecution working on the same laptop there. Like like they're on the same legal team. <laughs> yeah. We're going to start playing at 23 minutes. Sometimes they'll insist that it be the same recording. I mean, it does eliminate the Rittenhouse issue. Right, different yeah, recordings. But that's just the device. You could have the laptop go back and forth between the parties, right? Yeah. yeah. I think the the issue is the dock is there at the prosecutor's table because yeah, it's it's clearly right. docked in to the system. I remember they retrofitted one courthouse with plugs at only the prosecutor's table. That got changed after a bit, but it was like, okay. come on, guys, at least pretend to be impartial. Okay. There he is. Mr. Parker, thank you. Yes. Okay. And he's still got the same mask style. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, to be fair, it's just holding a second chin in place. What's that shirt? Uh, sure? How many times are you going to play this guy's phone number? <laughs> <laughs> you should call him right now. His phone will ring in the courtroom. The judge will take it from him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that, chat. Please do not. I'm going to get that back. So what happened? So what I'm seeing is that people that were in the car. Can you stop the record, please? Can you please stop right there, please? want to go back to 24 minutes, please. And, and pause at 24 minutes. That's, that's good. That's good. Now, Mr. Parr, you just told this jury that you never told an officer that the clearman's was was ever chasing Mr. Ashton. I don't recall. He said he didn't okay. recall. But you recall it now, though, correct? Yes. You could continue on, please. Let me give that back to you. So what, what happened? So from what I am seeing is that people that were in the car mm -hmm. were chasing the man that was on the bike. Okay. Um, where, where did you see it start from? And where were you Actually, that's not what he said. The one on the corner or the one on the back? Oh, okay. So you were sitting in front of Mango? Okay. And one over here, the two interviews over there, because I heard that car was chasing that bike. Can you pause it, please? You're saying the car was chasing the bike? You indicate that your buddy said that this car is chasing that bike, correct? Yeah. So you didn't actually see it yourself, right? Like I said, I'd seen it once it came on the corner. Just the acknowledgement to me. You can say you can take it, please. I pick it up from right here. Okay. You know, and they pull up on the bike to pass and it gets out of the vehicle. Okay. And it goes towards the guy, like confronting them for something or whatever. Can you stop it? Can you stop it, please? Now, you just indicated that the guy got out the bike and he confronted the defendant, correct? I said they came out of the vehicle and it seemed like they were. Yeah, you said the guy got off the bike and confronted the Mr. Parr, did you indicate that the clear Mr. Jason Clearman got out the vehicle and confronted the defendant? Yes or no? Did I did I hear it? Did no. you say that? Did I say that he confronted him? I said that. You see the other side of it. Okay. Can we go back home? Why are you asking him to confirm what I you're playing? That's what it indicates on the video. <laughs> Can we go back about five seconds again? I like, so I look, the car sees the bike, so I probably picked it up from right here. Okay. You know, and they pull up on the bike to pass and it gets out of the vehicle. Okay. And it goes towards the guy, like confronted him for something or whatever, then uh, the guy on the bike was going down the like, way towards the steps. Stop it, please. Stop it. At that point, you just indicated on the video that the defendant was going down, trying to go down the stairs, correct? So you're going towards yeah. the stairs. And that's not what you just told the members of the jury, was it? No. You told the members, members of the jury that he was just standing there, didn't you? Yes. And that's not consistent with what you just said on this video, is it? Is that a yes or a no? no? Can you go back? No, I don't get the yelling right. here. They're not going to think he's lying. They're just going to think he's dumb. And that still doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah, this is not this is not a solid impeachment. This is not. I mean, what what's the lie? No one thinks okay. this guy's trying You're to railroad you. From Mango, you saw the, the yeah. bike was going eastbound on Brady, um, and the car followed him. Yeah, no, the, the bike was going westbound. So they were going I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, the bike was going. They made a right turn. Right. Now you said the bike stopped at that little going down ramp. Well, the car kind of got out. The car kind of like beat him there. Yeah, that was just beat him. They kind of got there at the same time. The guy got off the bike, like you know, the guy came out of the car. They kind of like confronted each other. Okay. So whatever it may be. All right. And they confronted each other. On the bike, literally shot one time. He must have ran down the stairs. He stopped it right there. You said he must have ran down the stairs, correct? Yeah. All right. With his bicycle. 
So, Mr. Mr. Parr, obviously, you know, we're trying to get the correct version of your testimony today. Now, you said that Mr. Clearman confronted Mr. Edcombe, correct? That was, I did say that. Is that true? It was my assumption because of the situation that happened. So did you see that or did you not see that? See what? Did you see Mr. Clearman confront Mr. Edcombe? That's what it appeared to. Appeared based off of what? Is that so, of the way somebody's walking towards somebody? So you see Mr. Clearman walking toward me. Stop interrupting him. And this is getting very close to badgering a lay witness. Yes. So let's stop that. That's how I feel, Your Honor. Right. That's how I feel, Your That's Honor. That's how I feel. So counsel, stop badgering a lay witness who saw some of this incident. Just ask questions and give him a chance to answer. You can go ahead, Mr. Parr. It was the good question. Ask him a question. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Parr, you indicated that Mr. Clearman was walking toward Mr. Edgecombe, correct? Yes. Did you ever see Mr. Clearman chase Mr. Edgecombe while he was on the sidewalk? As in the car or out of the vehicle? On the sidewalk. Did you see Mr. Clearman chase Mr. Edgecombe? And Clearman is... I'm, I get the two names mixed up between the two people. Okay, Mr. So if you could say the bicyclist, that makes it clear for me. Okay. I apologize. The defendant right here is Mr. Theodore Edgecombe. Right. He was on a bicycle. Okay. Did you see Mr. Clearman chase Mr. Edgecombe? No. Huh. You only seen Mr. Clearman walk toward Mr. Edgecombe. Is that the testimony? Yeah. Yeah. yeah chased I don't him recall in the car. if he was really walking towards him or not. What I recall is the passenger getting out of the vehicle and walking towards him. As in the one phone call states, it says about jumping over the thing. I can't recall that as well. I just know there's a median there and they were both in the street. So he had to have jumped it to go down Here's the stairs. Here's voice waving. Okay, was this your attention shook. on this incident yeah. from the time that you seen Mr. Clearman get outside? Oh, the he didn't want to be here. What do you mean by that? Were you focused completely on this incident from the time that Mr. Clearman exited the vehicle? Yes. You didn't take your eyes off of it. You you were completely focused in on it, correct? Yes. All right. Um, at this time, I want to go into state. I believe it's 34. I just feel bad for this witness. I want to buy him a sandwich. Uh, I, I'm hearing that the Odyssey stream is down. I don't know why. I can't restart an individual stream when I'm multi-streaming like this. It doesn't... I don't have a way to do that, so uh, apologies. Uh, while, while the state is preparing State 34, I'll, I'll ask another question to you, Mr. Parr. At any time, did you see Mr. Clearman lunge into Mr. Edgecombe? Not that I recall. But you do recall Mr. Edgecombe raising his arm to shoot Mr. Clearman. Is that your testimony? Yes. Are they allowed to depose you also don't recall in this Mr. jurisdiction? Do you know? Before trial? Depose him? Mr. I don't know. It was, like I said, it was like more of a fast walk stride. Okay. All right. Okay. State Council, if you wouldn't mind starting the vehicle at this time. I mean, starting the, the video, please. Okay, if you, if you can stop it right here, please. Now, Mr. Parr, I want you to describe the actions that Mr. Clearman is taking at this moment as we get ready to begin the video, okay? All right, you can go for it. Okay, if you can stop it, please. What would you describe that right there, what Mr. Clearman just did? As in, what do you- what, what is his actions? How would you describe his actions at this point? I mean, you're, you're hopping out of the car on somebody. Okay, and what did he do after he hopped out the car? He was walking towards him in the faster stride. Okay, fast stride. Is that the fast stride you were just speaking of? Yes. Okay. That's why, I, Go. that's why I said I felt there was an altercation. Because no one can actually get out of the vehicle like that. So you thought that he got out the vehicle? There was an assumption. So, okay, so you believe he got out of the vehicle aggressively? Well, yes. Guys, guys, gentlemen, one at a time. A question, then an answer. 
Okay, so just for clarification, you believe that Mr. Clearman got outside of his vehicle aggressively? Not majorly aggressively, but yes, there was a stride in the step. That's what I was talking about before. Okay, so that was just what you just described. Now, to state, if you can play the video at this at this moment, I want you to now describe his actions now. I can. Okay, you can stop it, please. Did you see a difference? I mean, this this lawyer is like a batter who's so anxious to hit the ball that he just swings too soon at every pitch. Back up. Yep. Stay. And if we could allow Mr. Parr to come a little closer to the screen, if you can. Mr. Parr, you can step down, but you need to speak up and use your outdoor voice, please. Outdoor voice? (laughs) If we could back it up about 10 seconds, please. Verdicts in on Halderson. <laughs> that guy's guilty as shit. He's done. <laughs> I think sure he's going to find point. that he also go, was go eating, now, the, eating the parents. <laughs> Didn't have a restaurant <laughs> license. Guilty. And if we could stop right there, please. <laughs> Mr. Parr, how would you describe Mr. That, Clearman's that, accident? That's running. That's not what I recall. Okay. Say that again. That's, that's running. That's not what I recall. Okay. <laughs> They're really trying to get him to say one more running. Thing, I'm but sorry, Mr. Parf. I want to I want to show you one more thing. Why you, if you could come down, so that make sure does you not it. appear to agree with the running characterization. If we could go ahead and press play, I want you to concentrate on Mr. Clearman here. Okay, we can stop it there. Did you see Mr. Clearman take a step or a lunge toward Mr. Edgecombe? Uh, can you play it back for me, please? Oh my God, I can't say anything. But it does sometimes look like a lunge. I love how the software's frozen up. (laughs) (laughs) I just love tech issues, by the way. When these kinds of hiccups, they just eat that. Oh, wait, it's the other thing. Come on, cut to the judge's expression. This judge seems to hate everything about this case too, which makes me even happier because I want him miserable. Did I want judges to suffer. Lunge toward Mr. Yes, well, that's not how I recall it. If you could go on the mic and say that so make sure everybody can hear you. Yes, but that's not how I recall it. That's interesting. Now, Mr. Parr, have you met with the state in this case in preparation of trial today? Yes. But of course, his view was not the camera Lunch. view. Have right. you met with the defense in this case at all? No. Okay. No further questions. State. Did the defense invite the him defense over? Ever asked to meet with you? No. So the reason you didn't meet with them was because they never bothered to call you up and say you want to talk. <laughs> yes. All right. Rip. Uh, <laughs> additionally. <laughs> Dumbass. <laughs> oh, that was such a bad line of questioning. If that, <laughs> right. An idiot. <laughs> We called, correct? Yes. And had anyone over at that table said, Mr. Parr, we'd like to interview you about this, would you have talked to them? Yes. Would you have gone and meet them anywhere they wanted to go? Yes. All right. Now, we just showed that video, correct? Yes. So you can get, the best your members, is that right? You can get this guy's testimony now, with a $5 Little Caesars video, pizza. It does that the victim takes a step forward, and then he's dropping right away. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tell definitively whether or not that step is part of him falling or not? No. Can you tell us just based on what you've seen, like whether or not he's being shot before the step, after the step, during the step? No. Honestly, can you tell much from you, just what you were looking at, what was going on? That cut with his head there, thought it was a belly for a second. I was wondering why he got his shirt up. One other thing, when we were listening to the body cam, defense counsel kind of pushed past it a little bit, but on the body cam, you referred to them confronting each other, didn't you? Yes. Well, that's right. Biden inflation uh, made you the price of the they, $5 pizza go up. passenger got out and they confronted each other. Yes. That's what it appeared to you. Yes, okay, that's what it appeared to Okay, now I just want to be very clear. Did you hear any voices? No. Did you hear what they were saying? No. Did you see anything before your friend says, hey, that car appears to be chasing the biker? No. Did you, as we saw in the video, you didn't even see the car chasing, right? No. Um, that was what your friend told you, and that's what 
cause you to, to take a look and turn over and see, unfortunately, what you saw. Correct. So, you know, this prosecutor is kind of loud, too, but it doesn't come across as aggressive to the witness. It comes across as kind of mocking of the defense. No, yeah. no, thank you. Yeah, he's, he's clear spoken. Any additional cross? The defense sounds aggressive. He even sounded, Angry. I mean, he, he sounded personal. aggressive on his. You just, yeah. you just indicated that you don't recall the defense ever reaching out to try to talk to you about your testimony, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes. You work at a car shop, don't you? Yes. All right. Do you recall Ashley Sheldon reaching out to you? Ashley, would you please stand up? Uh, she didn't reach out to me. She just came up to my place of work. She came up to your place of work. And she said she was a Milwaukee Police Department. She, she said, said she, she was the She said she was with the police. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, my God. Sidebar. Oh, shit. You idiot. Did you? <laughs> Did your assistant go and represent that she was a member of the police? Oh, <laughs> boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, this is not... <laughs> the, day, the day could go better for the defense. <laughs> the thing is, I like this witness as a... You know, as a person, he's real simple. He's direct. I, he doesn't like want to this, be here. The but side saddle. Like, is everybody sitting side saddle no, like that? Just like him. That? No, just him. Just him. <laughs> right that is that. a ballsy move. Right. He's, I don't uh, always he's... testify in court, but when I do. <laughs> <laughs> when I do, I'm at a two-thirds angle. <laughs> oh, man. That's going to be. I think the judge is probably saying. Get off this fucking subject, right? What are you even like? Why are you bothering with this? Get off the subject. You already got blown out. Two witnesses a day. Bullshit. <laughs> Does he have a nickname yet? I mean, uh, <laughs> this this no, this defendant uh, Hodor, I think, was the prevailing nickname, uh, on, the, but, on the witness. Yeah, the witness Hodor, I think, is the closest. Uh, I know, I know Halderson, the verdict is in. If you guys haven't figured out that the verdict on Halderson is guilty, you, I don't know what to tell you. Hold on. <laughs> what? Legal mindset, you went mute. You went completely mute. It's like you're... You, Halderson, can't hear you, not buddy. only are they going to send him to it's jail, like they're going to send him to There you go. Disconnect. It's very fidgety, but um, well, the the gold was the passive aggressive uh, Twitter uh, comment from a certain uh, network that uh, Nikita has an intimate relationship with. Which, oh, which uh, which passive did they make a new uh, they comment? Made a about comment, yeah, the, not not specifically, but directed that the judge's order is that we can't show it. Uh, that this is, I'll I'll, uh, I'll send it to you, Nick. What show this? No, the the they can't talk about the verdict weird yeah it's the attorneys have arrived in court remember judge's order is we cannot broadcast until the jury is in the courtroom but our mm. camera is in the courtroom we're able to monitor oh, okay uh, I'm just gonna uh, yeah the halderson this. one i don't think it's their camera but that's uh that's fine <laughs> I'm out. i got it do you send it on twitter or you, i just retweeted you... it it's yeah Maybe I'll I'll take a look. <laughs> Let me see. Not sure it's your camera. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> That's amazing. It says the attorneys have arrived in court. Remember, judge's orders we cannot broadcast until the jury's in the courtroom, but our camera is in the courtroom and we are able to monitor. Hashtag Chandler Halderson. Oh, okay. Good. They're just monitoring with the camera on, which is, I think, what all of their coverage is. Yeah. Uh, I found uh, I found a couple things. Um, some people sent some stuff to me, and and I found a couple other things that may have indicated that. It may have made some misstatements in their cease and desist. Just maybe. But you had a fantastic stream. I really like it. Uh, and oh. I will be doing a further breakdown at uh eight o'clock Eastern Standard. Thank time. you.
Or sorry, I appreciate it. My time. <laughs> All right, let's continue. I'll make if you need a copy of the C and D, let me know. No, Mr. Yes, Parr, you know what? Send it over. Let me get this Twitter to me. It appears that Mr. Clearman and Mr. Edgecombe were confronting each other, correct? Yeah, he got off that so subject back real back quick. Start back Guilty. Back. <laughs> Guilty on all counts yeah. in Holderson. Well, obviously. Okay. Just saying it's official. Thanks for violating the judge's order. Good logic. <laughs> Quite frankly, just watching the video, I'm going to object to this at this point because just watching the video again and again and again, he should be asked about what he saw. I agree. Sustain. Let's, we can play the video, though it's been played now at least 25 times. <laughs> Maybe this witness for another one or two questions, then we're going to move on. Mr. Parr, you indicated that you initially didn't see Mr. Clearman lunge into Mr. Edgecombe, correct? Yes. So the starting point of your recollection would be simply a gunshot going off, correct? That's what it was assumed that that's why he fell. Thank you. No more questions. Whew. Judge is tired State of any defense's questions? shit. Any additional this. questions? I, I'm hating to do this, sir, but the fact... If I understand defense counsel's question correct, he <laughs> tried to make it seem like the first thing you remember is the gunshot going. Is that the first thing you remember? No. Okay. You've described what you remember. The first thing I remember is the car. I don't want to say swerving because it really wasn't a swerve, but it was a slight approach towards the bicycle. So you saw the approach? Yes. And the guy gets out? Yes. And he moves with a purpose? To my knowledge, he takes like two or three steps towards him. And it, it was like a second or two that happened in between. So that's why I said there was a confrontation. That's what it appeared to me as. And then I see the bicyclist's hand raised. And then I see the person that hopped out of the passenger fall, fall down. And then I see the bicyclist run down the stairs. By that time, I'm already inside of my establishment calling police. Thank you. No, no. Very clear. Thank you very much. Is it? Joe at OTB? <laughs> All right, you can step on? down, sir. We, we may be taking a break in a minute, but who's the state's next witness? Jose Perez. So his co-worker. Back in the court here. All right, I'm going to take a short 10-minute break for the jury. See you, Uncle. The jury can follow my bailiffs out. Everybody else can remain seated. 10 minutes. I like this guy's speed. It's very, it's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The judge? Yeah, especially after Mommy Chu, this is like a very nice tempo change. Yeah, and he he's told both counsel a couple times in this case so far, you got like one or two questions and get done. Get done with this. This is, yeah. you know, he doesn't have any uh, qualms about telling the attorneys to move on because they're wasting time. That's good. Yeah, absolutely should. Uh, Quartering says, I'm literally <laughs> recording so a video about your DMCA right now. You'll see this in the video. Lawception. No. Oh, no. <laughs> get, get wrecked, Quartering. Coming for you. Coming for you on Riffer. copyright. <laughs> seriously that guy will just grab any opportunity to leech off of you nick it's disgusting it's disgusting well you know back in the day quartering used to be hanging off my nuts <laughs> <laughs> i doubt it all right we're gonna take a break i want to discuss that sidebar uh-oh i uh -oh. called the immediate sidebar because the testimony that was just Wait. listed by the defense was that their own investigator allegedly told the witness that he was a police officer, which would, first of all, be false. Secondly, be dangerous in terms of the presentation of this case. Who wants to explain that? Beyond that, for the defense, that potentially makes your assistant or investigator a witness. Your side, Mr. Ahmad, just elicited testimony and making it a big deal over who that witness spoke to and didn't speak to. Mr. Lamar said, you didn't come and talk to us, did you? And then when the state followed up on cross, the witness, who's a lay witness, who has no interest in this case whatsoever, said your investigator or your assistant who's sitting at the table right now, a blonde female, came and represented herself as a police officer. Put her on the stand. No, I want to hear from them first. Fair enough, Judge, but... Can I at least because the defense ends up finding out about the accusation about two, three weeks ago from myself. And what, I would which accusation what you're referring to. So if I can just briefly explain what occurs so you understand. 
So here's what happens. When we reach out to Mr. Parr, this is, uh, this is going to be in preparation for the first trial date. We met with all the citizen witnesses that we were planning on calling. And we, we meet with him. And I, I asked him, I said, you know, hey, has anyone reached out to you um, and, you know, to, to talk to you about this case? Uh, because just, you know, wondering if that had happened. Sometimes the press does it. Sometimes defense attorneys do it. I just wonder if anybody had done that. Um, he says, no, a detective talked to me. And I, was, and I asked him, I said, what kind of detective? He goes, a Milwaukee police detective. A woman came over, and he was of the impression because he said that he thought she was wearing some sort of vest and that his that this woman called him on the phone and said, you can come on down to, and his, it, what he was left with the impression was a, the station, or she'll come meet him. And he said, well, then come meet me. And if you come meet me, you know, he's like, why would I go talk to the police if they're willing to come to me? He then says that a, a female who he couldn't remember the information of, he couldn't, uh, we were trying to ask him Dave to find the bailing phone out the defense here. Um, then Hard. comes and uh, talks to him. He says, he goes, I told him the exact same thing I told everybody else. Uh, same thing I'm, you know, telling you guys. And she says, thank you and walks away. Uh, his impression was that this was a detective. The reason I was so nervous about this was, A, I knew of no detective and had not asked a single Milwaukee police detective to go re-interview witnesses. So I was worried that there was potentially another interview out there that we hadn't disclosed to the defense. I checked with my detectives. They knew of nothing. The only blonde detective was, I checked with her. wasn't her. She didn't do it. And then through some uh, belief, we believed it was a defense investigator associated with the defense firm. Um, and sometimes I could see that maybe they refer to themselves as a private detective or investigator, and maybe he was left with that impression. I contacted the defense. I said, hey, just so you know, Mr. Parr was left with the impression that someone that worked for your firm were, uh, was a police department. They told me it wasn't anybody from their firm. They Whoops. said that they had a paralegal who reached out, and that was it. I didn't know anything about actually going to the place. Then when, and so my impression was that they were just trying to reach him, and I didn't think anything of it. The reason I went along with my questioning was defense counsel's question of, well, you met with the, def you met with the state, you didn't meet with the defense, led me to believe that this wasn't someone with their firm. Because... When I talked to defense counsel, when I talked to Mr. Ahmad, honestly, at the end, we thought maybe there was some private firm maybe trying to get some civil lawsuit that might be doing some investigation. He told me it had nothing to do with him. We knew it wasn't the Milwaukee Police Department. And then when defense counsel says, well, you never met with us, that would obviously include someone sitting at their table that they didn't meet with. So I was left in the impression it was someone completely different. I wasn't expecting them to then Not pull out their own paralegal. And then that was unfortunately the answer that we got. So that is the factual basis of how I came aware of it. And I let defense counsel know that whoever talked to him left him with the distinct impression based on how they introduced themselves that he was speaking to a Milwaukee police detective. None of that alleviates my concern. <laughs> <laughs> no one that's not an attorney I love this judge. No one that's not an attorney speaks in this court. <clears throat> Mr. Ma, that does not relieve any of my concern. Everything the state just said Heightens yeah. my concern. Yes. This was discussed. Now this comes in as a surprise. Your paralegal was just potentially made a witness in this case. And as you know, I'm not saying this occurred, but if it did occur, impersonating a police officer is a felony. Okay? This is not a good situation. And I want an explanation right now from the defense. Judge, as I explained in chambers, so attorney Humaner had contacted me a couple weeks ago, we were discussing some witnesses, and then he brought this up regarding Mr. She Parr. better be nervous as At shit because moment, her firm will probably defend her, and that means office, she's guilty. And I heard from <laughs> and we spoke together, um, all three of us. She was, was on speakerphone with the Attorney Huebner, and I told her no. She did reach out to Mr. Parr. I believe she had a brief conversation with him at work. Um, she gave our own business card. We wanted to meet with them to come into our office. I don't think there was any follow-up, but Ms. Sheldon works with me and attorney Nolan, attorney Lynn, who all practice here in Milwaukee. 
We always identify ourselves as a modernist. Yeah. Then the problem is you ask them specifically misleading questions to the witness because you and your co-counsel know, based on just said, that your investigator spoke with that witness, and yet Mr. Lamar led the witness into saying, well, you didn't speak to our firm, did you? Mm -mm. Yes, that's exactly what was said. They're not getting out of this one. Mm -mm. Because Mr. Lamar was trying to imply bias in that witness because he spoke to the state and not your firm. Yep. Exactly what Mr. Lamar asked was, well, you didn't come speak to us. Counsel, that's a problem. We plan on making the Sheldon a witness. We wanted to move but on. The state may want to call her as a witness. No. Yeah. Attorney Huebner. Huebner just wants us to go away. Involved yeah. Attorney Lamar's firm and then our firm. But Mr. Mott, if you know, you're. Oh, team. stop that. He stop believes that that right. Okay, now. That's like the head coach telling me he didn't know that the assistant coach was calling a timeout or vice versa. Doesn't work yep. that way. Taking a break. I don't like this. This, this judge is crazy. That's almost certainly He's what badass. happened. Yeah, that's almost certainly what happened. I mean, the defense just fucked yeah. up. Uh, yeah. But it, but it's not excusable or acceptable. That's what the judge is really saying here. He's making it clear. And and by the way, uh, so that that firm distinction that the lawyer tried to pull right there, when two law firms are working together on a particular case, they're sharing a file, they're sharing information. They're pretty much regarded as a firm under the rules of professional conduct. Yes. Uh, if, even if you have two <laughs> lawyers who are not associated working in the same building, they're considered the same firm unless they're specifically like separated out on issues. So him trying, that's why I was like, don't try that shit. Uh, you, you don't get to weasel your way out by saying, Oh, well, it's we're, we're actually two different firms. No, you're on the same file. You're hired for the same defense. You're one firm for the purposes of professional conduct. And that was a very, very bad look by the defense. <laughs> they looked incompetent. Very. Yeah. Probably because they were incompetent. Yeah, sorry, we had absolutely no idea what people in our office were doing. And that's why we asked these questions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I, asked, I asked the question, and the judge is 100% right. You're trying to elicit bias. And yet you knew that you had reached out to him. So you asked a misleading question that goes to candor before the court. There, there are multiple uh, professional responsibility violations that potentially occurred in the past 10 minutes from that one firm. And here's just a pro tip for everybody. Maybe don't request the judge be recused as a racist right before the <laughs> trial. <laughs> And then expect to get anything less than the treatment they're getting uh, in trial. It's <laughs> it's not it's not going to be the best look. So uh, this this judge has seems to have no uh, no time for bullshittery, which is good. He shouldn't. He shouldn't. The, the 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 one of the reasons I wanted to watch this case is because it has all of the potential to become a circus based on the defense being a, a B. Ivory, Mr. B. Ivory Lamar appears to be an activist mm -hmm. and an activist attorney with a judge in a race related case has it could just explode into nonsense and mayhem at any moment. And uh, and this judge and this doesn't the, want it. And, and this is the, but this is the perfect judge for, for that. Because, yeah, sure. because he's a guy who's not going to take BS. He doesn't take crap. He does. He sees through the games. He calls you on your BS. And that's a, a Judge Schroeder would basically be played around by this sort of thing. This guy is he's he does not screw around. He's not if he spits fire. I expect mm -hmm. that it's not going to be the empty threat Schroeder's gives of like, you know, I'm really pissed at you. I'm really angry. No, I mm -hmm. expect that this guy. I think that he would he would cite ethics violations and that he would potentially outside of the ambit of the jury, you know, potentially sanction them if they. Yeah, he could have sanctioned them right there. He could have done it right there. And he might still. Yeah. Yeah, he, he very well could. I mean, he, he's clearly not satisfied with what happened. Um, yeah, I think the state I mean, the state could call her as a witness for whatever reason. I don't think the state wants to. I think they just want to go ahead and focus on the case and get it knocked out. She's not a fact witness to anything in the case specifically, unless she's going to testify to her impression about what a witness is saying, or if the witness said something inconsistent, but there's nothing to really gain there as far as I could tell. Um, 
So, uh, you know, that's hard to overestimate how bad this is for the defense. I mean, we were talking earlier about how in self-defense cases, the defendant's credibility is everything, right? If you come yeah. across as a liar, your self-defense case is basically in the shitter because if they can't believe what you're saying, why would they ever believe it was self-defense? Well, this judge doesn't believe this defense anymore, right? He yeah. thinks they're either incompetent or just making bullshit up. Um, and that's that's not good for the defense. <clears throat> Yeah, it's not good for the defense at all. And, uh, you know, the 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 only saving grace for them is that the judge didn't berate them in front of the jury. Uh, but she probably, <laughs> he probably didn't do that because otherwise they could theoretically say that you bias yeah. our client that way. And, and yeah. that could cause for like an appeal issue. So uh, Jennifer Genter, what does a sanction look like? Sh sanctions can take all sorts of shapes and sizes, but it could be it could be something from a monetary fine, some sort of monetary fine. It could be mandatory CLE. Uh, it could go all the way up to suspension or disbarment. I don't think you're going to get disbarment in this case uh, no. or anything like anything even close. Um, there would have to be a, a lot to something like that, but I'm just trying to give you the range. It could be something from a nominal fee to a serious fee to um, a fee based on like, what is the state's cost uh, for dealing with this? Like how much did that cost the state? So maybe it's $2,000 or something. And it could be, you know, mandatory CLE training. I mean, and, and by the way, if you want to put a, an attorney through hell, mandate some CLE training that they <laughs> oh, have to kidding. attend on a particular date on a particular subject where they have to rearrange their calendar in person. And, and, and go do it in, in person. person. Oh right. God, they, they <coughs> hate, you hate doing that shit. And of course, so. one of the reasons for the sanctions is not just to hold these lawyers accountable, but to send the message to all the other lawyers, right? Yes. This kind of nonsense is not going to be acceptable. And this is the pain you will feel if you engage in this kind of conduct, whether deliberately or through incompetence. But I do feel that you're absolutely right, Nick, that as the as the defense makes more mistakes, as they're not getting the wins they want from the witnesses, this is going to become more of a show. And I cannot wait for closing because I guarantee you that is going to be spicy on the part of the defense. Yeah, they'll be flailing by the end for sure. I I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how many end bombs they're going to drop. Like, is it going to be one or a thousand? There were, um, there were, I think two in the opening. So they're, they're, they're at Richard's level right now. We'll just see if they, we'll just see if they progress past that. <laughs> just we're gonna blow the doors open. They're gonna be the Fed of N bombs, just endless, endless printer, you know. Yeah, but I'll tell you something. this is why he needed a black attorney to deliver that opening because you know you can't say, look, we can sympathize with the fact that he got outraged by someone using hard R. If you have a white guy up there using hard R in his because then it's basically numbing the audience to a white person saying it. I think that the optics on that makes it better that he's black. I, I think the fact that he stood up there like a preacher and, and being an activist, I think I, I question whether he has the skills as a trial litigator. But no, but as far as, as far I've as seen. the optics, yeah, as far as as far as the optics, you can understand why they would be looking for a black attorney to be representing him. Yeah, and I, I'd be curious how either of these attorneys conduct themselves in a case that doesn't have uh, the the racial charge to it, because maybe they're. But this this particular case, I do not. I would not hire either of these attorneys um, at all, based on what I'm seeing here. And maybe maybe it is the the sort of racial factors that are going into this that they're trying to play that angle for whatever reason. But I am I am not uh, I'm not impressed by what I'm seeing. They need you know, Nate the lawyer. No. What were you saying, Andrew? <laughs> I was saying, you know, we follow these cases. We see good lawyers, right? I mean, yeah. Trophy was a good lawyer. Binger, whatever you think of him as a person, was technically technically a good lawyer uh, from a technical perspective. Uh, he knew how to pull those levers and, and make the arguments, particularly to that particular judge. Brown uh, and Holderson. Steve, Brown and Holderson was great also. Yeah, the prosecutor. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see Oh, yeah, the that. prosecutor in Holderson opening was, was great. I was just, I was sitting there watching it like, like, oh man, this is like an amazing story. Like as a storyteller, he is yeah. fantastic. Like phenomenal yeah. storyteller. It's, it's an hour long with... opening that feels like it's 20 minutes. Well, maybe exactly. I'll go back and watch that. But then yeah, you see cool. lawyers like this defense and they're just, their questions are ambiguous, confusing. They don't seem to be driving the narrative to any particular point or making progress along the way, they seem to get surprised by witnesses responses. Uh, like they, like, like it's their first day doing this. Uh, and they're just they're They just don't come across to my mind as, as proficient as professionals at, at what they're supposed to be doing here. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, 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 I want to follow up. I actually did watch Brown's closing today. You guys should definitely check it out. There was actually a moment there though, 
um, just to alert you, not to divert from this trial, but there was a moment there where he actually implied that the defense counsel were liars. <laughs> and that if you, if the jury, and that Holderson's a liar, and if the jury finds not guilty, they're basically lying on his behalf. And that got actually a valid objection from the defense counsel, where she, they had a sidebar there, and the jury instructed them that, you know, prosecutor didn't mean to say that she's a liar. He was like trying to make sure there was no appealable error here. Prosecutor is not saying that she's a liar. And you're certainly, if you find not guilty, that doesn't mean that you're, that you're a liar. That's no one, no one should take that. That's a, that's a bad move on his part. Was, you can't it say was. He, already, like that. he already had a W in the pocket. He did not yeah. need to go there. Yeah. They could have, they so, could have, his, his, his closing argument could have been like, you just watched it. <laughs> We're done. Like that right. could have been his closing. I mean, they, they didn't, they didn't even raise a defense. It's, I'm, I'm still I, my latest theory on that case. And I'm, we'll never know. So I get to say it. And with impunity, my latest theory was that he informed his counsel that he actually did it. And so what they did was they went through the motions of the trial to look for a technical error upon which the, the state failed to respect his rights or, or, or do some do uh, give him due process and they didn't find it. And so at the end of the day, he was going to prison and, and you know, that's sometimes what you do. Uh, Cause he, if he pled guilty, he was going to get the same sentence life, life forever. So that's uh, yeah, that's, that's my theory on it. And it'll never be tested. So it's perfect. <laughs> well, until he writes his book, how I did it, <laughs> how I, how I killed my parents and how they tasted, how I would have done it. Right. What well, was wasn't that OJ's <laughs> yeah. book? He was going to, if I did it, if, if, if I, I did, did it. it, but then when they, when they, when the family got possession of it, cause they got it through the civil suit, they minimized the words if, and just maximized the words. I did it. Oh, did they? <laughs> In the text, yes, they oh, I didn't know that. How funny. Yeah. Genius. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, yeah, my it's goodness. too bad. This Nicole defense Brown. is so, uh, is so, I mean, it's so much more fun to watch, you know, really skilled attorneys at work. Uh, even if you know they have a losing case, right? If they're making a good fight out of it, that's always, you can always respect well, I, that. I don't, but, I don't know. I enjoy a good dumpster fire, Andrew. I'm just saying. It's no, uh, it's just, I always feel bad for the, I, I always feel like the defense should be world champions, you know, for their client. And I always like feel Nel bad for the like client Nelson when they're Chauvin. Yeah. Like Nelson and Chauvin. He was great. He was great. It's uh, then when the person gets convicted, it's just, you know, well, that's, that's just the way it is. It's, you can't feel bad about it. But when, uh, even when someone's guilty and they get a shitty legal defense, I always feel, I always feel bad. Yeah. About that. Uh, that I was going to say, I, I don't know. I don't think you meant to imply it, but it, it almost implied that this guy didn't have a, a decent case. And I think a competent defense could make a decent case out of this case. I mean, yeah, they have a narrative here, a better, yeah. a better case than than's being made at present. The, the biggest problem with this guy's case is the fleeing. Um, I mean, I, I think that's his, his honestly, his hardest. But there's nothing uh, you can do about that. This. Right. I mean, that's just right. the lawyer stuck with the facts that the client gave him, but there's, yeah. there's facets of that final confrontation where, you know, you could, I mean, he's at the top of a staircase. The other guy weighs him by 60 pounds. There's stuff to work with there. Um, and the, you can deal with the fleeing stand. narrative by saying, yeah. look, you guys know, you got, it's, it's facts of this case. You know, my client is out on bail at the time. You know, he's under, he's got these release conditions and that he's, he's scared that he's going to get uh, tagged in on this other stuff because of him exercising his right to defend himself. Did he make the right decisions? No. Did he flee the state? Obviously he did. Does that mean that he wasn't entitled to defend himself when his life is threatened? We don't ever let people say you just have to die now because that's not the law. Yeah. And that's how you, you handle that. By the way, the, the, appellate courts, the appellate courts really often don't like this uh, consciousness of guilt stuff. I mean, it's, it's old law. It's been around forever, but there's lots of explanations for why someone might have fled, as Nick was just pointing out. It doesn't necessarily mean they fled because they believe they were guilty of committing some criminal offense. And the more that the that. prosecution relies on that as support for a conviction, uh, the more concerned I would be if I were the state that the conviction would be successfully reversed on appeal as an overreach and overemphasis on consciousness of guilt evidence. 
what I'm expecting them to do is they're going to say that ju- he had just been called hard R by this white guy and he felt like he'll never get a fair trial. He'll never get a fair. No one's going to believe him. And that's why he fled. Because he basically felt that even though he, he felt that he did the right thing, he was defending himself, but even defending himself, that he was going to end up go, go spend the rest of life in jail for defending himself because no one would believe him. So, and the, the system is racist. That's what we're, we're going to hear a lot about how the system, you know, the system is racist and it's unfair. And, but, and, and, whether, and whether or not you believe that's true, the question is his mindset, if that genuinely is his mindset, it does give an explanation as to why it is that he fled. And based yeah, we, on what we, I saw from the state on pretrial hearings on this stuff, I don't expect the state to put a lot of emphasis on consciousness of guilt. I expect to, them to mention in passing the fact that they had to go get him six states away six months later, uh, that he lied when he was, you know, uh, being subject to arrest for this. Um, uh, that this, you know, maybe ridicule ridicule this notion he spent six months out of state looking for an attorney in state to represent him. Uh, but I wouldn't expect him to put very much weight on it. That would be prudent to not put too much weight on it. And, and chat, we know it's an alleged N word at this point. No one's testified to it, but we're just talking about how you would make these arguments. And if their, their narrative is that there was uh, a threat with the N word included, then of course you're going to run with that when you're, when you're developing your reasons, why, why this guy mm-hmm. believed, I mean, just, just look at the news. You hear all the time about how, how bad the system is for, for someone like our client, uh, who is, who's stuck in a land of racial injustice, or at least that's the impression that he's left with by everything you see. Uh, who, how could you expect him to think he'd get a fair trial when he had just shot a white man, blah, 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 blah. I mean, if you're going to pound the racial drum, that's you pound the racial drum and you hope that the, uh, you hope that the jury is sympathetic to that sort of, sort of approach. At least one of them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's all you need is the one. Well, we saw that with Deontay, De- Deontay Riles, right. Deontay. Down in Florida. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, the guy who was who was convicted and um and well he was about to be convicted, but uh, one of the three of the jurors ended up disagreeing with the verdict that was rendered, saying no, we actually don't believe that, and and then it later came out that they they just didn't want to convict a young black man to prison, and they they yeah. didn't want to do it. So you you pound the racial drum and you hope you get one of those jurors who will stand up uh, against the rest of the jurors who are all like, but bro, it's clearly guilty, uh, and and that. Sometimes you get it, <laughs> and of course, if, it, if it's a you know if it's a hung jury, the prosecution can retry them, and maybe they will, or maybe they won't. And I mean, it's, you know, it's not a conviction. Anything that's not a conviction is a win. And all I'm going to say is it's Milwaukee, so you know, you guys gave me the the pushback against demographics, but I'm saying I think demographically, one out of twelve, right? That's all you need, one out of twelve, and I think their odds of somebody who's in Milwaukee, that motivated, yeah. You know. Milwaukee has, uh, you know, well, hell, we're talking about uh, in Rittenhouse, the unlawful possession of a firearm by a minor. That law was crafted in response to inner city violence in Milwaukee. I mean, you've got uh, n- not to not to, you know, put too fine a point on it, but that's white legislators legislating against black youths in the cities while yep. still allowing uh, quote unquote white kids in rural areas to carry rifles. I mean, if, if you want to get down to it, that's the, a way to frame that 1992 revision to the law. And that's what they were trying to tamp down on. You got gang violence in Milwaukee, uh, and in, uh, what's uh, in green Bay and places right, like right. that. And Appearances remain the same. That's Before what they're going the jury for. Back in who's the state sex witness. Jose Perez. And anything else from either side on the issue we were discussing before? The no, break. Not no, your honor. Right. Nobody no. wants to talk about it. I'll I don't blame drop them. It. We'll move on. Hopefully, there won't be any other issues. To have a state sex witness. For uh, the sake, sake of your souls. <laughs> we brought in. We'll bring the jury in, please. Just so people know, that's a lot of times how judges handle issues like this. You know, you're gonna you're gonna get one. You're gonna get it. You're gonna get a gimme or a mulligan on one one type of thing. Uh, bef- you know, the judge isn't going to immediately sanction people unless it has to be really, really bad, like really, really bad to get an immediate sanction. But most of the judges want to just get through the trial and get it done. They don't want to belabor these things. So he said he's dropping it and moving on. Hopefully nothing like this happens again. Now it comes the problem with another witness and they start seeing a pattern. Then we could see some issues, but. 
Ricky X says in the Chandler Halderson uh, guilty verdict, jury had lunch and 15 minutes later had a verdict. Oof. One minute, everybody just remain silent, please. Yeah, they barely had time to fill out the, the guilty form. It's like they were yeah. like rushing through and like sign their names on all six forms. Like violating their Fifth Amendment rights as Binger. Yes. Yes. But see, Binger didn't actually get disciplined for that. It was close. I mean, he, mm, he got. I don't think it was close. I think it was shorter. I think he knew shorter. Yeah, that could so. be. In this guy's courtroom, it might have been a lot closer. <laughs> yeah this yeah guy this guy looks be... like he looks very military you know he looks well he looks like a guy who watches too much football <laughs> that's a guy in a long bad marriage <laughs> <laughs> i take enough shit at home i'm not taking any shit in this courtroom <laughs> <laughs> this is my house well the other one's my house but she runs it uh, Dark Strange Nico 17 says, Hi, Nick. Loving your content and knowledge tactics of the law. If I had to take a class of law, I would choose you as my professor for it. I'm currently double majoring in English, creative writing, and Chicano studies. Well, hey. I guess law's in your future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got, a, got a couple English majors here on the panel. Uh, by the way, Chicano Lit was a great class. I hope you read uh, The Magic Bean by John Nichols. Great book. Uh, also, Albuquerque by... Who is that? The The book Albuquerque ends with a guy with like a giant three-foot penis peeing out a fire on uh, on a town. It's great. Phenomenal. All right. And all the women marveling at the massive member dropping the rain onto the city. And I wish I was exaggerating that scene, but it's it's perfect. <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get here. <laughs> uh, yeah, Chicano literature is kind of interesting. It 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 incorporates like mysticism into reality and weaves them together as one thing. It's it's kind of wild. It's kind of wild. Let's see. Sir, if you can stand and be sworn in, please. I do. Uh, Jose Perez. Spell that, please. J O S E. P E R E Z. Go ahead. Sir, I want to draw your attention to September 22nd of 2020. Um, do you remember a, an incident that occurred kind of in the area of Holton and Brady? Yes. And sir, it's okay. You can take your mask on if you feel okay with that. Does right. it feel a little bit more comfortable? Yes. All right. Um, dumb question. Is that in the city and county walk in state of Wisconsin? Yes. All right. Um, where were you that day? I was working at Mango's. Okay. Um, and you work with uh, anybody else there? Uh, yes. Um, who is it? Uh, Jeff. The guy that walked out earlier? Yes. All right. Um, and is there a time when you and Jeff are outside Mango's? Yes. Uh, what were you doing? Uh, we were both outside uh, smoking a cigarette. Okay. Break time? Yeah. All right. And when you are outside smoking a cigarette, is there anything that draws your attention kind of towards the area of Holton and Brady? Yes. What is it? Uh, there was a guy riding a bike, and there was a car following him. Okay. Uh, and when, the, you, when you first see the guy on the bike, where do you see him? Uh, turning on to Holton. Okay. He's turning on to Holton? Yeah. All right. And uh, he is he on Brady Street? He was, yes. And which way was he going on Brady Street? He 
coming up from Brady, going so, to Holton. Okay. So if we're looking here just at States Exhibit number 31, and I, the other one, we're, we'll come. You ask this guy this compass directions. You can hear the Jeopardy music oh, playing oh, in his head. Going <laughs> so he's going west. <laughs> west. Oh, yes. Um, and the bicyclist, when he gets to the area of where Holton is, what do you see him do? I see him going towards like a little opening for some stairs to go down. Okay. And what do you see the vehicle doing? Uh, chasing them, basically. Okay. Chasing him. Yeah. Like, following them. Following them, chasing. What do you mean by that? Can you describe what you're seeing? Guys, they're they're chewing uh, gum because they're smokers. He was trying to like, try, I don't know if he was trying to get away. They were following him. Stopped. Okay. And when you see this, had you seen anything that had occurred earlier on Brady Street? I did not. Did you see anything that occurred possibly even further down the bridge? I did not. Okay, so you kind of pick it up as the bicyclist and the car are going on hold. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, did it appear that the, the the car was trying to stop the bicyclist? It looked like a yes. What do you mean by that? Like they were trying to like cut him off to see if he was going to go anywhere. Okay. They're trying to like stop him from continuing to go. Forward. Yes. 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 That's what you told the police, right? Yes. All right. Um, does anyone get out of this vehicle? Uh, yes, the passenger. And how many people did you see that were in this vehicle? Uh, from my knowledge, two people, the, the driver and the passenger. Did you see anyone else in there? I did not. Okay. When the passenger gets out of the vehicle, uh, did you see anything in his hands? I did not. Did you ever see anything in that, that passenger seat? I did not. Uh, where's the bicyclist at this moment when you see the passenger get out of the vehicle? He is towards, he's actually going into the little entrance to go down the stairs. Okay. So it appears that he's getting ready to go down the stairs. Yeah, yes. And what does the passenger do? Uh, the passenger kind of like paces or walks pretty kind of quick to stop him or stop the, the guy or whatever. Okay. Um, do you remember saying kind of like a little bit of a run? Kind of like, kind of like a quick, a quicker pace kind of, yes. Um, and what happens when the passenger gets up to the area of where the stairs are, where the bicyclist is? Um, from what I seen, all I seen was, was like a hand it looked like, like, like a gun figure kind of way in, and I heard, you heard a pop, and I see the, the, the guy just fall face 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 down. Now, you said guy a few there. We're talking about two different guys. Which guy fell down? Well, the passenger of the, the, the vehicle. Okay. Which, uh, when you say you saw a hand with what appeared to be a gun and you yes. heard a pop, whose hand was that? That was the, the guy that was on the bicycle. Okay. Now... Just so we have, and I make sure I understand this, the individual who gets out of the passenger seat of this vehicle, he runs or quick walk, whatever, towards the bicyclist. What's the bicyclist doing? What, what are you? Yeah, bad question. You stated that the bicyclist was down by the area where the stairs were yes. as though he was getting ready to go down. Yes. And the passenger is kind of moving quickly towards. Him. Right. Is the bicyclist just standing still? Is he is he moving? What's he doing? Standing still, kind of. Okay. And when the okay, when the uh, passenger gets up, does he kind of have to like turn to? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sir, so I I know you're probably a little nervous, right? Remember, just gotta wait till I'm done talking. Okay. Um, now, in terms of he gets up there and, and the, the passenger turns. How shortly after the passenger gets to where the bicyclist is, do you see this arm arrive? A couple seconds. So, what? Passenger gets there and the guy arm just comes up. Yes. 
Did you hear any shouting? No, I did not. Did you hear any yelling? I did not. Did you hear the, did you see that the passenger, did he, did he appear to swing at somebody? I did not. Did he, did he make a forceful move towards the guy? I did not see anything. He gets up there and the arm comes up? Yes. Okay. You hear how many pops? I heard one shot. One and pop. what happens when you hear this one pop? Uh, I seen the passenger of the vehicle fall face down. And then what does the bicyclist do? Uh, he takes off. Which way? Down, down the stairs. Did you know? Did you know who either of these two guys were? I did not. Were you ever able to identify who the shooter was? No. Never got a good enough look at him. And in terms of this firearm that you saw in the bicyclist's hand, uh, can you tell us anything about it? It had to be a handgun, from my knowledge. That's about it? Yes. yes. Okay. Hold on. 11 Bravo Crunchy says, Judge is probably teabagging 12-year-olds on Halo Infinite multiplayer, completely emotionless and straight-faced as if he's been doing that in Halo multiplayer since 2004 on 54K dial-up. <laughs> Were you saying in court he's doing it? No. <laughs> he does stare at that computer monitor a lot. About this. <laughs> when... The passenger kind of runs or moves quickly towards the bicyclist and then kind of goes and stands there. Were no, they this close to each other? This is, this is not the same guy from the Rittenhouse trial. A couple feet no. from each other. Yeah. And how long was it from the moment that you see the passenger kind of standing there and then you see the bicyclist shoot? Five, ten seconds. Do you remember telling the detectives you thought it was one or two seconds? I do not recall. Okay. Best you remember, short period of time. Right. Okay. Did you see the passenger do anything? I did not. Did you see? <laughs> Let me finish the question, please. Anything in his hands? I did not. I know it's 56K. Super Chat said 54K. Roast the Super Chatter, not the reader. I grew up on 14.4. Actually, 9,800. About how far away from this area were you? Um, roughly 200 feet. 100, 150 oh, feet, far. somewhere around there. Do you, remember, do you remember telling the detectives you thought maybe 200, maybe 300 feet? Uh, I do not recall. Okay. That's far. But somewhere in that area. Yeah, somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Sir, um, <clears throat> my first computer was a teletype machine. <laughs> <laughs> I have. How many times? No Three jokes. Thank you. <laughs> maybe you scrubs only had 9600s. I had a 9800. It had a I turbo had boost. It was on the box. 64K. We bought it from a guy under a bridge. <laughs> my Commodore 64 was an upgrade from my teletype machine. <laughs> oh, man, he's got the state bringing the podium for him. Goodness gracious. Wow. Simping. That courtesy. Privilege my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Running the tech for him and everything. Goodness gracious. Mm. I have not had any whiskey today. I know you got to start drinking already. This, I know this is going to go good. So I broke out the soju because I was like, I this saw is you drinking the good. soju and I was like, hmm. It's been a weird day. No one's asked me to do a toast or anything so far. So now, now I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> have you not gotten to the requisite number of likes? No, Mr. Perez. No, we're well past it. 
<clears throat> just haven't been wanna, thinking about uh, it. You testified on direct that uh, Mr. Edgecombe, uh, you know, he was in a, a very small confined area, right? You mentioned that he was being chased on a on a bike, correct? Yes. I mean, he was being he was on a bike being chased, correct? Yes. All right, and he was being chased by what has come to known to be Mr. Jason Clearman, correct? Yes. All right. Now, you used language saying that he was, you know, being followed, but you previously used language saying that he was being chased, correct? Yes. All right. And you indicated before that it appeared that the Clearman's who was driving the vehicle would be, who was known to be identified as Miss Evangelina Clearman, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. And you indicated that the Kia vehicle was trying to stop Mr. Edgecombe, correct? Yes. Did it appear that Mr. Edgecombe wanted to be stopped? Um, don't know. Was, it, was there anything that you seen that would indicate that Mr. Edgecombe wanted to be stopped? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Did it, by Mr. Edgecombe, you know, being, trying to avoid the clearance, did it appear to you that he was afraid? Don't know. Okay. You see Mr. Edgecombe, did you see him take a right turn on the bike? Yes. Did you see a vehicle almost strike Mr. Edgecombe in the bike lane? Yes. At that point, did it appear that Mr. Edgecombe was afraid at that time? Could be. Not, not positive. But it's possible, correct? Yes. And Mr. Edgecombe <coughs> didn't stop at that point, did he? He did not. He kept going, right? Yes. You see Mr. Jason Clearman look to try to get out the vehicle. Yes. All right. And you notice that Mr. Clearman uh, first started walking toward Mr. Edgecombe, correct? A faster pace, yes. And he later ran toward Mr. Edgecombe, correct? Yes. Now, when Mr. Edgecombe took a right turn, he didn't just stand there, did he? He did not. What did Mr. Edgecombe do? Uh, kept riding, kept riding his bike. You said he kept riding his bike? Yeah. Okay, when he turned right into the, the cutoff area, which is shown on the video, when he's on the sidewalk and he turns, you know, he gets off the bike and he goes right. Do you remember that? Yes. All he, right. Yes. What do you remember next? All I seen him was just trying to go down that little stairwell, but he wasn't dry. He wasn't riding the bike. He would have the bike next to him. Okay. And Mr. Edgecombe was trying to go down the stairway, correct? Yes. He was further trying to avoid Mr. Jason Clearman, correct? Yes. He appeared afraid at that moment, correct? Do not know. Okay. But his actions were consistent with a person that would be afraid, right? Yes. We would now like to play with State Exhibit 86 for the record. 83, sorry. Your Honor, for the record, for Defense Counsel, this is Tibnin Body Cam 2. I have it uh, up at five minutes and two seconds in the recording. What's the exhibit number again? Smoking inside. I want a Mango's Cafe right now. I'm just thinking of Mango's in Miami. That's like salsa. Yeah. I 
seen a heavy uh, African American guy on, on a flight. They came kind of around the corner. So, so he told me what well, time ready. Yeah, and turns right on hold. Yeah. And then I see that truck that, that Kia Forte turned to come and stop him or whatever. And where is it coming from? Coming west. Okay. Stop the vehicle. Stop the um, video right there, please. When you say that it was a Kia vehicle that would turn the corner and try to stop Mr. Edgecombe. Were you referring to the vehicle that was driven by Ms. Evangelina Clearman and Mr. Jason Clearman in the passenger seat? Yes. Yeah. So we can continue on the devil. Real quick. All right, great. The best thing we can do, would you stand so we don't contaminate each other? So you don't hear this and I'll talk to you? Okay, you see this Kia Forte also is coming westbound on Brady? Yeah. Uh, I think it's like, like they stopped me here trying to like, confront the guy. The guy came up the Please, please stop me. You used the words that someone tried to confront the guy. I want to know who was the guy that was being confronted that you were referring to? The guy on the bike. Would that mean the defendant, Mr. Theodore Edgecombe? Yes. We can continue at that. Up, up, up the bridge right here, and there's that little cut over there. They finally stopped it, but there's a passenger. No, they're not talking about COVID with the contamination. They're talking about contaminating the witness statements. Well, the guy's not wearing a mask, so he's based. Now, you said that the Kia Forte was confronting Mr. Edgecombe, correct? Yes. And did you indicate... The vehicle stopped at a point and Mr. Jason Clearman exited that vehicle, correct? Yes. Did you see what the Kia Forte did after that? I did not. Okay. Do you do you recall if the vehicle ever moved after Mr. Clearman got out the vehicle? It did not. You said the vehicle did not move? Nope. Okay. Okay, stand by. I'm just trying to get You can't hear if they're like talking to them, but it's okay. And then the passenger, the passenger in the Kia Forte gets out, like runs over there to where uh, the guy was on that bike. Stop near the staircase. Did you just say that the passenger got out of the vehicle and ran over towards the guy that was on the bicycle? I did. Same please. So the driver, the passenger, exits. No, the passenger exit runs towards that staircase right there. Where the guy that's on the flight. No, Maria, you can't run there. Go the other way. Runs towards the staircase. Stop right there for this. You just indicated that the defendant just ran towards the staircase, correct? Yes. But he was trying to further avoid Mr. Jason Clearman at that time, correct? There's no speculation. He knows he ran towards the staircase. I can't hear correct. You know. He knows he was ran towards the staircase. Speculation is what he was going to do. Overruled, he might have refuted or might know. You can answer. <coughs> answer the question. What was that again? Mr. Ed, Mr. Adcombe was running to avoid Mr. Jason Clearman when he was running down the staircase, correct? Don't know. All right. I want to go now. <clears throat> now, we're now, as we're pulling up to State 34, Mr. Perez, now let's just go over what your vantage point again was. Now, you were beside Mr. Parr, correct? You and Mr. Parr were together, right? Yes. So you were at least two to 300 feet, Yes. right? And that, that would be a farther distance than this back wall, correct? Maybe, I'm not sure. Approximately though, correct? Yes. So at that point, you really couldn't see Mr. Clearman's hands at that point, could you? Not really, but I could see a figure. Okay, but you couldn't tell from that vantage point, whether he had something in his hand or not, correct? Uh, I did. 
I'm sorry. I did. You did what? I did see something. You seen something in Mr. Clearman's hand? Clearman? No, no, not Mr. Clearman. No, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. You couldn't see gonna... whether there was you something did? in Mr. Clearman's hand. I did not see anything. So okay. close. You were too, the defense you were could taste it. At least a distance past this wall, correct? Yes. I was about to say that's a game changer, but it ended no, up being a not game changer. That when Mr. Clearman got out of the he vehicle, that the vehicle now. didn't move forward, correct? It did not. Okay. Let's go ahead and play this video. Yeah, I saw a knife in his hand. I mean, a gun in the other guy's hand. Uh, stay <laughs> Is it, can we stop, please? Now, this is the vehicle we're talking about, right? Yes. All right. So, we can go ahead. Now, the vehicle is stopping right here. Please stop, um, counsel. All right. So, the vehicle is stopping here, right? Yes. Mr. Clearman is getting out that vehicle, correct? Yes. All right. Let's see if the vehicle moves forward. Stay if you can play video that vehicle just took off and stopped again correct can we stop the vehicle stop the video please that vehicle just went forward didn't it, it did. and it stopped in the same vicinity of mr edgecombe didn't it it looks like yes no more questions for this witness. oh okay Stay. defense counsel said we were from too far away to see anything in mr in the passenger's hand right yes. oh, this is going to be good but you saw something in Mr. Edgecombe's hand. You see hands. something in the shooter's hands, right? Uh, yes. So you weren't too far that you weren't able to see the gun that ended up shooting this man in the face. Yes. Did you see anything? Good. Good question. Or anything in the passenger's hands? I did not. Okay. And just to be very clear, you stated we talked about this earlier. The passenger got out of the vehicle, appeared to go to confront the individual, right? Yes. What do you mean by confront? Maybe sit, talk to them. I, there's a, other, there's different ways of co uh, confronting people. He could have been wanting to yell at him. <laughs> Overall, he was main all and kind of common knowledge. You can answer. Like the could prosecution's counter argument. Could, could it be yes. It looks like but what was going to happen to you overall? Yes. I, okay. But in terms of what you saw, did you see the passenger make a move, punch, do anything before the bicyclist raised his arm and put around and fired around? I did not. Hmm. I would have spent for the defense more also, time. The defense counsel kept asking questions was, oh, did, uh, was the bicyclist afraid? Do you personally know whether or not he was afraid? I do not. Maybe he was trying to get away from people he was afraid of, right? Could be, yes. Maybe he was trying to get away from people he just committed a crime on, right? Could be, yes. You have no idea, do you? I do not. You didn't see what happened just over here by Zane's, did you? I did not. Would it be fair to say that you saw the vehicle following, chasing this man in what appeared to be a way to confront him. Uh, yes. And that during that confrontation, the only person that did any violence that you saw was the bicyclist. Yes. And that was the gunshot. Yes. Fairness, though, man did get out of the car, right? Yes. He did run towards him. Yes. Didn't look like he was going to confront him, whatever that meant. Right. Uh, yes. Okay. And then he was shot. Yes. Oh, no, no, thank you. Taco the turtle says thanks. Hey, thanks, Taco. He should really spend a lot more time talking about his vantage point. He was afraid or not, correct? Yes. You also don't know the intention to miss. He backed on Lenny Clement when she was driving the vehicle, making that right turn either, do you? Do not. You don't know what her intentions were when she approached Mr. Defendant in the bike lane either, correct? Nope. You don't know Mr. Jason Clement's intentions when he got outside the vehicle, correct? No. You don't know his intentions when he walked purposefully toward Mr. Um, Edgecombe, correct? No. You don't know his intentions when he started running after Mr. Edgecombe, correct? Nope. When he got into a boxer stance, you don't know what Mr. Clement's intentions were at that point either, do you? No. He should have been talking about, you know. 
Did you ever see him get into a boxer stance? I did not say that. You didn't say that? You didn't see it. Maybe, maybe some other witness said that earlier. Did you see the passenger get into a boxer stance? I did not. So huh. when the defense counsel is asking you that question, <clears throat> you didn't see it, did you? I did not. There you go. All right, witness can step down. I would have spent a lot more time fixing on his vantage point whether he could have seen a weapon in Clearman's hands. Like maybe if Clearman's defense. Yeah, if the defense, in other words, maybe you didn't see it because Clearman's back was to you and the, the weapon is in his hand facing away from the witness. So maybe that's why you didn't see it. It's like we don't know what his vantage point was. Well, he got wrecked on that earlier. Oh, did he? Yeah, when he uh, he did a demonstrable where he, he he turned his back to the witness, walked away a little bit, and then he slyly grabbed his sunglasses and kept them in his hand. He said, you can't see what's in my hand, can you? He said, no, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then the the state comes back and is like, but we're looking at the video and you weren't directly behind him, were you? You were off to the side, right? He's got him on the side. He's like, you could see there. You know, it was uh, it, it didn't go well for him mm -hmm. on that. Okay. So I mean, this guy's. This guy's saying he's 200 feet away. That's far. Could he could he see a knife? Probably not. But he could see a gun, so maybe depends on the knife, right? Depends and on a the gun knife, is, is the light. And a well, gun that's... is very distinctive. Well, the gun yeah. was black, and the knife has a silver shiny blade. True, yeah. but you know, a lot of times witnesses think they see things because they hear the gunshot afterwards. They're like, oh, I guess I saw a gun. Because it sort of gets confirmed by the the subsequent events rather than actually seeing the gun. Man, those local restaurants thing. must be world class. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're hitting some triple digit BMI numbers here. Uh, Jennifer Beeman, last name Beers and Boy. So cold. -A. You are <laughs> so cold. Scoot in a little and you can take your mask off. No, can't be cold. Can't she ain't taking her mask off. She's leaving enough. Beeman. <laughs> Last name Bees and Boy E A M O N. Romeo. How are you, boy? I'm a forensic investigator with the Milwaukee Police Department. First of all, how long have you been with the police department? Total of five years. And how long have you been a forensic investigator? Total of a year now. Okay. I want to draw your attention back to September of 2020. Were you working as a forensic investigator back during this incident? Yes. First of all, what is a forensic investigator? Um, basically, we're responsible uh, for uh, processing uh, different scenes, in including homicides or shootings. Um, we'll process vehicles. We'll process photos. We'll take photos, prints, DNA. And you took the photos at the homicide where Jason Clearman was killed. Is that correct? Yes. So all the photos we've taken, that's been what you did? Yes. All right. Um, just to be clear, do, do you use a, a flash to help you take the photos at night? Uh, yes, there's a flash connected to my to the camera. Okay. Um, a, additionally, are you trained in lifting latent prints? Yes. Okay. Um, and in this case, did you lift latent prints from the victim's vehicle? Yes. Where did you lift them from? I believe I um, lifted prints from the passenger's front passenger door of the vehicle. Do you always know how everything spells out in the bigger investigation as to where detectives are asking you to process for prints? Yes. Okay. And in this case, there was reason to believe that someone may have punched or been active on the outside of that passenger side door, right? Yes, usually the detectives kind of tell you um, what part or what, what they want processed. And were you able to lift, as we see here in States Exhibit number 30, um, possible latent prints from two locations on that front passenger side door? Yes. Um, additionally, in terms of lifting these, how do you do that? How do you lift a latent? So there, are, you use a, a specific type of powder. I use volcanic powder and uh, you use a specific type of brush and you kind of brush it um, in a circular motion. Um, 
and then you kind of use some light to see if you are able Ooh. to identify any prints or if you can you know see anything with the naked eye fix that um, feedback and judge and uh, you take a lifting tape and then um, place li li uh, the lifting tape on top of that print um, the the volcanic powder kind of brings the print out so you're able to see with the naked I feel like eye. Don't new use age like music as a backtrack <laughs> remove the print with the tape and place it on a card I can't believe they don't use confectionery sugar as the uh, testing material. And that goes to the late print examiner, see if they can do something with it. Yeah, like this like right, Buddhist so meditation music in the background. Prints, are you looking for what you think has sufficient quantity quality so that someone can identify? Absolutely. Are you always right? No. In fact, in this case, did you know that, unfortunately, there just wasn't enough detail on, on these two lifts? Right. Okay. Uh, also... An abundance of, 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 of caution trying to get the best lift here. Did you do a relift on one of the prints? Yes. What's a relift? A relift is uh, I'll attempt to uh, uh, recover a print and it may not come out uh, right or it may not come, come out at all. So I'll just kind of repeat the process to try to get a better um, print. And that's what you're trying to do in this case? Get a better lift off of that with that relift. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions. Say that again. We passed the witness. No questions. All right. You can step down, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Thank
I just housed the slice what because of this pizza time. Looking for um, to try to find. Got some uh, shitty cookies here. That's all. Find um, <laughs> the suspect and also trying to find any altercation or just any video. It's um, okay. Just eat something fried. What happened or occurred that night? Okay. You shut your whore um, mouth. Now, I'll sure. Make sure I move that speaker. Can you move the microphone? To the, maybe move your to chair. To me. Oh. Yeah, why don't you move your chair? Oh God. Oh. Um, Was that her or? Old, so I can't hear as well. Some yeah, some microphone sure. got hit somewhere. Your camera okay. yeah. braced against the. So, you're looking for video that captures a suspect, right? Correct. I'll go on to, I'll go on to internet. To see if Casa Blanca's video Nick. captures maybe some incident that happens that set this whole thing off, right? Yes. Okay. So there was the homicide. There was the punch. Milwaukee Police Department had those two things. But there was a third incident, or I should say a first incident, that maybe you were trying to see if you could find. Yes. Did you ever find it? I did not. Now... I want to draw your attention specifically to when you go to Casablanca, who do you meet? I met with the owner. Rick. And where where did you meet with him uh, <laughs> in the restaurant? I believe his office. Frankly, my oh, dear, sorry. I don't give Correct. a damn. Put again, Sam. It's the wrong one. <laughs> Shit. Is that gone with the wind? Yeah. Yes. That was terrible. Uh, damn it. It's, it's of, of all the gin joints in Milwaukee. That's <laughs> juice and gin, gin and juice joints. Sorry, I don't like these again. old movies. They suck. Uh, <laughs> trying to find the best way to word this. When you go and you're you're looking for video, uh, one of the was it one of the first things you found? What was one of the first parts huh? of the video that you found when you were going with the owner and kind of looking through the surveillance video? Is, it a, is that a bad question? I, I'm confused. Yeah. Well, let's try to clarify. I can tell the officer is confused. You confused, yeah. officer? She's having fun yeah. now. That was a horrible <laughs> question. Let me do it again. Yes, that was a horrible question. Let's try again. Uh, you end up, do you end up getting a, a, a series? There's something of, weird about her look. It's like her head is floating there. Like she's, she's behind like a cutout of a police clips. uniform standing behind and it. You know what I mean? You're getting these clips. <laughs> Putting her head like over the top where the neck is. Why did that take? Because her Why jacket covers her neck. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, I was already already knew what the suspect looked like um, as far as from previous video that we already had. So off of that, I when we found the suspect, that's why we had those different clips is because we're trying to find um, uh, different clips with him in it to see if we can you know backtrack to see if we can find something. Okay, they just said backtrack. Um, you had a general idea of when the bicyclist was heading westbound kind of past Casablanca to, to Zanya's on the way to the homicide, right? Yes. Was there any reason that to believe that maybe at some point he had been originally heading eastbound? At that point, we didn't know. So that's all we had to find out. At that point, you didn't know whether or not he had originally been going eastbound. Right. How did you, did you eventually find some footage of him going eastbound prior to this incident? Yes. How did you find that? Uh, by going backwards from the time that we seen him on the bicycle going west. So we went backwards from that, that point. And when you're saying you watched it going backwards, what does that mean? That means that um, if he was riding his bike at 6.53, Who put the I reverb backwards on her? to 6.50 to 6.48 <laughs> to 636. So just kind of backwards. You literally put it going in reverse order, right? Yes. You watched this video from where you saw him heading westbound and then watched it heading in reverse continuously until he's popped back up again. Yes. Okay. Now, one moment, I apologize. Auto tune like T Pain. <laughs> <laughs> I can turn on auto tuning it for me. It'd be weird. That'd be hilarious. I'm going to show you what has been marked and placed in the computer as state's exhibit number 37. 
just we'll do that tonight. Moment. I'll sing a song about Chandler getting uh, getting convicted for eating his parents. I'll do it with I'll do it with auto tune. Be like T Pain. Now that's content. Can't stop this content train. Whatever they did recently with the microphones needs to be undone because this background hum is driving me insane. Too many mics. Too many mics hot. Can you do it in Richard's voice? Do yeah, <laughs> auto tune Mark Richards. Auto tune Mark Richards. Do it. Cry havoc. That'd be good. Cry havoc. Cry havoc and release the cheese of war. <laughs> 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 it's a gouda. Hear the lamentations of the cheese curds. <laughs> system is the best. So as we're looking at this right now, Auto tune is Lemoyne. Okay, we'll do. We'll just play with auto tune tonight for the whole stream. We'll just ruin an entire stream. That's what I'll do. Do you see what we're looking at here, officer? Yes. What is this? Looks like a video in front of Casablanca. Okay. And if I could end up. Yeah. yeah. So if we are looking at this, we have this currently set up to four seconds into the video. Um, we can actually kind of even see. What does it say in the, the top portion here? Casablanca. Casablanca. All right. And playing from that portion, we'll just play, which is four seconds into the recording. <laughs> there he goes. And pausing at six seconds into the recording. This, is this the, the kind of the still that you had of moments before the punch in front of Zanya's and eventually the homicide. Yes. All right. So is this where you started basically working back? Correct. All right. Got no hands. Can you the play of that video? <laughs> They're having VLC issues. <laughs> Just so we're clear, in that segment, we can see that there's 10 minutes of video that you end up picking out of this clip. Is that right? Correct. So even though we see the bicyclist suspect go by on his way to Zanya's, on his way to the where eventually this punch is going to happen, you still ended up getting about 10 more minutes worth of video, right? Yes. Your Honor, for the record, that was State's Exhibit number 37, and that was Channel 27 ending 4733. Now, going to Channel 27 ending 63716. Okay. You know, there have been some very interesting witnesses. This one is uh, not one of them so far. <laughs> I'm not sure what they're like really trying to get out of this. Is it just that he was riding his bike the wrong way down the road? So eventually you saw the suspect by... heading eastbound. Yes. Maybe. Do you remember the victim yelled at him in the first place? How long you were watching? The big old races? How many minutes? N none of this has anything to do with the shooting right now. That's what's bothering yeah. me about this. It's you a waste really of time. Remember? I don't know. Okay. It was a lot of video. It was a lot of video? All right. Between the moment of when the bicyclist is heading westbound on his way to the incident and when we're about to see the bicyclist on or walking his bike eastbound, 
Did you see anything else happen in front of Casablanca? No. Were you looking to see if maybe this altercation where a car had to swerve and there was some words exchanged, were you looking for it? Yes. Did you see it? I did not. So if anyone were to suggest that there was some video. Ooh, okay, this makes sense. That Casablanca why? would capture this swerving incident. That in would be bullshit, before wouldn't it? Yes. This video. You never saw it, did you? I did not. You Whoops. looked for it? I did. Couldn't find it? No. The first time the bicyclist comes onto view in Casablanca is what we're looking at right now. <laughs> yes. All right. Playing from zero minutes and zero seconds into the recording. Pause. Oh, and there they are. Wait, no, that's not them. That's a different Kia. When you and the owner are watching this clip, do you guys kind of get a little excited at this moment? Yes. Why? Because they have a camera that's um, right in front of the front door. So we thought that was going to capture a better photo. Of his face? face. Yes, of his face. Officer, at the moment that you and the owner and your partner are attempting to find this footage, watching it going backwards, did you have any idea who this person was? No. You're hoping to find a good photo of him? Yes. Right. That's not the same Kia. There's no passenger, guys. That's just another Kia in Milwaukee, which is the, that's going to be the title of my autobiography. But... And no White Claw. No, they have to address this. I mean, the allegation is that that guy got, not only that they swerved yeah, at that guy, but that they hit Officer, him with the car right clear, here. So I, I know what we're talking about here. The side of the street, is that the north side of, of Brady? Yes, it is. Okay. And we can see that at this portion, the bicyclist is on the north side walking his bike eastbound. Correct. We're going to watch a couple videos, uh, video clips that you got of both the bicyclist walking his bike eastbound and then also riding back westbound, right? Yes. All right. Is he always on the north side of the street? Until he rides west, yes. And even, uh, uh, even when he's riding west, he's still on the... Yes, he's still on the north side of the street. Do you ever see him on the south side on where the eastbound traffic was? I did not. Okay. That's where he's supposed to be he when they passed, his, when they swerved around a car to hit him. Walking his bike on the north side of the street and then going eastbound and then riding, going westbound. Correct. Okay. This is bad for the defense. This is very bad for their story unless they have something else. Remember, they told the jury. The evidence will show. That in front of this now, Casablanca, to to that the defendant's wife swerved and hit him with her car. So unless unless there's later video oh, where that so happens. Are you familiar with where, you know what, let me get it out of the Zoom again. Yeah, let me get it out of the stupid Zoom, stupid technology. Are you familiar with what we're looking at here? Yes. What are we looking at here? I believe that is the uh, east side of the building of Casablanca, I believe. So Somebody commented, what wife, uh, what husband lets the wife drive? The at. husband who's point one two. Right? Yeah. That's <laughs> the wife drive. Where is this Casablanca? So yes. So that's where, where the only situation. Point one two is more than Jews, West, folks. That's we're gonna be super seeing juicy. kind of... I can do it, Branca. Yes. I don't tell me I can't drive. Correct. I always let the wife drive if she's willing to. Who the hell was That's like a Wednesday. If I blew right now, I'd be point one two. I'm working on it. Point one two still gives the husband an edge. 
<laughs> no comment. Nice. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> the chat is amazing. Uh, fair, fair point. Point taken. Consistently amazing. <laughs> and horrible, and that's why I love them. So it appears for that block that Casablanca is on. He's walking his bike, and he's on the north side of the street the entire time. Yes. We see him crossing, going into the next block. He's still on the north side of the street. Yes. Okay. Wait, why do you want to drive? Seriously, what's the advantage going of driving? Going to camera 26, this one ending. How is that on a three, four. Well, Joe, I'll send you some testosterone supplements and you'll find out. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Are you kidding me? It's the most alpha thing in the world. I make her drive for me. You know, Jack Murphy made a me. similar argument about making his wife do things. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm simply pointing out, you guys are crazy. It's like, why the hell I want to deal with the panty ass of like driving? Oh, you know what it is? You guys are driving like on highways and shit. That appear to be that bicycle. No, no, I'm talking about like, I want to sit in traffic. Now and like just like drive yes. like nine, drive ninety. Feet I tell and her to when again. to turn signal. Quote Joe no, Neerman. I no, I sleep. <laughs> I literally sleep. I'm like I'll you drive. I'm seriously gonna take a nap. I get it, Joe. It must be hard now to drive in heels. Is there anything? Any altercation you see happen on the video? I don't know. I think you guys are. I think that's, these that's like the ultimate insecurity. I don't understand it. Like, oh, I got, I've got to drive. Are you kidding me? I'd, far, I'd, rather, I'd rather put up with the three accidents a year, the little fender benders, and not have to like deal with the hassle of driving through the city and let and let her do that work for me. The me? mild, the mild whiplash. <laughs> It's totally worth it. I don't care about the insurance rates. It's fine. It's like it's now, like basically that's the price of a chauffeur. So instead of, instead of like instead of like me having to pay for a chauffeur, I basically pay higher insurance. Rates. That's how it works. Right? Yes. Okay. And this one we can actually see. We have a time gap, right? We see six thirty-seven and fifteen seconds, right? Yes. Did you end up determining that this? time period was off yes how much was it off i believe it was an hour behind so we're actually looking at 737 yes officer uh, in your job as a police officer do you go retrieve video from businesses yes i do are there security cameras always right on with the hours no in fact with Going with daylight savings is sometimes being an hour behind or an hour ahead, something you'll see a lot. Yes. Okay. So this is 737, right? Correct. Approximately 10 minutes prior to the incident is yes. when you see this bicyclist heading eastbound on uh, walk, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm dying. <And> from that <laughs> One second. Oh, oh no, Joe's wife just made him get in the back seat. <laughs> Snowboard dances. Joe's woman is driving right now. <laughs> He's got a little plastic toy oh, no. steering wheel back there. <laughs> I'm trying to pay attention to this. Damn try. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I'm literally crying oh, right now. Able to see it. <laughs> yeah. okay. You guys seriously? You you like I would totally like sit in the back seat. I would totally sit in the back <laughs> okay, seat. Okay, Miss Daisy. More worth it. Stop. Uh, Joe, I, you're I don't already understand. dead. <laughs> I don't even understand the argument. I don't understand the argument the opposite way. Ooh, ooh, look at me. I'm a big man. I know how to drive a car. Ooh, look at me. I don't understand it. But you never drive? Like you have to like sit there like grab every opportunity you can to drive? It's ridiculous. <laughs> Wait for one second. Oh god. I've driven like four million miles in my life. I don't need to drive another like fifty well, miles to to my my in laws' house. Okay, okay. Your okay. in laws' house. It was about an hour. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I don't go. But, yeah. When our bicyclist suspect is now heading eastbound. 
<laughs> or westbound, West, correct? West, westbound. You still driving on a permit, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, oh God. I can't. Even, I can't even believe. But you guys never. Did you guys like figure that? Like, oh, I'm a real man. If I get to wash the dishes in my house, also, how does that work? Like, why is it like doing more work is considered like that's the order of a man? I don't get that. More, more, instead of actually pawning that off. Ooh, look at me. I changed the baby's diaper. This is, this is the Mr. Pink moment, like, but with Tribe. Talk about Reservoir Dogs. Okay, so we've, we've shown, uh, we've seen several times, several angles now. And this, pausing. this is again blowing up the defense's narrative that they're, that they were not. You know, they are not looking for video of Obviously, this guy. you went through Casablanca's video. All those angles, right? Yes. Did you ever find this earlier incident? I did not. Okay. Your Honor, the state would move state's exhibit number 37. Any objection? No objection. Fine. Steve. Fine. The judge always sounds like just God. This is such an imposition now, on me to be here. Officer. Yes. So today I learned Joe Freeman. married Morgan Freeman. You grabbed clips. From <laughs> yes. Was there anything, of any notes uh, that you saw better than Matt from Tinder? Parts? I did not. You watched him. You didn't see anything, right? No. If this, where this first incident happened. It's not on any Casablanca camera. It is not. You look for it. Yes. So if anybody was suggesting that at some point Oof. at 745, Casablanca's cameras would have caught this earlier incident, you didn't see it. I did not. You went from 748 to 737 watching cameras and didn't see anything. I did not. You see the suspect walking his bike eastbound and then riding back westbound. Yes. So the reason why you didn't grab other portions of it, there was nothing on it worth watching. It was not. Okay. Now, additionally, we're gonna have a hard time impeaching this cop. Allow you to see other videos or other businesses. I know he had access. I don't remember if I actually view the video, but I believe so that he showed me on his phone the different areas where it was it wouldn't have caught it anything anyway. Um, and just to be clear, because the Casa Blanca is part of like a, a business district with at the time somewhere about eighteen cameras on Brady Street. Correct. And he was able to show you 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 think on your phone or on his phone, those camera angles? Yes. Okay. Did you look to see if you could find this incident on those camera angles? The, the camera views was too far from where the incident possibly occurred. Okay. And where this incident possibly occurred would have been basically kind of in between where <laughs> Casablanca's got cameras and where he's got access to the next business cameras. Yes. There was a vape shop that he had access to, right? I'm not sure what the name of it was. Okay. Uh, he had access to a vape shop, VAP. Joe, help him out here. And he had access kind of like down Brady Street to a number of different businesses. It was either too far or they didn't catch him. Yes. Zanya's Pizza, did he have access to that video? No. Other detectives then had to go out and get that video, didn't they? I believe so. Okay. You guys didn't get it. Right. Okay. So just so I have this completely clear, officer, you did a lot of work trying to find video on this incident. Yes. You did a lot of work trying to find this first incident to see if any video that, that, that captured it. Yes. Did you find anything? I did not. You looked for it? Yes. Off 
officer, are there times in your career where things happen and cameras just don't capture it? Yes. <clears throat> but in this case, it wasn't for lack of trying by you. No, it wasn't. Thank you. you guys. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Chat, you are killing me. You gotta stop. I can't. Good afternoon. So, Queuing up some of the video that you just testified about. So I just wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about your investigation as to the video from Casablanca in this case, okay? Okay. So you said that you were asked to go follow up with Casablanca um, to obtain any surveillance video in this case, correct? Correct. Okay, and that was a day after the actual shooting, right? Correct. And who were you asked by? Do you remember? I don't remember. Okay, did you author any sort of police report about your findings? No. Okay. There was nothing so to report. You went to Casablanca, you met with whoever the personnel was that managed the video, right? Correct. And then we just had a chance to look at multiple camera angles um, of the time where you can see Mr. Edgecombe passing by Casablanca on his way going eastbound, right? We saw that part. Correct. And then about 10 minutes later, we saw him coming back westbound on his bicycle, right? Correct. And just to clarify, around, according to the video, it said 637 in that minute, give or take some seconds, we saw Mr. Edgecombe walking his bicycle, um, going eastbound towards the lake on Brady, right? Correct. Okay. Chat's got me laughing hard enough that my heat allergy is legit acting up right okay. now. Your Honor, Rude. Exhibit 37. Fine. Fine. God, you're irritating. <laughs> Every time. Judge hates them. His he hair is them. like bald in a perfect circle, too. It is like disturbingly perfect. Yeah. Okay. Man. So, um, Officer Howard, can you just confirm what we're seeing in that still frame right there? You're seeing a video clip in from a camera um, facing east from the Casablanca building. Okay, and so it's facing east and it's Casablanca's own surveillance video, right? Correct. Okay, got a couple more questions for you. So number one, do you see a bike lane at all on this street? No. Okay, and number two, what do you see here on the far side of the road? Are you talking about the construction? Yes. Yes, that's what I see. Okay, so you can see going eastbound on this video, you see construction in a turn, and in, in specifically, you see what would you call these uh, cylinders right here? Construction cones. So you see multiple construction cones going down Brady Street, right? Correct. Right. Like and that's on the last preschool that admission. Goes eastbound, correct? Yes. Okay, and then you also see a caterpillar construction machine there, right? Yes. Or to be more specific, maybe it's a different brand, but we see some sort of construction vehicle there. Correct. Like a crane or something, right? The backhoe. Yes. You okay. And we previously seen Mr. Edgecombe walking eastbound on Brady using the sidewalk on this side, right? Yes. And previous to that, he was coming from Swing Park, according to what the investigation had shown, right? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I don't know what they're going to do here. 
The other camera. Okay, angle excavator. That we had yeah, excavator guys. That's right. Not back up. 10, 15 minutes. Better ago. than a crane, though. When Attorney Hubner was asking you some questions, those are just from different camera angles um, that were marked 637, give or take some seconds, right? Correct. And then about 10 minutes later, we saw Mr. Edgecombe coming down um, Brady going westbound on his bicycle, right? Yes. Now, you testified that you, know, you looked through those 10 minutes and you didn't see any other indication of Mr. Edgecombe on any of those cameras in that period from 737 or so to 747, right? Right. Now, how did you know that that time was accurate uh, in terms of being one hour off? If you had added an hour to the timestamp, that it would be the correct time. Uh, because I asked the owner regarding his cameras and the time, and I asked him if they were um, the correct time, and he told me no, that they were an hour behind. Okay, was it exactly one hour behind? <laughs> That's what he told me. Okay. I mean, are you, you going to argue it with your own watch or any sort of um, digital device that you may have to keep track of time? At the time that we were looking at, no, because I was there at a different time. So, no. I mean, I, I if I looked at his the cameras that were um, actually live, then you can. You can tell that the, the times are not on. Okay. Well, the important thing is we know that there's 10 minutes that elapse between when we first see him at Casablanca at 737 to when we see him coming back to Casablanca at 747, right? Yes. Now, as part of your investigation, so you had viewed all of these clips there at Casablanca the day after the shooting, right? Correct. What other steps did you take to investigate 10 more minutes of possible video down Brady Street? Well, after we left Casablanca, we walked another block down to see if we can find any other cameras. Um, the owner thought that there might have been a camera on a small shop in the middle between, um, I believe it was Cass and Marshall. And I don't believe that there was a camera there. And if it was, we called um, the owner and they did not answer the phone. So we did go and check different houses, different uh, uh, businesses to see if they had any cameras on their, um, outside of their business, on their building. Okay, and you said you never drafted a report about any of your follow-up? No. And just to be clear, looking at exhibit B5, so you said you went maybe about a block up to about Marshall Street, right? Correct. Okay. And you weren't able to locate any cameras showing, well, well let me ask that. So in between this area, you weren't able to find any camera whatsoever, or is it that you weren't able to find any camera that showed Mr. Edgecombe? I did not find any cameras on any of the buildings. Okay. And you said the other method that you looked at for video was asking Casablanca's owner to look to see if he could see anything on his cell phone. Is that right? Correct. My cell phone's a pretty small screen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yes. And walking down one block, maybe that took what, 10 or 15 minutes? Well, we drove. You drove, so maybe less? Yes. Sounds like a lot of hard work. It was. Questions. <laughs> what, the, what the hell was that? Him being a beta for Making nothing. Conversation. I don't think you guys even know what beta for means me. anymore. <laughs> Jesus. I would let my 12 year old son yeah. drive instead of me. I would let anyone when drive. It's the owner. We kind of got that, Joe. Your 12 year old son is more a man than you. 
That was that called you, all I don't know. I, 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 I get, if that's what you call, no, man, you, you can figure out right? how to navigate oh streets. Hold on. Oh what my you goodness. were told was this first incident that had happened just east of Casablanca. Correct. They didn't have cameras to capture it. They did not. Casablanca had no cameras to capture it. No. You went looking for cameras to capture it. Yes. You couldn't find cameras to capture it. I did not. So, just to be very clear, and I think it was good work, but doesn't matter what I think. Here's the main thing. You went looking for something and just couldn't find it. That's correct. And the clips you found were the only things that showed anything relevant to this case. Yes. Not because you were trying to hide something, but because that's all there was. Correct. No further questions. And I want to be very clear. You watched between 747 or 748 and 737 Things going backwards on that Casablanca video, right? Correct. If anybody were to suggest that a Casablanca camera would capture this first incident at 745, you never saw it. No. Also, did you have your body cam on? Correct, I did. And you literally watching video going back and forth. That's on your body cam, isn't it? Yes. I asked you to watch it, didn't I? Yes. Um, Who'd you give the CD to, the DVD, or the <clears throat> clips, I should say? We gave it to uh, a detective. A homicide detective. Correct. Maybe he wrote a report? Maybe. You were just asked to go get the video. Correct. OK. Thank you. Nothing else. The, wow. the, op the opening question Officer from the Allen. state was, I'm sorry he made that, that last comment. You actually did work hard, didn't you? Retrieve any other video um, besides Casablanca, right? Retrieve the video would have meant a lot of work. But if I didn't find any cameras, okay, I couldn't find but, anything. But you can't say for sure where this incident could have occurred, right? No. And I'm, when I say incident, I'm talking. I'm referring to. The initial incident that occurred between the Clearmans and Mr. Edgecombe, right? All right. What that incident? was something that was known to law enforcement that night of the of the actual shooting, correct? Correct. And you definitely didn't go beyond those the the next block. You said you went another block beyond Casablanca, but then you stopped there. You didn't go beyond to up to Humboldt Street, correct? Correct. No further questions. Uh, okay. They have anything? Casablanca had access to video beyond that one block? Yes. You looked at it, didn't have it? No. Thank you. Nothing else. Defense, anything? And just to be clear, the way you ascertained that was. By Are you prosecuting me? Someone else it's like, Jesus problem, Christ. Right? It's had video cameras, yes. Nothing further. No, I'm done. So you're done? I'm done. Good. You can step down. <laughs> Good. He's tired of that shit. State's next witness. State calls Dr. Kelly. Oh, God. Fine. So the police allegedly know Jesus about Christ, some dude. incident, but... Who, who's, who, how did the police know about the incident? What's the report of the incident? Who reported the incident? Where's the witness testifying to this incident? Don't know. Uh, real quick, uh, I got to find it. True and Nana Shabada, bad pressure, bad calf care, sent a chat. It says, I asked you to toast me getting over COVID last night, but you forgot. Now if I relapse and die, it will be your fault, and I'll haunt you by muting your mic randomly. Well, True and Nana, blah, 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 blah. Cheers to getting over COVID. It sucks when you get it. Glad you made it through. Welcome to the 99.97% or whatever it is. Uh, cheers, buddy. Ha hashtag not medical advice. My name is Philip Douglas Kelly. Uh, P-H-I-L-I-P-K-E-L-L-E-Y. Doctor, right, so you can take your mask off. It's easier for everybody if that's okay with you. Thank you, Your Honor. It's a medical exam. familiar. 
He looks very familiar. They all look the same. <laughs> yeah, that pro that's probably it, honestly, Bronco. <laughs> No offense, but the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office. Was he in Chauvin? No, I don't think so. Uh, well, since uh, 1999. Mm. He does look shockingly familiar. Not Rittenhouse. Not Rittenhouse. Training or experience. No. Yes. Can you briefly go over that with us? Okay. Um, and I and I should qualify that by saying well, he was in written out. Johnson, a medical examiner, is just an appointed official uh, and does not have to be a forensic pathologist. But a forensic pathologist does have to have uh, certain qualifications. Um, Are you a forensic pathologist? And, and I am a forensic pathologist. Yes. And in fact, to work at the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's. Okay, office, from Rittenhouse, I, we got to check. What? No. Hold on. Okay. Let me uh, refresh it. I lost my feed too. Why do you keep a separate feed going? Oh. I, I record it uh, so I can I put was, it on my own blog post. I did my college at Illinois Wesleyan University. Uh, I went to medical school at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Uh, I did uh, two years of internal medicine residency also with Southern Illinois University. And, uh, it's not long crime. I'm not using their stupid feed today. They don't have this on except behind a paywall. Training uh, with St. Louis University School of Medicine, uh, and then uh, got a uh, on their camera fellowship position, a forensic pathology fellowship position with the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, which is how I came to Wisconsin. And how long have you been? You said you've been a forensic. Um, pathologist and a member or and a medical examiner since 1999? Yes, I finished my training in 1999. And how many different offices have you worked in as a forensic pathologist? Uh, uh, I, I started here and I actually came back to this office about four years ago. Uh, so I, I have uh, been in uh, five offices. Previous to becoming the deputy chief here, um, where were you? Uh, I was the chief medical examiner uh, for the Fond du Lac County Medical Examiner's Office. Um, have you testified as an expert before in the field of forensic pathology? Yes. Oh, yes. Approximately how many times? I couldn't even tell you. Many times yeah. over 20 years. Okay. Um, and this probably is another question you probably can't answer. Approximately how many autopsies do you think you've done? Um, I, I'm around 6,000 autopsies at this point. <laughs> now, but the body's at the floor. Uh, well, pathology is the study of disease and trauma in the human body. I think the main the thing they're going to do on this one is, is stippling, I guess. Died by gunshot wound to, to face. Of applying it to the field of, of law. And by that, I mean... Um, as a forensic pathologist, I determine cause and manner of death and certify death certificates. So we make legal certifications on why people, how and why people die. And doctor, is basically, or is kind of two of the questions you're looking at, um, the cause of death and the manner of death. Yes. What is cause of death? Well, cause of death is the is the uh, why people die. Uh, so it's uh, basically it involves that unbroken chain of events that leads to somebody's death. Uh, so things like heart attacks and trauma to the head and uh, um, gunshot wounds; those are causes of death. What's manner of death? Now, manner of death is how people die. And so for certifying deaths, we have five categories that we use to certify the manner of death. There's natural deaths, accidents, suicides, homicides, and then there's undetermined cases. What's the definition of a homicide? Basically, homicide means death at the hands of another. Uh, it's a standard definition of that. And I want to be very clear, when you're coming to a medical conclusion as to a manner of death being a homicide, 
you're not making any legal conclusions, are you? No. Um, when you say it's a homicide, you're just saying someone died at the hands of another person. That's correct. Okay. So self-defense would be declared a homicide by you. Yes. Um, traffic related drunk drivings are, are those referred to as accidents as opposed to homicides? I would call those accidents. Okay. So again, this is just a medical conclusion that you're coming up with based on how the medical examiner's office in the state of Wisconsin classifies certain deaths. That's correct. Okay. Now, additionally, doctor, are you licensed to practice medicine in the state of Wisconsin? Yes. All right. As a medical examiner, as a forensic pathologist, do you have to perform the autopsy in order to come to a conclusion as to the cause and the manner of death? Um, not always, but in the majority of cases, we do perform autopsies. Um, in fact, you perform a number of autopsies. Yes. <laughs> Are you able to, in your field, uh, look at the work of another forensic pathologist, their notes, the photos, the uh, report, diagrams, things like that, in order to come to a independent medical conclusion as to the cause and the manner of death. Sure. Uh, in fact, in this case, is that what you did? Yes, in this case, that's what, what has taken place. Uh, were you the doctor that did the autopsy uh, as to Mr. Claremont? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, have you reviewed the photos taken from that autopsy? Yes, I did. Have you reviewed the notes taken during that autopsy? Yes. Have you reviewed the report? I did. Was there sufficient information that you were able to come to your own independent expert medical opinion as to the cause and manner of death? Yes. Why didn't they just Are get the one medical examiner? Did I miss that? And I sometimes get this the wrong. The dead or on maternity um, leave or something? referred to as the anatomic correct position? Uh, yes. What is that? Well, the, the anatomic position is uh, a standard position of the body that we use in order, to, in order so that we can all communicate and know what each other's talking about. So because the body bends and twists and moves, the anatomic position is referring to the body standing straight up with the palms forward and, and, and staring straight ahead. So that's the anatomic position. So anytime we refer to left, we're talking about the person's left, right, person's right, up, down, back, front. They're all relative to the person and not to the observer. And in this case, the autopsy was performed by a Dr. Jacob Smith, is that correct? That is correct. He's now a forensic pathologist in another state. He is. All right. Now. There you go. Doctor, during your review of this case, were you able to observe whether or not the victim in this case has suffered any injuries to his body. Yes. What were those? Uh, well, to start with, he has a gunshot wound to the head. <laughs> to start with. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the, that's one one the issue. Brow. Um, there's no exit wound. There was, act, there was actually a bullet recovered uh, from just under the scalp in the back of the head. Um, in addition to the gunshot wound, there were abrasions or scrapes to the skin that involved the left side of the face, uh, very long uh, uh, brush abrasions. Um, there were some additional abrasions to the left side of the mouth. Um, he uh, also had uh, two lacerations or tears to the skin. Drink some water. Right oh, my God. Brow, and uh, a small abrasion to the bridge of the nose, the right side. ASMR the there, Joe, the, Nick. And then he also had some uh, uh, abrasions that involved the back of the left shoulder, the, the side of the left arm, and uh, to the back of the left hand. Um, so those were the, uh, the uh, uh, injuries that Dr. Smith documented in his report and with, with photographs. Okay. Um, now, 
Now, to begin with, when you refer to a number of the abrasions, um, were some of those consistent potentially with the victim falling to the ground after dying? Yes. Okay. Um, before we get to that, you had mentioned that he appeared to have injuries to both sides of his face. Is that correct? That's correct. What side of the face was the gunshot wound on? The left side. And where was it again? Um, it was basically to the mid-left eyebrow. Okay. Did he have any injuries to the right side of his face? Yes. There were knuckle marks. Can knuckle marks, please. This is the same guy from Rittenhouse. I want to show you what his yeah. remarks is. Day is seven, apparently. Do you recognize that photo? Yes, I do. And what is that a photo of, Doc? Uh, this, this is a photo of the, the, the right eye, uh, Mr. Clearman's right eye. Um, and it shows the, the two lacerations or cuts to the uh, right eyebrow. Your Honor, may I publish this photo? Yes. <clears throat> now, doctor. This man see, owns Jurassic Park. <laughs> first, what appears to be these two lacerations or, or straight what hair. What could go wrong? Right? Yes. Okay. Was it Jurassic Park? Kind of in the bridge of the nose, what are we seeing? Spared no expense. Uh, that's, that's a small bridge. No, no, this is the bridge of the nose. And kind of under by the eyelid, what are we looking at there? Uh, there, there is a little more bruising that's involving the, the upper and lower eyelids. You said bruising. Kind of cons would this maybe can be consistent with kind of like a black eye or something along those lines? Uh, yes, uh, a lot of bruising directly around the eye is related to the, uh, some skull fractures to the base of the skull. Now, doctor. If Mr. Clareman were punched on the right side of his face and he wore glasses, are any of these injuries potentially consistent with that impact towards his face? Yes, they are. Um, what are we talking about here? Uh, well, the, if you notice the two lacerations Show the picture. are somewhat in parallel. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly that would, uh, I have seen that caused by the frame of glasses from people who have who have fallen onto the ground on the face. The small abrasion to the right side of the bridge of the nose, the, uh, uh, the, the little, um, I can never remember the name of it, but the, uh, the small uh, brace that goes against the, uh, the bridge of the nose would uh, oh. possibly be driven against the skin and creating this, this scrape to the nose. So this the is- The name of the glasses piece. I was like, do you, you're a- Just to be clear though- Forensic pathologist, you, you don't, don't- know exactly what causes it. Remember a piece no, of the no, body? No, I, I'm just saying that this is consistent with that possibility. Uh, he has them, they were documented. You've seen them in these photos. Yes. All right, just another thing when we're looking at here, what are we looking at towards the bottom of state's exhibit number four you got? Uh, well, that's the, the scale or the photo label. So it has the unique identifier for the, uh, the autopsy case and uh, obviously has the, the scale or the ruler. And if we're looking for photos related to this autopsy, this is going to be the number that we're going to want to see. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I want to show you what has been marked as state's exhibit number 47. Ash, if you take a look at that for me, tell me if you recognize it. Yes, I do. What is it? This photograph is of the left side of the decedent's face. And you're on for the record. Based on discussions that the court has had with counsel and myself, um, I do have a post-it just kind of over the eye because there's a portion of that that's a little graphic that we don't really need to go into or show on the, the picture. But just so we're looking at that, um, what are we seeing in that eye before we show the photo? The eye itself, the, the eye itself has hemorrhage 
to the uh, to the eye globe and to the, to the conjunctiva. Okay. So that's kind of... To the eye globe and the conjunctiva. C O N J U N C A T I V A. Your Honor, may I publish? Any objection? No objection. Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number Sixty Seven. Detect or er, uh, Doctor, what are we looking at here? You're looking at a, a wide, a wide swath of abrasion or scraping. Um, so this is a brush abrasion. You can see that there, it has kind of a, a linear orientation down the side of the face, which kind of gives you an idea about the direction that the scrape, uh, the scrape went from you know top to bottom, bottom to top, something like that. It's in that orientation. You can see the abrasion is also uh, located to the left side of the mouth, left upper and lower lips, and there's a little abrasion even over there to the, the uh, left earlobe. And the manner in which we see, it, could this be consistent with the victim falling, basically face first onto cement stairs or pavement? Yes, it could be from uh, scraping along concrete or, or something like that. I want to draw your attention to the eyebrow, right above our little post-it note. What are we seeing there, Doctor? That's the uh, entrance of the wound. I really wish they would show these pictures. Don't understand what why. That uh, that's basically the bullet entered uh, his head. Are you familiar with the terms perforating and penetrating gunshot wounds? Yes. What are perforating and penetrating gunshots? Uh, well, perforating is a term that's used to uh, indicate that a, that a uh, projectile entered the body and exited the body. Whereas penetrating means that it penetrated into the body but did not exit the body. And in this case, was this gunshot wound a perforating or a penetrating? Well, this would be a penetrating gunshot wound. <laughs> was the bullet recovered inside the victim? Uh, it was. Where? Uh, it was recovered from just beneath the scalp on the left side of the back of the head. Now, doctor. From where the bullet entered to where it ends up being recovered on the left side of the back of the head, is there a trajectory that this bullet took within the victim's head? Yeah, it went through his head. What is that trajectory? Well, it's front to back um, and was slightly upwards. There was no left-right um, deviation. So when you're saying slightly upwards, what is that? It just means that it's, it's uh, from its entry point to the side of the bullet. Um, the trajectory is uh, slightly upwards from front to back. And, Your Honor, for the record, uh, the doctor kind of had his hand kind of at a slight upward angle. Is that correct, doctor? Yes. Okay. So what you're saying is, is that what we're looking at is this slight upward angle from when it enters and then continues. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, can you tell us exactly how the victim was situated, standing, sitting, laying down when this bullet enters his head? No. From the, from the autopsy, um, I can't tell you what orientation the the... the the decedent was in. Or if this were Binger, he would hammer on how it was in I the also back. I can't tell you anything about the uh, the person who shot him. Came up through his <laughs> back, exactly. out his clavicle, and then into his forehead. Standing, which he refers to as the door. Any one of those could change what you're looking at. Right. There are a lot of different possibilities. I can certainly tell you whether something is conceivable, if it's possible, but I, I can't tell you exactly what the, uh, the uh, orientation of the body was. All we know is, is that the bullet started at a slightly lower angle and moved slightly up. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so kind of going from a lower in and then just slightly up within the head. Uh, correct. Okay. Now, <clears throat> also you said there's no left-right deviation? That's, that's correct. So this is a straight-on shot. Basically, right into the to, to the victim's head. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. What path did it take within his head? 
uh, well, it, it passed through the left side of the brain. Now, are you familiar with the term range of fire characteristics? Yes. What does that mean? Uh, from the autopsy, there are certain things that we can that we can note that can give us some idea about the distance that the skin was from the end of the gun. So from muzzle to skin, that's a that's a range of fire or a distance of fire. And we use some of the the findings on the skin in order to determine what the possible range of fire is. And to be more specific, there's more than just the bullet that comes out of the end of the gun. So there's, there's flame, uh, there's smoke and soot, and of course smoke and soot, they don't, they're not very aerodynamic, so they fall away very quickly, lose energy and fall away. Um, so after about a foot, you won't, you, you don't have any deposition of soot on the, on the surface of the body. There's also gunpowder, believe it or not, all the gunpowder doesn't always burn up during the discharge. So gunpowder comes out of the end of the gun. And again, if you're close enough to the skin, that gunpowder has enough energy that when it hits the skin, it can create little abrasions or scrapes. It can even embed itself in the skin. And uh, when we see that, we refer to that as an intermediate range gunshot wound. Um, typically, and, and of course, it, it depends on the gun uh, determining uh, what the distance can be. It depends on the gun. But for, mo for the most part, uh, intermediate range gunshot wounds indicate that the shot came from somewhere within four feet. Somewhere within four feet? Yes. Can you, can you be any more specific than that? No, I, the, you could be a little more specific by test firing the weapon. Um, you could look at the, the distribution of the, uh, the stippling, the gunpowder stippling or those scrapes. You could uh, look at that and measure that and then you could test fire the weapon and, and see how far, how far out that size of, of a pattern is made. So you could compare those. Um, but beyond that, I can only tell you that uh, gunpowder stippling is you know, within four feet. Um, obviously, the further away you get, the more dispersed the gunpowder particles, particles get. And uh, so it's, the, it, the, the pattern becomes less dense and becomes wider. So it spreads out in a cone. Um, but that after about four feet and with, with handguns, that's uh, pretty much all bets off. What would be the, the closest range you might see with this intermediate? If the outer if the outer limits, you know, four feet, what would be the closest range you might see something you would classify as intermediate? Well, I mean, with some guns, you can actually see some very small stippling around a wound, even at a half an inch. But but obviously, typically, as you get further away, that's when you start seeing the the dense pattern, and you keep you keep backing away, that pattern will widen out and become more sparse. Is the American question on that break? It's almost 450. I'm really sorry, Judge. I thought we were making good time. Um. <laughs> we're doing fine, but as you know, uh, Chief Judge and the County Executive are not going to let me work past 5 o'clock, so a couple more questions. Yes, and I will not just speak quicker, Madam Court Reporter. Doctor, in terms of uh, what you're looking at beyond intermediate is there another range of fire characteristic or another range that you guys sometimes re refer to beyond that there are no characteristics there's no so there's no stippling and so we have, we can only refer to those as uh as indeterminate range we can't determine the range okay now in this case regarding mr claremont the victim did you see any range of fire char characteristics on his body yes what did you see he has gunpowder stippling uh, surrounding the gunshot wound to the uh, to the left eyebrow. So, just so we're referring to what we're talking about here in State's Exhibit Number Forty Seven, these little red pock marks—is that what you're referring to? Yes. Okay. Is this kind of a, a more 
larger grouping of sibling? Um, in, I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, I, I think what you're seeing in this photograph is the edge of it. There's much more stippling around it to the forehead. I'm going to show you what has been marked as state's exhibit number 48. Kind of another good one, because I'm trying not to get too many really gross photos here. Uh, but are we seeing it within kind of around the eye? Yes. All right. Doctor, can you tell us Ooh. where this is anywhere within that? I'm going to need know, an autopsy soon. This guy's killing feet. my vibe. Um, I, I really can't be more specific than that. So it's an inter intermediate or intermediate gunshot wound. Yes. Okay. Your Honor, the state would move state's exhibits numbers 49, 48, and 47 in evidence. All right, there was Steve. Let's break there. <clears throat> Unless you had like one question. Okay. You can step down, doctor. We'll need you back tomorrow morning. For the jury, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break there. It's about 4.50. Um, I'm going to ask again that you're back tomorrow as you were today, 8.15 or 8.20. We'll try to start as close. Yeah, just to break on time. As possible. Wife is going to be there at 5 to pick I him up. I appreciate all of your attention today. It seems like you've been paying attention. And <laughs> <laughs> listening to the witnesses, and the listening to the testimony. I appreciate that. The parties appreciate that. Um, I always feel like I give these warnings too many times, but you finally got done laughing, here, Andrew. You bastard! The state told you the story about the one case that had turned out to be a disaster in terms of the jury. So I trust uh, you guys will follow the rules. Again, no deliberating in this case, no discussion of it. Please don't watch any or read any media attention to this case. That's tonight or tomorrow or at any point in time. Yeah, then, Nick. Again, don't discuss anything about it. Don't do any research. Um, we'll see you tomorrow. Please be here at 8.15, 8.20. We'll try to start as close to 8.30 as possible. You can leave your notepads where they are. Uh, have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Oof. So I've gotten two fantastic emails today. One from my attorney with the... Uh, Draft response to law and crime, which uh, so far looks good. The other one, this is for the chat especially, is from a Mr. Russell Greer. That's mm. right. R good old Russ reached out. Uh, let me see if this is okay. Yeah. So we're done. We're done for the day. Judge is out. Judge is, judge is gone as far as I can tell. Uh, so there we go. Well, this is a pretty uh, exciting day of trial, you know, all things considered. Plus, we found out that uh, that Joe we wears go. the panties in go. this family. <laughs> there we go. Like, we saw, like no one saw that coming. So, wow. Much like Joe himself. Oh, wow. Whoa, I don't even whoa, understand. Whoa, whoa. I don't know what that was. I don't know what that audio was there, but... It's yeah. the stream yard auto balancing. The judgment of uncivil. Everything. Yeah. Yes. No, I, <laughs> it's, it's the attempt to balance. It, well, but it like because I, I don't think you've really said much since you popped on, so I don't think it had a chance to level you out. Uh, well, what else is there with Streamlabs and sucking with the audio management? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> He's trying to shout his way to fifty k. We know I you don't, don't understand, understand, Joe. That's not the issue. I mean, your your lack of understanding isn't in question. I, no, your your lack of perspective on this is 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 kind of bizarre to me. I'm surprised. I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in every one of you. <laughs> I'm disappointed in anyone who sees this differently. That's like saying like, oh, okay, I, if if I don't cut down the tree myself, I can't build something. Like it's the this is the dumbest thing in the world. Why do you want to cut it? You just pay for it. And just Maybe have your wife drive the same is thing. It? Maybe who drives is a matter of relativity. I don't know. It may, could be. There's a I theory even, about it. I, I'm like, I'd rather spend the money on it than, than actually do the labor. That's, to me, I don't know. That's, <laughs> Joe's that's, wife that's, is out in the back door with a man. Hand <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. She is. She's cutting down my forest right now. <laughs> is that a metaphor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Damn oh. Oh my gosh. Welcome back, Runkle, by the way. Um, I have great timing, it seems. You do. Uh, yeah. you do. You do. Every time you, you show up, the trial ends. It's amazing. Well, <laughs> I, I also left just before it got really spicy. 
I heard it, but I wasn't on stream, and I was like, what? The, uh... Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, hey, is your assistant pretending to be a cop? What the hell was with that? Yeah, that was, uh, that was a very interesting development. Um, awesome. and, uh, could potentially, I mean, uh, assuming anything else happens could potentially come back and bite the defense, but for now they seem to be let go on, uh, on like breakfast club, a thin fucking ice or whatever. Oh, well, um, and, uh, if that is made out, I suspect somebody's being given a dismissal letter right now. Uh, so I have a bunch of super chats to read since it's about five. I'm going to start those, uh, so that I can get through them, you know, before it gets too terribly late. I have heard that the quartering has released a video on my situation, uh, tonight for anybody who's about to leave tonight, I will be covering the Chandler Halderson closing arguments and verdict. Uh, so that should be, that should be fun. I mean, the verdict is guilty on all counts. And if anybody didn't see that coming from the way they were defending the case, I don't know what to tell you. The only the only disappointment I have is I haven't seen anybody say that we now know that he ate them, um, but I'm still convinced that that is what occurred. Uh, but that being said, um, I may also talk about this uh, cease and desist letter. Have to or the response to the cease and desist letter. Um, long story short, it appears law and crime has been lying. Uh, someone sent me uh, suggested I check out their video feed on their website of the same trial, and it was the exact same video that was going on just with their logo on it, which means that they have likely lied when they said that they uh, do not pool the video, which of course they're pooling the video. Um, the courts are not allowing multiple independent media outlets in any of the cases that I've been covering. They're all single media outlets that have a pooled video. So uh, ironically, was... their pettiness, their pettiness about your views made them accuse you of doing something that they're closer to doing because they're actually taking someone else's work and slapping their label on it. You're not trying to slap your own label on it. You're actually transforming content. So, right. and, and, and they may be, they may be creating the work, but what work are they creating when the judge places the cameras and tells them where to go, where they can go and when they can start and stop, what creative activity are they doing? They may not even own the copyrights that they're claiming to own. Uh, and they, they, are possibly at risk of perjuring themselves. So, yeah. so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my little two cents on this in about an hour. But I found the best possible argument against you, Nick. So I'm gonna steel man that, and then I'm nice. gonna proceed to destroy it. So it should be pretty fun. <laughs> I actually I, I found it. I'm like I'm like how can I argue against Nick right now? And then how is this complete trash? So I'm gonna talk about that in an hour. Um, but I'm gonna bounce here, so I have a quick break between my between streams. But it was good. Sounds guys, great, buddy. We'll catch you later. Later. Thanks for hanging out. Take care. Uh, let's see. I'm going to make sure everybody uh, is in the description. So if, by the way, uh, all of my panelists, please, please check out their channels. You can click on their names in the description and it'll take you right to their channels and uh, you can click subscribe. Very important. You can also click on a video or two and see if they're covering subjects that you like, because uh, there's a whole lot of law out there to get covered and uh, none of us are able to cover all of it despite the ridiculous amount of hours that some of us put into it. So, uh, yeah, I can that, because I'm putting out content while my wife's driving. So <laughs> <laughs> but are you now, sure? Now YouTube is threatening my channel for the content I produce and, and I probably would have to take down. What is that? About 50 different videos. Um, because apparently covering the capital riots means somehow I'm encouraging them. I don't know. Oh, they're yeah. very, very strict that only legacy media can actually air video. I got I got a whole they had a whole I haven't, been, I haven't been airing video. I've been reading the FBI's uh you know complaints for like fifty wow. different people. Uh, I think I'm up to forty eight to be precise. And uh number nineteen apparently was taken down again for community guidelines strike. So I can't live stream for a week and you can't oh, no. upload for a week. You can't post your community tab for a week. It's bullshit. I hate that. Do you want? Do you want to come? You can't on my even stream? comment on a video for a week. Do you want to come That's on my crazy. show tonight and, and and air your grievances, air your air your anger? I don't know. I much. I I think I'd rather just sit in a total week of four sounds than come on your show. But I'll think about it. <laughs> oh, ouch! <laughs> wow. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, sorry, that was a sorry. that was meant to be more of a joke. It came off harsher. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just try to continue the rag. Seriously. But Don't you worry. Know. Kurt, it's fine. Joe's wife will hold the camera. It's Thank okay. you. Oh, okay. Thanks for the <laughs> That's what she's usually doing. So. 
<laughs> Sometimes uncivil law, while you still can, you, he's 300 away from 50K. You got to get him there before the copyright strikes take him down. <laughs> uh, okay, let me start reading these chats. And Joe, I, you just got to prepare yourself because... I am are... staying here. I want you to know something. A lot of times people duck out with those super chats. I will stay here through every single one of them because the I'm would. proud of this position. I love you, Joe. You know that. I'm sorry. We're well, good, brother. There are there are a few. Uh, oh, catch you later, Kurt. Uh, Doctrine says when Joe and his wife go for a drive, Joe buckles up and his wife straps on. <laughs> oh. Marcel DeFour says I'm with Joe on this one I always sit in the back seat playing my switch when my wife goes on a date Oh, come on uh, Greg UW says Joe is a member of the liminal order he knows Alpha uh, Radio Ruin says Cope Logic Mr. Lost 117 says this donation is for Joe to get a new car seat <laughs> Ovid says, you guys need to stop bullying Joe. He's a great guy. And if you don't stop being mean to him, he will get his wife to beat you up. Uh, Razor390 says, guys, it's okay. Joe's wife's boyfriend is driving. (laughs) Homeschool dropout says, hey, Rackets, love your work. Just caught up with Better Call Saul. Want to know what your thoughts are on the series if you've watched it. If not, what's your favorite lawyer movie that isn't My Cousin Vinny? Um, I have not actually watched Better Call Saul. Uh, I really want to. I I really love Breaking Bad, uh, but I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. My favorite lawyer movie that is not uh, My Cousin Vinny is The Counselor, which has nothing to do with being a lawyer and everything to do with being the most depressing movie I can think of. Uh, and I strongly <laughs> recommend it. Andrew Roan says, Joe is waiting in the back seat for his wife to take him to the gas station to get some milk and jewel pods. <laughs> jewel pods? The vape, uh, vape. pods. Uh, yeah. Jewel. Uh, Andrew DeAngelo says, Hey, Mr. Bronca, is it possible the defendant pulled the trigger by accident, i.e. Potter and Rust? Well, they'd have to argue that, and they're not arguing that. So they're arguing self-defense, not defensive accident. Right. And uh, I, I mean, it's always possible, but at the same time, he drew the gun and pointed it at the guy's head. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, it wouldn't really be defensive accident. It would be, you know, recklessness. Yeah, the mistake would be as if he was trying to give him like a candle or something and he accidentally grabbed his gun. I don't, I don't know. It'd, it'd be something like, here's a banana. Blam. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Uh, Why did you shoot Martin in the face? Uh, Billy Witch Doctor 99 says, so is Russ filing another frivolous lawsuit? Nope. Nope. He didn't threaten a lawsuit or anything like that. Uh, It's 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 a it's a very pleasant email. <laughs> Told me to make fun of someone else instead. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I need to find out where I left off. Oh my gosh. Uh, where was it? Sorry. Sorry, guys. I was in the middle of stuff. Um, okay. Okay. Ben Cheever says, absolutely love Bronca on these yin and yang with Nick. Ian McCarter says, couldn't you argue that you had a reasonable fear with a driver who just ran you off the road and is still confronting you? I mean, I you would can argue so. that. I would I mean, that. I mean, the truth is, if you just fear of what? It, I mean, what, what are you afraid of? In the moment you fire the shot, what are you afraid of? Not the car. Well, how close to him was he? What makes him? Let, let's, let's, try, let's, let's try and steal man this for him, assuming even he was unarmed, okay? What makes what the difference between him and Rittenhouse facing off against Jojo Rosenbaum? Well, lots of stuff. Rosenbaum had had threatened to murder him, overheard by other witnesses who testified at trial. Okay, charged him while he was fleeing, uh, grabbed for his. He was that same thing. Charged while fleeing. That's the same. No, not not. He had stopped fleeing. He had stopped. They were face to face. They weren't. He was not being pursued by someone who threatened to murder him, and he wasn't fighting him for his gun. He had adopted a boxing stance, hadn't even thrown a punch. Well, we don't even know if he adopted a boxing stance. Actually, the, the state tried to say well, worst case, that he never... Most favorable to the defense. No, he could have been lunging at him. That's more favorable to the defense. But no one's testified to the lunging. Yet. Someone has testified to the boxing stance. The one guy, Jose, didn't see the boxing stance, but other uh, another witness has testified to the boxing stance. Mm-hmm. I mean, no one's testified a... to a lunge. Oh. Yeah. I'm just saying, if he's close enough that the gun that there's all the stippling on the eye and stuff like that, it's not like he was. It's not like this was a. He was like shooting him from like 30 feet away. No, that's so, true. But 
but it doesn't work both ways. I mean, if it's a close contact like shot, close distance shot, it could be self-defense or murder, either one. If it's further than that, it would be hard to justify a self-defense because an unarmed person would be too far away to be an imminent deadly force threat. But a right, close but proximity does not exclude either. No, I, I, of course not. It depends on what he's doing while he's in close proximity. Right. But the fact that he had been chasing him and, you know, assuming you believe that, you know, he had first, you know, cussed him out. And you also know he's riled up because you, you admit you punched him. So now he's yeah. all riled, he's all riled up. So, you know, it, it could be that, you know, he tried to flee. He wasn't trying to stand his ground. They chase him down in a car. He, and then he gets out of the car and starts chasing him. It's not, I, I mean, I don't think it's like black and white that the guy has, you know, he wasn't trying to defend himself, whether he had the right to use deadly force is a different issue. And I'm not well, saying he's, point, in, I'm though. not saying it's valid yeah. self-defense. And I agree with you. That is the point as to whether or not he has the right to balance uh, to, to deadly force. I mean, Edgecombe my... absolutely had a right to defend himself. From the <clears throat> There's no question about that. The question is, did he have a right to use deadly force in self-defense? Right. And it'd be really nice if he had somebody there to testify. He yelled, fuck you, and then grabbed for the gun. Yeah, yes. that would be very helpful for yes. this case. Right. OK, but the lack of screaming F you doesn't mean that he wasn't a pot potentially threatening deadly force. So. Yeah, well, I mean, the, I'm you have to if... show the threat of the deadly force, though, right? Like you have to you can't just say that there was a threat of deadly force absent the screaming F you and reaching for the gun. In this case, Edgecombe stands to be the only person who will testify that the guy said, I'm going to kill you N word. So far, the other witnesses who were there on scene, including the witness who was literally arrested by the state and was unhappy with the state, testified he didn't hear anything. Uh, didn't right. hear any any words exchanged at all. So they've got a they've got a problem. I mean, they've got a narrative that they want to push on on that that he was yelling a threat, but they they haven't been able to show that threat yet. And I doubt they're going to, except from Edgecombe, and that's going to come. It's going to ring hollow, I think. Well, we'll see. We'll see how he stands on the stand. But I, I'm just yeah. saying that it's not it's not as if he has no defenses here. And I, I, I'm not saying that I I believe he was acting improper or using proper level of force. I'm just saying that, you know, my gut, my gut is that he probably is guilty, but yeah. we, we don't know no, that I mean, as of yet. You're exploring the defenses. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and you're, you're right. Those are the defenses that the, the defenses that we talked about, you weren't on stream at the time. Uh, Bronca and I were talking about were you know, the guy's significantly larger. I mean, he's, he's also older, which would be a sort of a mitigating thing that the state would argue, but he, he outweighs the guy by something like 60 pounds. I mean, he's a big mm -hmm. guy who's mm -hmm. coming at it or, but the, one of the questions, this is actually one of the big questions the defense has to overcome is right now, at the time of the shot, he's not coming at him. At the time of the shot, he's in a boxer stance, yeah, hasn't taken bad. a swing, that's and hasn't bad. moved forward. And and if someone goes like this, right now under American law and basically every state, if someone does this, you do not have the license to shoot them in the head. I mean, right. that, that will get you in prison uh, probably more often than not. And so you got to be you got to be really careful with that. Now, it wouldn't if take you, much more, you know, it wouldn't take much more, but it would take something more. I mean, yeah. a move forward, a yep. swing, uh, a, a two handed push. You know, people are talking about pushing him over the railing. Yeah. If he if he if he if his hands go like this and he moves in on him, uh, if he reaches for a pocket, maybe yep. something like that, you know, those types of things could trigger it. Um, and and they may have testimony on it. We just haven't seen it yet. So, uh Let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, Chris, if he stuck his hand in his pocket like he was reaching for a weapon, you know, you could argue that, well, that creates a reasonable perception that he's reaching for a weapon, right? I'm making, I'm not speculating anymore. I'm making a reasonable inference from his threatening conduct. Uh, yeah. But so far, we don't have any evidence like that. Chris Friday says, this is not the last episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> Trash Man says, could defendant argue that he had fear he would be thrown down the stairs or over the rail by the lawyer? Also, any, everyone is a bit racist in Milwaukee. Um, and we've, we've covered this. Yes, you can make these arguments. All of these arguments can be made, and uh, likely many of them will be made. The question is, does the jury believe you, and do you have any evidence to support it? Other, And this, this guy is worse situated than many other self-defense people because of the fact that he fled for six months. I mean, this whole video nonsense that they've been belaboring uh, over the course of the day, had he not fled for six months, there might've been archives available for his defense counsel to go and pursue. 
uh, for them to go say, hey, you know, we think this happened. We think that uh, a car struck our client at this place. Can we can we review your surveillance video? Oh, we don't want to give it to you. Okay, subpoena. Uh, you know, they can they can do that, but they couldn't do that because the guy fled. And, and you can't and just that speculate that someone's going to hurl you down a flight of stairs. So if you're wrestling at the top of the stairs, you might fall down. Sure. The guy threatens to shove you down the stairs. Okay, maybe. That sounds more reasonable. But the theoretical prospect that he might shove you down the stairs, absent conduct consistent with an effort to do that, that's that's just imagination. Yeah. Uh, Joe says, uh, that statute is a lot like the law here in Texas that states it's illegal to own more than six dildos. While it is illegal, there's no case law, and it is virtually impossible to enforce. Great stream. Do you need more than six? Does anybody need more than six? Do we need a 28th Amendment? Uh, Caden Culp says, whatever you do, Nick, don't look up Dan Abrams' early life section on Wikipedia. Nothing to find there. Oh, it's got to be changed by now. I mean, that whatever, whatever happened <laughs> on uh, Wikipedia for Dan Abrams has got to be changed. Why? What's by his now? backstory this, that, that has? Well, this is just way to earlier in the. Uh, in the say, yeah, in the thing, there's there's nothing. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I assume there was an edit made that is no longer there. Um, Birdbath Bash says, does a shot to the face legally suggest anything? Seems like an indication of hatred, aggression, etc., rather than defensive intent. Um, I, I don't think so. No, absent some other evidence consistent with that. I mean, somebody could wait until the last moment to fire the shot at somebody lunging at them because they're hoping they won't actually have to shoot the person and you end up with a, a close distance shot to the face. It's, it's perfectly lawful self-defense. It could be either way. All right, next. Uh, question mark says federal employees are legally required to report knowledge of any crime. I that mean, could be. so we, we were talking about whether or not there's a generalized legal duty to report a crime or provide care to someone who's in distress. There's not a generalized legal duty under American law. Now, there may be very specific niches where that duty exists, depending on your profession or your job or uh, other cir almost certainly not criminal. Uh, liability type requirements, but maybe civil or professional licensing or conditions of the job. Sure. But those are niche instances. It's not a generalized legal duty that would apply to the general public. Uh, right. And, and there could be professional obligations that have nothing to do with legality, but could have everything. You can be fired. You could be maybe sanctioned or disciplined within your within your uh, profession, things like that, that do not amount to criminal liability. The Steel Curtain, welcome to Paralegal Status. Chris Friday says, what lawyer gets to live stream your trial with law and crime? Will they use a law and crime stream? Brooks Neal says, question, in this case, using the N-word is irrelevant, right? Makes for a good story, but do words allow you to assault someone? Words do not allow you to assault someone. However, words could, you know, those specific inflammatory words could provide some sort of basis for establishing your fear, right? Or adequate if, uh, provocation, heat of passion for a mitigation to manslaughter. And uh, if, if for example, like you don't, you don't understand how uh, calling someone an N word while, while chasing them hypothetically would make them feel uh, a, an elevated level of fear. If a white guy is being chased by a, a young black man or a group of black men and they're yelling, we're going to kill you cracker or honky or whatever, um, does that elevate the amount of fear that they, they would face? If they're using a racial epithet, uh, then typically people would suggest that, that maybe there's a, an extra animus there. But um, it's also just persuasive for the jury. I mean, that's, that's why it's in there. They're, they're hoping the jury is sympathetic to the fact, uh, to, to some racial, racial narrative, right? Like that's the idea. One juror is all they need to go, oh, wait, no, this whole thing is racist. I'm not, I'm going to say not guilty. And then they get a mistrial and that's, you know, that's, that's a win. Stuff and things says Jack stuffed six in at one time and then pulls them out tied together like a magician. Some need more than six. That's horrifying. Uh, Taco the turtle says, Nick, can you say hello to Mr. Runkle for me? Thanks. Yes. Runkle. Hello from Taco the turtle. Hey, hello, Runkle. Mr. Turtle. <laughs> Uh, wrestler town says if Dan Abrams wants your numbers, nothing is stopping him from commenting on live streams using a horny Kermit impression. It's very true. Ah, <laughs> uh, that is very true. He could also diddle my green space. 
Uh, Andrew Clark says, I loved to see this duo guest on EFAP, please. Uh, I'm, just Billy gonna Witch- say, I'm just going to say, you, you just proved that they're turning the frogs gay, gay because that was, <laughs> that was just horrifying. Well, they, they have been. Billy Witch Doctor 99 says, but what if there's Vic news? Oh, what, tonight? I guess uh, that would that would maybe take over. We'll see. Mr. Steve VC says, is law and crime same as court TV? Nope. They're completely different entities. Although, are, are you asking, is their footage the same as court TV? It's shockingly similar on all of these trials that I've been covering. Isn't that weird? Uh, Cynthia says, considering paying for your nanny to help Lady Rackets to put your kids down, starting the show at midnight Eastern time flipping kills me. Sorry. It's, it's, it's where I've been. It's probably where I'm going to be for a long time. Cause it's, that's, uh, that's where it is. And other people have other shows that I don't want to mess with. Pinking five, five, four says if they didn't want anyone streaming the trial, then don't allow a TV station to show the trial live. I thought video from the courtroom was an open domain and free for anyone to use law and crime is offering it for free. Not necessarily, but they're like in the Potter case, the, the Potter judge specifically said no particular entity will own a copyright interest in this. You're, you're basically by participating in filming this trial, you're disclaiming your copyright interest. And uh, Channel 3000 has listed all of theirs as Creative Commons licenses for uh, open for use and replay by others. So um, Law and Crime has, again, I think made material misstatements uh, or misrepresentations in their letter. And um, my lawyer's letter calls them out on it. So we'll see. I got to finish reading it, though. Mike says, I watch daily from an hour or two behind on one and a half to two X speed. When it catches up, you all, all sound so stupid. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> Mr. Hellspawn says, I'm 6'7", 275 pounds. When I attack someone, is it deadly force? When I break their thumb slash knee, is that considered great bodily harm? The second part, yes. Breaking a limb, uh, shattering a joint or something like that. Great bodily harm. Yes. Or Well, serious bodily injury. Uh Probably the same as great bodily harm. Depends on how the states use it. Um, as When you attack someone, is it deadly force? Maybe. I don't know. If, Who's the other person? Punk, are you punching them in the chest? Uh, are you are you kicking them in the back? I mean, what what type of attack is it? These. I mean, if you poke them in the chest with your finger, you're committing a criminal battery. Is that a deadly threat to them? Yeah. Uh, Alan Powell, the real AP says, have you heard about Mersh from revenge of the sis releasing revenge porn on a girl because she made out with, but wouldn't sleep with him. Uh, I have not actually, I saw like him respond to something about that, but no, I have not seen the rest of it. Um, conceived aces says it was claimed he was in trouble for the worst crime you could do in the eyes of the state, not paying taxes. Mm -hmm. They'll actually work hard for that. Kyle Seller says, in general, an employer can't ask what prescription you take. So how can they ask if you have a vaccine? Um, are you sure they can't ask what prescription they you take in general? I'm, I'm not positive that they can't. Unless there's a specific law about prescription jar- drugs, because uh, that might Im- implicate some ADA thing. Because if your prescription drug is for some mental condition that would protect you under the Americans with Disability Act. And I know everybody wants to say about the ADA on the vaccine, and, and maybe there's an argument there, although no one successfully made it so far. But uh, getting, getting the vaccine isn't an ADA issue. Uh, in the same way that taking, for example, uh, Xanax for anxiety might be an ADA issue. So um, the, there may be specific carve outs there, but I, I don't know that it's generally illegal. Uh, epilepsy that, yeah, there's another one, stuff like that. Uh, it's a small girl says I just did a quick search and many others are live streaming Chandler Halderson using law and crime stream. Are they sending all those streamers cease and desist? Uh, I doubt it. Catherine Ruck says, uh, Hey Nick, just wanted to share. My fifth grader told me he wanted to build robots for NASA. And in the same sentence, he said, or I'd like to be a lawyer. Please steer him to the first robots. Robots. (laughs) We need robots more than we need more lawyers. Trust me for NASA, maybe or Boston dynamics there. I think they're the ones making the cool ass robots right now. Uh, Or dollhouse Phil MK EOD says, did you see Nick Fuentes got subpoenaed by the January 6th committee? Can't fly there because he's on the no fly list. Political intimidation of a private citizen, but it's Nick Fuentes. Not right, but still funny. Meow. <laughs> it is funny, but it's it's not right. And again, I 
I don't share a ton of views with Nick Fuentes, uh, but what they what they did to him with that no fly list is is pretty insane. Do we um, know that it, that and, actually happened though? Uh, I don't know if it's been confirmed or not. I'm taking him at his word. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it didn't, but maybe, I don't have any did. particular reason to disbelieve him. I, so, I know some people raised the question whether or not it was. The yeah. And, uh, it might not be, but, but until I see some, some evidence to the contrary, you know, then, then, uh, I'll, I'll roll with it. Uh, right. I think I know his, I know he's had issues with bank accounts and he's been canceled all over the place. And I think that's bullshit too. So if, it, if anything, nothing like that should happen. We're all on the same page. With that. Nothing right. like that should happen. Yeah. Um, Stefan Moore says if an intruder is fleeing, but still in your home is deadly force allowed. I'm in Colorado, which I believe is stand your ground, but just curious. Every state is stand your ground. If stand your ground is properly understood as being relieved of an otherwise existing duty to retreat when you're in your castle. Uh, before you can use deadly force, someone has to be a deadly force threat or some statutory equivalent like committing a forcible felony or kidnapping or a rape attempt. If they're not a threat to persons, there's not going to be a justification for using deadly force against them outside, of course, of Texas and its weird uh, deadly force and defensive property statute. And again, that 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 Texas statute exists for now, but the the idea that it will exist in your case is always up in the air. Always. Um, I, I why would, be, would you want to shoot them if they're running away? That's a win already. I mean, you won that fight. They're running away. A uh, little darker says what Nick said on law nerd clips is absolute fire. Loving it. Very cool. I assume it's one of my rants from last night. A uh, new dislike button says you named Uberim and Kane, but not the man that sent them to the shadow realm. Francis Naganu, hardest punch on the planet fighting this Saturday. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, haven't actually watched it. I haven't watched UFC in a long time. And the last time I was watching it, you know, Overeem was knocking people out. <laughs> so it's been a while. Uh, Clumsy Clairvoyant says, your argument is reminding me of Binger's closing. I'm not here. I don't remember what argument that was. I'm not here, says, what about the argument that if he's knocked unconscious, he's not in control of his gun? But he's not. not okay, I now know what this is talking about. He's not knocked unconscious yet. You can't assume that because someone squares up to you, you're going to get knocked unconscious. You might get knocked unconscious, but you don't have justification for deadly force until the deadly force threat manifests. So if you walk up and someone else is getting knocked unconscious and a guy's grabbing for their gun, then yeah, you, you may have justification to shoot them uh, as a defense of others sort of thing. But, but again, until that deadly force manifests, if you employ deadly force prior to that, you risk going to prison. Now, maybe it's a better choice to risk going to prison than to die. That's a decision you have to make. You just have to know the potential legal consequences. Make of an that informed action. decision. That's all. I, I don't tell people what to do. So I'm not telling you not. You want to shoot someone who's throwing a punch at you. That's up to you. And if you need a legal defense, uh, you know, consult, let me know. But uh, I'm just telling you that it's not a winning legal strategy and make an informed decision. Dougie says, love the streams, make my work easier. I'm just curious how you think he was hit in the face to make the car so messy. Can't wait to see the report. Well, we're, we're getting it from the medical examiner now that he was punched hard enough to cause bruising and swelling and some lacerations, maybe from the glasses. Uh, so if, if he got punched, think of it this way, he gets punched in the face from this side. He goes, ah, like that. And then he, you know, grabs his face where his glasses cut him, puts his hand on the door, door frame. Now you've got a blood smear on the door and window where we saw it in the pictures. That that explains all of that very quickly. We also know that he had blood uh, allegedly on his hands after he's died. And maybe that blood is from holding his head after getting punched rather than getting shot in the face. So those are the those are probably where that's coming from. And you get a lot of blood from a, a head or face injury. Yes. Bleeds, bleeds a lot. Koi540 says, have you formulated an opinion on the filibuster in the Senate? If so, what is it? Um, wait, on removing the filibuster? I think removing the filibuster is a terrible idea. It, it's always been a terrible idea. Just leave the Senate rules where they are, um, in, in my opinion. If you, if you don't have 60 votes, then maybe maybe we don't need to pass the thing. This has always been uh, Removing the filibuster basically... Is, is an argument to basically say that we should just ignore that's basically ignoring the fact that Republicans is becoming democracy. That's right. essentially, that's what it does. Cause it says you don't have to worry about the minority at all. 
if you it's a it's a step closer that's for sure and and we're all re- i i want to go back to the senate the way it was personally i'm tired of popularly elected senators yep. but get rid of that uh, what is it 17th amendment yeah uh lindsey says law and crime is for comatose patients ricada law is for everyone else idaho plumber says what if someone is punching and kicking your car happens with semi-frequency on some of our job sites can we legally do anything about it uh you can't shoot them it's just a um, car i mean you mean first of all if you're not in the car it's somebody simply beating up your personal property so that's non-deadly force again except for someone took offense when i described the texas law as weird uh it's unusual does that make you feel better Uh, Texas Penal Code 9.42 allows for the use of deadly force in defense of property. If it's an occupied vehicle and they're beating on your car, the question becomes, do you have a reasonable perception that they're about to breach that vehicle? If if you do, in many states, it's treated much as if they were breaching your home. Yeah. uh, Some states also have some defensive property that may allow you to use non-deadly force in defense of the property the question is if someone is is sitting there punching kicking you know damaging your car do you want to physically go confront them um and and put yourself into that zone of danger because you know someone who's bashing a car with their hands and feet might not be stable and you might be in more danger than you think so yeah uh, but you got to check you think you're getting into a non-deadly force fight doesn't mean the other guy thinks it's a non-deadly force fight like here in this case yeah, I, I don't know what the random audio tones are coming from. Um, I, I hear them from time to time, like a little burnt. I, I don't know. I, I don't think they're coming from me because I have all notifications and stuff turned off, but they could be could be one of the other panelists. I have no idea. Uh, let's see. It's probably Joe. Um, Stephen Oglesby says, <laughs> why didn't the defense test the knife or the jeans if they thought there was evidence to help them? It's a good question. The defense could have requested. Well, again, their client fled for six months. All of this preliminary investigation would have been done or could have been requested by the defense a long time ago. But now, you know, that stuff's been sitting around or handled or shuffled through various things. And if they tested, if they tested the knife now, you know, it's been sitting in an evidence bag. Well, did the, did the fingerprint that might've been on it deteriorate? Did it rub off as it was being handled? Uh, you know, all of that stuff are, are questions. So, they could have tried, but it's been so long since since this event because their client fled that, you know, it'd, it'd be hard to say what would happen now. And and they may not want that answer. That's no. the other thing. What is are they going to test the pockets for blood? I mean, the pockets are white cloth. There's clearly no blood on them. So don't test and get a negative result. Well, right. and let's say you find the accused fingerprints on that knife. That's <laughs> that'd be a hell of a thing. Right. Well, I think that would help them because if, if the accused fingerprints were on the knife, yeah, like then the knife blade or something, the knife was in play then. Yeah. But, well, but unless it's the accused, you know, then you run into suggestions that the accused might have put it there or something like that. Oh, sure. Oh, well, the, 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 yeah. If it's, if the, whoever owns that knife, their DNA is all over it. Their, their skin right. flakes and crap is, is all over it. You carry a knife in your pocket for any length of time, that's what it looks like. The uh, but the the issue. Remember, the defense does not have to prove much of anything. The state has to prove everything. So it, uh, sometimes, if the defense are, is to research something, um, you know, beyond what the state is willing to research, they're going to get an answer they don't want. And if the answer is just that guy's DNA and fingerprints are all over that knife, and the wife's aren't, you can't raise the specter that the wife grabbed it, or you, you're going to have a lot of harder time raising the specter. It's probably in their interest to not find out the answer and just say, well, the the wife could have put it in his pocket when it was in his hand. How would we know? You didn't test it. Blame the state. Always blame the state. Um, Random username says dozens of people were beat to death by BLM. You have no idea that if you lose a fist fight, that the attacker will stop with you alive. It's deadly. It can be deadly, but dozens of people... Dozens of people being beat to death by a mob of angry people is is very different than one on one fights that occur all the time with with effectively zero deaths. Uh, there there's there's a whole lot of variance between these scenarios, and it it depends. If you come into reasonable fear, then you are justified. I mean, that's that's it. And to and to and that point actually goes back to what I was saying earlier. I was saying, am I steel steel manning this argument on behalf of the defense? Where I was trying to find the distinctions between this scenario and Jojo Rosenbaum going after Kyle. 
the fact is it's not just Jojo that Kyle has to be worried about, but that if Jojo actually tackles him, this could become like this melee where he ends up getting stomped to death by a crowd. And the, cr- the crowd there is a very important factor as opposed to one-on-one. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, if you're being, if, if there's a guy swinging at you and you're surrounded by eight people, I mean, that's, yeah, you, you're in a way different scenario. Uh, and, and that, that's it. But you, you have to have the reasonable fear. Maybe you do, maybe one-on-one you have a reasonable fear. You just have to be able to articulate it. Cause that's what you're going to be arguing. Yeah. There are barehanded attacks that would qualify as deadly force attacks against which deadly defensive force would be justified. There are barehanded attacks that do not qualify as deadly force attacks. These are two different things. And before you can lawfully go to deadly force and self-defense, you have to make sure that you have a reasonable perception that the particular barehanded attack you're facing would fall into the deadly force bucket. Otherwise, your use of deadly defensive force is not proportional and not legal. Kevin speaks on it, says, how's Ty? Any idea? I think he's doing okay right now. He had, uh, I believe he had a bout with COVID, uh, but I think he's doing okay. Edgecomb's flight is a big issue. Correct. Koi 540 says, I was told this was a law and crime stream. I wanted something to put on to nap to, but all I'm seeing is content too interesting to <laughs> fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> Zalas says, could they argue that he could have been pushed over? Uh, pushed or hit over the rail following to his death. Keep up the awesome shows. I mean, you can argue it, but the, at this point it's pure speculation until they have some evidence that it might've occurred. Evie Warner says, I think Emily Baker should do a video on law and crime. Um, instructor Mike says, I really wish I could be part of this panel. Well, Mike, maybe we'll do a, a self-defense panel at, at some point in the future and, and just talk about it, you know, out, outside of the context of this particular case. Cause, uh, there's a lot to talk about with this stuff. And, and I think I've got your email so we can, we can set that up. Uh, X name X five thirty says people overlook a single fact can change everything. So far, the facts don't support the self-defense claim, but it could easily change entirely. Goon actual says, if you have surgeries from joint reconstruction and can show that you can't effectively fight back hand to hand, does that change the standards of lethal force? Sure. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Right. If it makes you exceptionally vulnerable. So, uh, uh, an attack you can't that run might away. be right, non-deadly force to a, against a, a healthy 20-year-old might be a deadly force attack, one likely to cause death or serious bodily injury to someone who has some intrinsic uh, weakness or vulnerability. It's an interesting it's, thing because it's almost like an eggshell skull potential victim. Right. That you, you are a potential eggshell skull victim. Well, the, the difference is with the eggshell skull doctrine, it applies to the person who's using the force, what their liability is. What I'm talking about is the justification for the person against whom the force is being used. But but the example, I I understand the distinction. That's why I was saying it's interesting because it sort of draws from that. You're saying someone who's uniquely vulnerable, much as someone who is an actual victim in a personal injury case. So so there's an eggshell skull theory which says, well, even though a normal person would have gotten hurt that badly, he happens to have an eggshell skull. He's going, you have to pay whatever damages result from that. Similarly, we're saying here that that the a, a potential victim who's defending himself from someone can use their own eggshell, their Mr. Glass status as a basis to engage in deadly force where other people who are not Mr. Glass would not have that justification. Right. I mean, the fundamental yeah. question is always the same. It's, is the threat coming at me one likely to cause death or serious bodily injury for my particular circumstances? And those circumstances can be different for different people, depending on infirmity or age or physical strength or, uh, all, all kinds of factors. But that's still the core question that has to be answered in the affirmative before you're privileged to use deadly force in self-defense. Mm. Yep. Uh, what, what if and... your nose makes potentially ripe target, like like for, to get hit in the face and like cause serious bodily harm? Sounds that, more like you... a tactical concern. Uh, okay. You just turn back and forth quickly and you defeat them. <laughs> uh, your nose tight. <laughs> this guy says, why is this guy on trial? He shot a lawyer, not a person. Avahine says, until they have a DNA guy talk about the semen found at the scene, I remain unconvinced that a murder occurred. I'm with that one. <laughs> Full Disadulation says, Justin, Law and Order is planning an exciting new format for live trials with opinions from Rick Nikita Law, Beagle Lights, Bra- uh, Bandrew Anka, Bunkle of the Rayleigh, M- Meagle Line Set, <laughs> and Civil Unlaw with Bert and more. Nice. Uh, Lee Nichol- Nicholas says the latent evidence witness Alpha Giga Patch is giving me vibes that his parents still lay his clothes out for him every morning. 
AJ Potts, welcome to Lawyer Status. Bear Business One says, what did you see? I don't understand. Sorry, that was a bad question. Avahine says, didn't this guy shoot some dude over a mattress? <laughs> <laughs> Shane G says, someone with the surname Abrams is litigious. I'm shocked. Lee Nicholas says, Don Corleone's illegitimate step-grandson-in-law. Jeff S. says, hey, Nick, I've been, been here since around episode 10 of the Maddox lawsuit. Love that you continue to be yourself no matter what. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Ranjikar Patel says, sir, I come from India. I learned so much English from you. Vishnu bless you, sir. You are great men, big nose, but you have great body. Please make Hindi show for family. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love you most says verdict is in on Halderson. Andrew D'Angelo says bowl cut. Cindy, uh, Cindy Lou hoot says, God, I love this masculine court. Joel Reese says you piss off mobster judge. You get whacked. Uh, Pjorn, Pjorn Kraxark says, I bet she ID'd yourself as an investigator and the witness is confused. Uh, Darren Haviland says, are the defense counsels public defenders? Nope, they're private attorneys. UNSCF forward unto dawn says, could the defense lawyers be going to prison with the defendant over this? No. Fair Frozen 55 says, judge, counsel, you have five seconds before I blow your case down with no survivors. Racks gavel. Charlie Eckert <laughs> says, uh, defense screws the whole animal shelter. Five Bear says, if you're in the woods for a hike, have a concealed carry and no other witnesses besides yourself and the attacker. If you need to defend yourself, what should you do? Immediately call the cops after after and tell what happened? I mean, I, I guess. I mean, <laughs> it's up to you, right? But if you don't, you look a lot like Edgecombe if they catch you, up with you, right? Yeah. Or, uh, or there's a game camera that captures the license plate of your car coming out of the woods and they track you down to your house and find the gun and the, the, the rifling matches up to the bullet they find in the victim. Now, what's your story look like? Oh, I know. I know what the answer to this is, actually. So what you do is you um, you get your lawyer to cover for you and then you flee to a park where you end up dead in Florida. And your name is Brian Laundry. Case closed. Mm. Boom. But no, you. Uh, yeah. You. I mean, if you leave someone out in the woods in a state park that you defended yourself from, and that's a roll of the dice, man. But it's a different roll of the dice calling the police. So uh, the legal advice would be to obviously inform the third, uh, the authorities, assert your self-defense with competent counsel. Um, what you do is up to you. Uh, Charlie Eckert says, defense screws the whole animal shelter. Oh, I just read that one. DCV Titan says, this is what happened when you hire activists. Uh, Lee Nicholas says they should have slowly panned the camera to Edgecombe to be to the paralegal. All the people here with paralegal status should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> Al Fiver says, imagine traveling the country for six months on a quest to find legal representation. And this is the defense you wind up with. <laughs> <laughs> Spidley says sciatica, heart stent, gout and bursitis getting frail. I'm not winning fights now. My default mindset now is to shoot. Do my conditions justify deadly force if a young man intends to beat me? Depends on the young man, but very possibly, yeah. Uh, Nancy Dugan says, oh, come on, she identifies as a cop. Senshi Roll says, did Chandler provide the court a recipe for his parents as a proposal for lunch on verdict day? Perhaps the steak sandwiches would have helped him. E Echo Sophist says, did Edgecombe have a concealed carry permit or otherwise lawfully carrying? Anyone know? He was unlawfully carrying. Ben uh, Bert Bert says, uh, Bert Bert says McDougal versus Ventura County in the ninth circuit major second amendment win is ninth circuit uses strict scrutiny. So I'll have to check up on that. That sounds very interesting. Cody says drink nose long time listener. First time caller uh, snowboard. Dan says this area in Milwaukee as is college kid hangout area at all the local bars. I'm sure all these people were drunk. Bean sprout says a toast to my grandpa. He's recovering from lung cancer and the coof just got home from the hospital. Not sure for how long, but he's 88 and one stubborn son of a bitch. All right, just a second. Let me get, I'll get a little more liquor so I can do that. Uh, do. All right. Bean sprout to your grandpa who is surviving uh, a couple different afflictions at a ripe old age. May we all live to be so ancient that we get to be stubborn sons of bitches someday. Carry on, sir. Cheers. Amen. Hmm. Uh, Bielkum says, I found Ricada Law during the Rittenhouse trial. I was hooked. I'm not a lawyer, have no interest in law in general, but now I watch trials with Ricada Law and the gang for fun. Love the channel. Hey, thank you. 
Corpus Delecti says, Canabro did nothing wrong. Hashtag free the recipe. Also, Cluck and Crying is run by a bunch of smooth-brained wee tods. Eric Wolfric says, notice the clear difference in demeanor with certain witnesses on cross. Sam Walther says, my New Year's resolution was to quit drinking during work. Thanks to your influence. When I told this to my wife, she said, I doubt it. <laughs> Screw <laughs> law and crime. Uh, 2D Harem King Jack says, here's to T-Pain Nikki auto-tune the night away. Neighbor 605 says, release the toenail cheese of Chandler's parents. Gross. Shroom Dukem, thank you. Welcome to paralegal status. Same with Sydney Moore. 200 Watt Studio says, this is something only seen on Nick's channel, probably. Law and crime, probably cut to the commercial when the black cop testifies. Not applicable says, at Joe's age, I hope my wife drives me around too. <laughs> Snowboard Dan says, <laughs> Joe's woman is driving right now. Mechanical Fluff says, Bronca, thank you. Jokes you never expect to hear coming from this place. <laughs> Versi says backseat logic, uh, not applicable. Says Joe, you're a thousand. Driving is actually cool in 2022. Nabor says uh, Joe drives a car like a tricycle with training wheels. Matt from Tinder says my services are always available. Mike P229 says, does Joe slide over to the middle of the bench seat so she can put her arm around him? <laughs> Snowboard Dan says, Joe's the guy who sits in the back smoking Virginia Slims with heels up as his wife drives smoking Marlboro Reds, no filter. Uh, not applicable says Morgan Freeman uses Grinder, not Tinder. Rays says, uh, heart Joe, even if he is a beta, at least he doesn't get spit roasted by Matt from Tinder and his old lady wearing a strap on, I hope. I Daily just dose. got I just got roasted by Matt from Tinder like two tweets ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's very true. Daily Dose says Joe rides in the back, his wife in driver's seat, and her boyfriend in shotgun. Thanks for the next stream. Law and crime can ride with Joe in the back. Uh, 200 Watt Studio says Joe, you can have my liminal order membership. It's got a year left. I never used it. Uh, <laughs> not applicable says they haven't let Jews on Grinder since John Lovitz. Uh, I'm dumb, but I'm not, but ain't that dumb, says Cultivating Erotic Energy from the Back Seat by Joe Nearman. 200 Watt Studios' <laughs> new movie, Driving Miss Good Logic. Uh, Karen took the kid, says, I hope Bronca's knowledge of self defense is as good as it seems. He's going to need it when Joe gets his house swatted. <laughs> <laughs> not applicable, says, You know why they call him Joe Nearman for two reasons. Greg UW says, Joe doesn't do work on certain days, which is when she drives and he's on all fours. A holy, holy man. Oh, my goodness. Matt from Tinder says, what happens in my mom's basement stays in my mom's basement. Uh, I'm dumb, but I ain't that dumb. Says, Joe's Twitter. Some of you guys are okay. Don't come on stream tomorrow. <laughs> Cynthia Cotney, thank you for the donation. 200 Watt Studios says, Joe, Legal Eagle knows how to drive. Ooh. Ooh, that's brutal. Do people actually think that, like, I don't know how to drive? Is that really what you take from that? I'm like, all right. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, 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 like, we got to have this out right now, okay? All four of us. I want to have There's it out. There's a whole bunch of these left. Do you want to wait till they're done roasting you before we have it out? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm, simply, I'm simply making the point. I don't understand why. Like, if I'm driving, if I'm driving from, like, Florida to, to New Jersey, okay, you think I'm not going to, like, tell them, hey, I'd rather, I know I'm going to end up having to cover 400 miles, five, the last four or 500 miles on my own. I'm wearing the pants on this trip. It's like, oh, so really, Andrew, you want to drive the whole damn 900 miles there? Really? Or let me ask you this. You're driving into the city. It's basically stop and go the entire time. You can either, you can either like hang out and chill out on social media or drive. Which do you prefer to do? I moved out of the city. Okay, but okay, but that's not. The, <laughs> so you want to change the hypothetical, but I'm saying just dealing with reality. The choice is, I'm saying I think you're crazy if you say, "Oh, well, I'm a man, I've got to drive." That's like the 1950s. Like I'm a man, I'm the only. You're not going to get a job. What? What is that? Yeah, I, I agree that? with you, Joe. We really got to get rid of this toxic masculinity stuff. Um, it's what, not toxic masculinity. It's look, insecurity. I'm just, I'm just asking what pronouns are in your bio at this point. I, I, I hear, I hear where you're coming from. There, I'm simply saying I think I think you're insecure that you're like, oh, I. I who would rather drive than just like sort of then hang on social media? Tell me. I feel, I feel like Joe's getting pretty defensive about his Mary Kay car. <laughs> I'm just asking you. I'm being, I, I'm able to be real. Look, I understand. I understand some people. They can't, they, they're like, they, they won't admit that they'd, they, they'd rather, you know, kick, kick their heels up on the dashboard and instead of actually like sitting there, like going and stop and go traffic, I can. Are these high heels? Or... I'm not. Yeah. I need, why did you? I... 
Why did you just text me about how much you love your Subaru Forester? It's weird. What is a Subaru Forest? Oh, God. <laughs> okay, lesbian. Mo, Mo Jorison says, Joe, you missed a couple messages directed at you. Scroll up for about an hour to see him. Versi <laughs> says, but would he let Jack Murphy drive? Love you, Joe. Lol. I'm dumb, but I ain't that dumb. Says Joe would let his <laughs> Joe would let his wife's son drive. Greg UW says, enough grilling, Joe. Can you give a TLDR for new viewers on why the prosecution is going hard at this popo? What's the basics of this case? Uh, the prosecution didn't really go hard at anyone on this one. The defense, the defense did a little bit, uh, but not too bad on the police. Um, he just said, oh, thank you for your hard work or whatever. It was very snarky and probably didn't look great in front of a jury, to be honest. But uh, n yeah, but they're they're trying to show that the state is engaged in a conspiracy against their client. I mean, that's that's part of their theory of the case. And it's. Yep. I think it's a very risky move that they're not pulling off well. Not uh, applicable I mean, what else says they got. Yeah, that's true. Uh, not applicable says, did you drive when Abraham took you to Mount Moriah? Uh, not applicable says, all in good fun, buddy. Love you, Joe. Uh, Sam Chadwick says, judgmental. Google user says, leave Joe alone. He is worried about his abnormal menstruation cycle this month. <laughs> Craig UW says, in Wisconsin accent. Mr. Ricada Law, isn't it racism that causes your support of defendant Kyle and conversely your position against Mr. Edgecomb? Uh, yes. Cheryl Photo says, that lawyer's bald spot looks like a yarmulke. Kingslayer Damocles says, you're not one of Robin Hood's merry men. Fix your hair, Friar Tuck. Zareb says, my friend's dad just got denied a kidney transplant they have waited for for years because of apparently they said he tested positive for COVID. Oh, my God. Josh B., thanks for the donation. Patrick Allen says, are the random odd audio tones way away for the stream owner to claim copyright? No, they're, they're coming from somewhere on the panel. I just don't know where. And it's not usually worth investigating because it probably won't be here next time. Mandalore Wise says, O1, O1 says, Joe, I'd always drive just because next to no one I know, especially in my age bracket, knows uh, how to drive stick. So there you go. Uh, Is that a thing? Some people really don't know how to drive stick. Oh, yeah. lots of people don't know how to drive stick. Yeah. It's becoming less and less, uh, you know, less and less people know how to drive stick. Especially you have because to work to find a stick car these days. Yeah. And the ones you do find, they have, they have the, where the clutch is done for you electronically, right? Like you, you've got either paddle shifters or you've got the plus minus manual transmission. Uh, that's, that's added in there. You don't have to do anything now. That's I mean, not really driving stick. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's that's what they got. Uh, Cameron Nelson says, when you're getting crushed in your case, does counsel just lean over and say you're going to prison? <laughs> <laughs> the end is near. Beware says, Clearman wasn't attacking. He was catching Pokemon. Uh, okay, we're getting close to the end here. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, my gosh. Uh, 200 Watt Studio says, I'm smart. I can do things, Mike. Good logic. Uh, 200 watt studio says Joe married his wife, not because of her looks, but because she's an Uber driver. <laughs> Google user says Joe is waiting in his car for his weekly colonoscopy appointment. That is voluntary. Don gamer guy says, Joe, get your wife to drive better lighting, drive to better lighting. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Jennifer Gunter, uh, Genter says, uh, Runkle, my brother-in-law is Canadian and cannot go home to see family. It is also sad that my brother-in-law is Canadian. <laughs> MD says, please, your opinion on Satario Natividad's shooting. Is that the, uh, I just looked at a shooting in Vegas. Is that the shooting in Vegas? Officer involved, completely justified. Guy has a knife. He's about 12 feet away from the officer and running towards him. Uh, the officer also backed up for 80 feet prior to this happening. Um, it was the first officer involved shooting in Vegas. It happened about nine days ago. Uh, mm. I don't know if that's it. If that's the one, then uh, completely justified. Uh, like 100%. Brian Miller says, is this the same doctor from the Kim Potter trial? I don't think so. I don't know why he would be the doctor from the Kim Potter trial. People were saying Rittenhouse. I mean, I watched so many of these trials. Those details get mixed up after a while, but... 
He's definitely familiar. I've seen him in another trial for sure. Yeah, people are saying he was day seven of Rittenhouse, so we can actually check the day on that one. And people were saying yes, but I, I don't think he was in Kim Potter. Uh, it doesn't make it wouldn't make much sense for him to be in Kim Potter because he's in Wisconsin, she's in Minnesota. Not Heisenberg says at four to five feet of range with hands up, ready to fight. Wouldn't the shooter be on the ground before he had time to pull the trigger? Not necessarily. I mean, maybe instructor Mike says, man, I wish I could come on. Love your show. Uh, Mike, we'll, we'll make it happen. We will, man. Contrarian 420 says rackets. Cormac McCarthy screenplay of the counselor is on audible. Must listen. Also blood Meridian plus Sutri by Cormac on audible. Must listen. Picking, pinking 554 says they can ask you if any of the medication you take will affect your work, uh, like making you drowsy or some side effects that can cause a danger to others. Uh, oh, yeah, that's in response to the what medications can they ask about. Uh, Nicholas R Nichols Ruger says, I need a ride. Can Joe use his alpha energy to have his wife come pick me up? Andrew Simmons says, it was my understanding in Missouri that you could shoot trespassers. Is that super wrong and I'm crazy? <laughs> uh, it's super wrong now. If it wasn't in the past, that's a different story. But now it is definitely, you cannot just shoot someone for trespass in any state. Um, Garrett uh, Pederick says, plot twist, Chandler hired the attorney to kill the parents, then hired Edgecombe as cleanup. Hashtag law and crime sucks. Patrick Allen says, got a feeling Twitter is bringing many tears to law and crime today. Vernon Copeland says, why is good logic in a trunk? Come on, Ricketts, let him out. <laughs> uh, Gregory says, the difference between U.S. law and ours in Malta is massive. Here, use of for deadly force requires imminent threat to human life, not fear of life or limb. Uh, Dixie Normus says, as a Burton, uh, oh, Al Burton, I guess. Shout out to Runkle. Thanks for all your work. Uh, Battle Override 856 says the quartering sent me. Doctrine says somebody take the shovel away from Joe. <laughs> Nancy Duggan says leave Joe. Love Joe. Love Joe. Taking my likes away from the rest of you. Thank Morgan you. Babcock That's says, right. You all Morgan should lose ba your damn likes. <laughs> Morgan Babcock says I don't trust no woman's driving for good reason. My skull got cracked open from my mother's driving when I was four. 200 Watt Studio says you won't get this kind of roasting on law and crime. Mars R 1970 says time to stop piling on Joe. He's got enough of that from his wife. Yeah. Hashtag love to, love to Joe. Boyfriend. There we go. <laughs> Justin Wright says more than half of the semi trucks are automatic. Now I'm currently stuck in one. They are horrible. Are. JK Wynn says, can you ask Joe to turn off notifications or bring the snacks to Matt? <laughs> 200 Watt Studio says, Joe bought a new car but replaced the leather bucket seats with silicone seats ribbed for his pleasure. Doctrine says, Joe, in all seriousness, respect to you for enduring the chat. The hottest fire makes the strongest steel, and chat was set to maximum roast today. General says, Dr. Douglas Kelly, a forensic pathologist with the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, testifies in Kyle Rittenhouse's trial. 200 Watt Studio says, Joe, please take the jokes in the good nature they were meant. Love you, man. And Skeleton says, which Chandler parents had it worse the the cannibal cutter parents or chris chan's mom honestly it's a toss-up in my opinion oh my god uh and then there's just a couple on odyssey almost almost done here uh <laughs> silver rock says nick can you take a drink for my family they recently passed on after being eaten by my brother he didn't share and it was sad <laughs> great us says more voters believe that trump was legitimately elected oh fuck this oh in 2016 then believe uh okay I'm, i can't i can't read this one i can't read this one uh because it contains something that youtube would would potentially consider misinformation even uh despite the the survey statistics i can't read it so, unfortunately sorry uh great us says based on his triple digit bmi comment andrew bronca might enjoy this 90 second video clip uh, I'm not going to play anything else. we got to wrap up. American Legend says, I echo the sentiment. Love the work you do. Uh, makes work more tolerable. Tolerable, lonely IT guy. Thank you. Uh, Del Frickin' Tree said, Great US wants me to call him an N-word again. What's his deal? Uh, I still doubt it. Del Frickin' Tree says, well, Great US re basically reposted that same thing. Great US says, Chicano anything equals American. Chicano equals derogatory slang by Mexicans, i.e. they are not real Mexicans. FFS, I can't phantom Chicano studies. Fathom, Chicano studies is still taught anywhere. Great US says, holy shit, more than two dozen FBI agents descend on home of Texas Democrat rep who blasted Biden and Harris over border crisis. 
fascist America taking hold. Great U.S. says, may I humbly suggest you stop using communist brainwashing propaganda person, person of color and call them what they are. Also, no clue why people keep trying to make Rittenhouse comparison. Uh, great U.S. says, whoops, forgot it's not Nightstream. Um, boo, YouTube mobs, boo, mo mods, boo. So far, this sounds like 99.9% .9 of the BS self-defense cases. Bad guys claim that Andrew Bronca mentions. If site doesn't have time stamps or other method to keep track of what tips you have read, why not take screenshots to keep track? I don't, no one has time to take screenshots in the middle of a damn stream. Also, YouTube mods clean each other off after J Jack Murphy got third sloppies. Uh, then we've got Andrew Bronco reminded me of yesterday's trial where he commented golden corral LLC. You can tell who the newbie is only 1000 calories. You got to run those numbers up. My cousin told me people in golden corral stepped over a man having chest pains to get food. Damn. He also says Viva will go in person to Don Lemon trial. If you can travel from Canada, that might be going on same time as your pre-trial with, uh, with law and crime. Uh, off Nick said Joe is alpha. So there you go. And then two more Kenneth Crandall. Thank you for the donation. And Andrew Simmons says Missouri revised statute section five, six, three point zero three one states that deadly force is allowed. If quote, it is used against a person who unlawfully enters remains after unlawfully entering or attempts to unlawfully enter a dwelling. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sold on that without reading that statute more, more fully. Andrew, are you aware of that statute at all? Well, you know, there, there's a number of special provisions that are made for use of deadly force in defense of highly defensible property like your home. I imagine if we look closely at that statute, we'll find it simply remaining unlawfully like a guest you ordered to leave. You can't just shoot them dead in your home because they didn't leave as fast as you wanted them to. Again, very dangerous to rely on the apparent plain English reading of a statute without also looking at how the courts actually interpret and apply that statute. Let's see. I'm I'm looking really quickly. Where did he say it was? Missouri? Uh yeah, it's Missouri 563.031. It's it's subsection 2 sub 3. Uh so it says such force so two is a person shall not use deadly force upon another person under the circumstances specified in section 1 of this section unless such force is used against a person who unlawfully enters remains after unlawfully entering or attempts to unlawfully enter private property that is owned or leased by an individual or is occupied by an individual who has been given specific authority by the property owner to occupy the property, claiming a justification of using protective force under this section. So, and then, uh, let's see. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to, the sections it's written kind of backwards. Wait, except it's written in section one. Uh, uh, uh. Use physical force upon another when and to the extent he or she is reasonably believed such force to be necessary to defend himself. Uh, it doesn't. This isn't a deadly force statute. Uh, I don't think. Or wait, shall use shall not use deadly force unless that I, I don't know it's late i don't want to look through this <laughs> yeah and uh, by the way is that 563031 yeah so you have to be careful because oftentimes i'm looking at 563031 paragraph 2 and it has right. a special carve out for the use of deadly force upon another person under the circumstances specified in 1 section 1 and it adds all kinds of the additional conditions to protect against death, serious physical injury or any forcible felony and so forth. So be careful, just relying on statutory language, folks. Uh, if anyone's interested in understanding what the Missouri Defense of Property Law really is, it's covered in our Law of Self-Defense Missouri specific course, which you can get at about 40% off this week at lawselfdefense.com slash state or any other state you like. And Rick's battery has died. Nick, yeah, Nick, 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 Nick. Yeah, it's an have only been here like four thousand times. Um, How dare you? So. <laughs> last, last one that came in. Roy Lee Walker says, "Just came over from the quarterings vid. Love your D two streams and the manly beard reading of the certain article. Keep it up." And that's that's it. Uh, Joe, did you have do you have one last thing before we wrap up? You know, make sure that you 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 if you want to properly defend yourself without ending up in jail, make sure you uh, you follow this man up here. And, and this other guy over here, Runkle of the Bailey, 
phenomenal work. Excellent work. You really want to make sure that you, that you sub you sub over there. So absolutely. There you go. And all of the panelists today can be found in the description. Click on their names, go to their channels, watch some videos. If you like their stuff, subscribe, do it, do it, do it, do it. Uh, Wick Dipper says, have you considered using chat comments as examples of transformative commentary? Sure. There are some juicy ones in every single stream. Uh, I'll just, yeah, I'll send a list of all the ones that call law and crime retards and then that'll be perfect. <laughs> I'll put that in my letter. Uh, all right, guys, thanks for joining me today. Chat. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, uh, everybody. We'll be, well, I'll be back tomorrow. The panel is of course, welcome to their availability to, uh, to do the coverage of the trial continues tomorrow. Thanks a bunch guys. Take Hope care. you have a good night. Uh, damn it. Andrew Simmons says, thanks for looking. I was genuinely curious. I'll, I'll give it a better read, man. I, I just, it's, it's so late and we've been going all day. So, um, we'll catch you guys later. Have a good night. Peace. Go. Don't Peace. shoot anybody. We would shoot. He drinks a fair bit, but you realize that It just helps get his noggin jogging along With his glass by his side and his kids asleep tight We'll hear some law explaining tonight With his microphone muted, we'll laugh at this boomer Until he explains it's all part of the plan Watch his face become redder as he becomes better Raging at idiots from Twitter and Erland the white shores of Maine to the hills of Glen Livet. There's no one who explains the law better than Nick. So pour out a glass for the ones who have passed. Just make the law what we have now. Oh, his lady is fair and she handles herself with the grace of one who has borne many children. As the wife of a lawman, she makes sure that he has the time and the place to provide for them there. So pour out an art bag of Balmor and the Brug. The spirits blow as the ones who get on and blood. So pour out a glass for the tea post on Twitter. Let's be here lost blaming tonight. From the white shores of Nam to the hills of Glen Levitt, there's no one who explains the problem better than me. So pour out a glass for the ones who have passed to make the law what we have now. Oh, the guests are all plentiful from Doug T to Drexel. They bring their perspective and spice to the mix. But the reason we're here and the one that we cheer is the one who is showcasing us his career. Pour out a glass for the ones who have passed To make the love of